by Johann R. Wies. Part 2 of The Swiss Family Robinson. Next morning we quitted the farm, which we named Woodlands, after providing amply for the wants of the animals, sheep, goats, and poultry which we left there. Shortly afterward, on entering a wood, we found it tenanted by an enormous number of apes, who instantly assailed us with showers of fir cones, uttering hideous and angry cries, and effectually checking our progress, until we put them to flight by a couple of shots, which not a little astonished their weak minds. Fritz picked up some of their missiles, and, showing them to me, I recognized the cone of the stone pine. "'By all means gather some of these cones, boys,' said I. "'You will find that the kernel has a pleasant taste, like almonds, and from it we can, by pressing, obtain an excellent oil. Therefore I should like to carry some home with us.' A hill, which seemed to promise a good view from its summit, next attracted my notice, and, on climbing it, we were more than repaid for the exertion by the extensive and beautiful prospect which lay spread before our eyes. The situation altogether was so agreeable that here also I resolved to make a settlement, to be visited occasionally, and after resting a while, and talking the matter over, we set to work to build a cottage, such as we had lately finished at Woodlands. Our experience there enabled us to proceed quickly with the work, and in a few days the rustic abode was completed, and received, by earnest choice, the grand name of Prospect Hill. My chief object in undertaking this expedition had been to discover some tree from whose bark I could hope to make a useful light boat, or canoe. Hitherto I had met with none at all fit for my purpose, but, not despairing of success, I began, when the cottage was built, to examine carefully the surrounding woods, and, after considerable trouble, came upon two magnificent, tall, straight trees, the bark of which seemed something like that of the birch. Selecting one whose trunk was, to a great height, free from branches, we attached to one of the lower of the boughs the rope ladder we had with us, and Fritz, ascending it, cut the bark through in a circle. I did the same at the foot of the tree, and then, from between the circle, we took a narrow perpendicular slip of bark entirely out, so that we could introduce the proper tools by which gradually to loosen and raise the main part, so as finally to separate it from the tree uninjured and entire. This we found possible because the bark was moist and flexible. Great care and exertion was necessary, as the bark became detached, to support it, until the hole was ready to be let gently down upon the grass. This seemed a great achievement, but our work was by no means ended, nor could we venture to desist from it until, while the material was soft and pliable, we had formed it into the shape we desired for the canoe. In order to do this I cut a long triangular piece out of each end of the roll, and, placing the sloping parts one over the other, I drew the ends into a pointed form, and secured them with pegs and glue. This successful proceeding had, however, widened the boat and made it too flat in the middle, so that it was necessary to put ropes round it and tighten them until the proper shape was restored, before we could allow it to dry in the sun. This being all I could do without a greater variety of tools, I determined to complete my work in a more convenient situation, and forthwith dispatched Fritz and Jack with orders to bring the sledge, which now ran on wheels taken from gun carriages, that the canoe might be transported direct to the vicinity of the harbour at Tentholm. During their absence I fortunately found some wood naturally curved, just suited for ribs to support and strengthen the sides of the boat. When the two lads returned with the sledge it was time to rest for the night, but with early dawn we were again busily at work. The sledge was loaded with the new boat, and everything else we could pack into it, and we turned our steps homeward, finding the greatest difficulty, however, in getting our vehicle through the woods. We crossed the bamboo swamp, where I cut a fine mast for my boat, and came at length to a small opening or defile in the ridge of rocks, where a little torrent rushed from its source down into the larger stream beyond. Here we determined to make a halt, in order to erect a great earth wall across the narrow gorge, which, being thickly planted with prickly pear, Indian fig, 
and every thorny bush we could find, would in time form an effectual barrier against the intrusion of wild beasts, the cliffs being, to the best of our belief, in every other part inaccessible. For our own convenience we retained a small winding path through this barrier, concealing and defending it with piles of branches and thorns, and also we contrived a light drawbridge over the stream, so that we rendered the pass altogether a very strong position, should we ever have to act on the defensive. This work occupied two days, and continuing on our way we were glad to rest at Falconhurst, before arriving, quite tired and worn out, at Tentholm. It took some time to recruit our strength after this long and fatiguing expedition, and then we vigorously resumed the task of finishing the canoe. The arrangements, I flattered myself, were carried out in a manner quite worthy of a shipbuilder. A mast, sails, and paddles were fitted, but my final touch, although I prized it highly and considered it a grand and original idea, would no doubt have excited only ridicule and contempt had it been seen by a naval man. My contrivance was this. I had a couple of large, air-tight bags made of the skins of the dogfish, well tarred and pitched, inflated, and made fast on each side of the boat, just above the level of the water. These floats, however much she might be loaded, would effectually prevent either the sinking or capsizing of my craft. I may as well relate in this place what I omitted at the time of its occurrence. During the rainy season our cow presented us with a bull-calf, and that there might never be any difficulty in managing him, I, at a very early age, pierced his nose, and placed a short stick in it, to be exchanged for a ring when he was old enough. The question now came to be who should be his master, and to what should we train him? "'Why not teach him,' said Fritz, "'to fight the wild animals, and defend us, like the fighting bulls of the Hottentots. That would be really useful.' "'I am sure I should much prefer a gentle bull to a fighting one,' exclaimed his mother. "'But do you mean to say tame oxen can be taught to act rationally on the defensive?' "'I can but repeat what I have heard or read,' replied I. "'As regards the race of Hottentots, who inhabit the south of Africa, "'among all sorts of wild and ferocious animals. "'The wealth of these people consists solely in their flocks and herds, "'and, for their protection, they train their bulls to act as guards. "'These courageous animals keep the rest from straying away, "'and when danger threatens, they give instant notice of it, "'drive the herd together in a mass, "'the calves and young cows being placed in the centre, "'around them the bulls and strong oxen make a formidable circle "'with their horned heads turned to the front, "'offering determined resistance to the fiercest foe. "'These fighting bulls will even sometimes rush with dreadful bellowing "'to meet the enemy, and should it be a mighty lion "'or other strong and daring monster, "'sacrifice their own lives in defense of the herd. "'It is said that formerly, when Hottentot tribes made war on one another, it was not unusual to place a troop of these stout-hearted warriors in the van of the little army, when their heroism led to decisive victory on one side or the other. But, continued I, although I can see you are all delighted with my description of these fine warlike animals, I think we had better train this youngster to be a peaceable bull. Who is to have charge of him? Ernest thought it would be more amusing to train his monkey than a calf. Jack, with the buffalo and his hunting jackal, had quite enough on his hands. Fritz was content with the onager. Their mother was voted mistress of the old grey donkey, and I myself being superintendent-in-chief of the whole establishment of animals, there remained only little Franz, to whose special care the calf could be committed. "'What say you, my boy? Will you undertake to look after this little fellow?' "'Oh, yes, father,' he replied. "'Once you told me about a strong man. "'I think his name was Milo, and he had a tiny calf, "'and he used to carry it about everywhere. "'It grew bigger and bigger, but still he carried it often, "'till at last he grew so strong that when it was quite a great big ox, "'he could lift it as easily as ever. "'And so, you see, if I take care of our wee calf "'and teach it to do what I like, "'perhaps when it grows big I shall still be able to manage it. "'And then—oh, Papa!— "'Do you think I might ride upon it?' 
I smiled at the child's simplicity and his funny application of the story of Milo of Cortona. The calf shall be yours, my boy. Make him as tame as you can, and we will see about letting you mount him some day. But remember, he will be a great big bull long before you are nearly a man. Now, what will you call him? Shall I call him Grumble, father? Hear what a low muttering noise he makes? Grumble will do famously. Grumble, grumble! Oh, it beats your buffalo's name hollow, Jack! Not a bit, said he. Why, you can't compare the two names. Fancy mother saying, Here comes Franz on Grumble, but Jack riding on the storm. Oh, it sounds sublime. We named the two puppies Bruno and Fawn, and so ended this important domestic business. For two months we worked steadily at our salt cave, in order to complete the necessary arrangement of partition walls, so as to put the rooms and stalls for the animals in comfortable order for the next long rainy season, during which time, when other work would be at a standstill, we could carry on many minor details for the improvement of the abode. We leveled the floors first with clay, then spread gravel mixed with melted gypsum over that, producing a smooth, hard surface, which did very well for most of the apartments. But I was ambitious of having one or two carpets, and set about making a kind of felt in the following way. I spread out a large piece of sailcloth, and covered it equally all over with a strong liquid made of glue and isinglass, which saturated it thoroughly. On it we then laid wool and hair from the sheep and goats, which had been carefully cleaned and prepared, and rolled and beat it until it adhered tolerably smoothly to the cloth. Finally it became, when perfectly dry, a covering for the floor of our sitting room, by no means to be despised. One morning, just after these labors at the salt cave were completed, happening to awake unusually early, I turned my thoughts, as I lay waiting for sunrise, to considering what length of time we had now passed on this coast, and discovered to my surprise that the very next day would be the anniversary of our escape from the wreck. My heart swelled with gratitude to the gracious God who had then granted us deliverance, and ever since had loaded us with benefits, and I resolved to set tomorrow apart as a day of thanksgiving, in joyful celebration of the occasion. My mind was full of indefinite plans when I rose, and the day's work began as usual. I took care that everything should be cleaned, cleared, and set in order both outside and inside our dwelling, none, however, suspecting that there was any particular object in view. Other more private preparations I also made for the next day. At supper I made the coming event known to the assembled family. Good people, do you know that tomorrow is a very great and important day? We shall have to keep it in honor of our merciful escape to this land, and call it Thanksgiving Day. Every one was surprised to hear that we had already been twelve months in the country. Indeed, my wife believed I might be mistaken, until I showed her how I had calculated regularly ever since the 31st of January, on which day we were wrecked, by marking off in my almanac the Sundays as they arrived for the remaining eleven months of the year. Since then, I added, I have counted thirty-one days. This is the first of February. We landed on the second. Therefore, tomorrow is the anniversary of the day of our escape. As my bookseller has not sent me an almanac for the present year, we must henceforth reckon for ourselves. Oh, that will be good fun for us, said Ernest. We must have a long stick, like Robinson Crusoe, and cut a notch in it every day, and count them up every now and then, to see how the weeks and months and years go by. That is all very well if you know for certain the number of days in each month and in the year. What do you say, Ernest? The year contains 365 days, 5 hours, 48 minutes, and 45 seconds, returned he promptly. Perfectly correct, said I, smiling. But you would get in a mess with those spare hours, minutes, and seconds in a year or two, wouldn't you? Not at all. Every four years I would add them all together, make a day, stick it into February, and call that year leap year. Well done, Professor Ernest. We must elect you astronomer royal in this our kingdom, and let you superintend and regulate everything connected with the lapse of time, 
clocks and watches included. Before they went to sleep, I could hear my boys whispering among themselves about father's mysterious allusions to next day's festival and rejoicings, but I offered no explanations and went to sleep, little guessing that the rogues had laid a counterplot far more surprising than my simple plan for their diversion. Nothing less than roar of artillery startled me from sleep at daybreak next morning. I sprang up and found my wife as much alarmed as I was by the noise, otherwise I should have been inclined to believe it fancy. Fritz, dress quickly and come with me, cried I, turning to his hammock. Lo, it was empty, neither he nor Jack were to be seen. Altogether bewildered, I was hastily dressing when their voices were heard, and they rushed in shouting, Hurrah! Didn't we rouse you with a right good thundering salute? But perceiving at a glance that we had been seriously alarmed, Fritz hastened to apologize for the thoughtless way in which they had sought to do honor to the day of Thanksgiving, without considering that an unexpected cannon shot would startle us unpleasantly from our slumbers. We readily forgave the authors of our alarm, in consideration of the good intention which had prompted the deed. And satisfied that the day had at least been duly inaugurated, we all went quietly to breakfast. Afterward, we sat together for a long time, enjoying the calm beauty of the morning, and talking of all that had taken place on the memorable days of the storm a year ago. For I desired that the awful events of that time should live in the remembrance of my children, with a deepening sense of gratitude for our deliverance. Therefore, I read aloud passages from my journal. As well as many beautiful verses from the Psalms, expressive of joyful praise and thanksgiving, so that even the youngest among us was impressed and solemnized at the recollections of escape from a terrible death, and also led to bless and praise the name of the Lord our Deliverer. Dinner followed shortly after this happy service, and I then announced for the afternoon a grand display of athletic sports. In which I and my wife were to be spectators and judges. Father, what a grand idea! Oh, how jolly! Are we to run races? And prizes! Will there be prizes, Father? The judges offer prizes for competition in every sort of manly exercise, replied I shooting, running, riding, leaping, climbing, swimming. We will have an exhibition of your skill in all. Now for it! Trumpeters, sound for the opening of the lists. Uttering these last words in a stentorian voice and wildly waving my arms toward a shady spot, where the ducks and geese were quietly resting, had the absurd effect I intended. Up they all started in a fright, gabbling and quacking loudly, to the infinite amusement of the children, who began to bustle about in eager preparations for the contest, and begging to know with what they were to begin. Let us have shooting first, and the rest when the heat of the day declines. Here is a mark I have got ready for you, said I, producing a board roughly shaped like a kangaroo and of about the size of one. This target was admired, but Jack could not rest satisfied till he had added ears and a long leather strap for the tail. It was then fixed in the attitude most characteristic of the creature, and the distance for firing measured off. Each of the three competitors was to fire twice. Fritz hit the kangaroo's head each time. Ernest hit the body once, and Jack, by a lucky chance, shot the ears clean away from the head, which feet raised a shout of laughter. A second trial with pistols ensued, in which Fritz again came off victor. Then, desiring the competitors to load with small shot, I threw a little board as high as I possibly could up in the air. Each in turn aiming at and endeavoring to hit it before it touched the ground. In this I found to my surprise that the sedate Ernest succeeded quite as well as his more impetuous brother Fritz. As for Jack, his flying board escaped wholly uninjured. After this followed archery, which I liked to encourage, foreseeing that a time might come when ammunition would fail. And in this practice I saw with pleasure that my elder sons were really skilful, while even little Franz acquitted himself well. A pause ensued, and then I started a running match. Fritz, Ernest, and Jack were to run to Falkenhurst by the most direct path. 
The first to reach the tree was to bring me, in proof of his success, a penknife I had accidentally left on the table in my sleeping room. At a given signal, away went the racers in fine style. Fritz and Jack, putting forth all their powers, took the lead at once, running in advance of Ernest, who started at a good steady pace, which I predicted he would be better able to maintain than such a furious rate as his brother's. But long before we expected to see them back, a tremendous noise of galloping caused us to look with surprise toward the bridge, and Jack made his appearance, thundering along on his buffalo, with the onager and the donkey tearing after him riderless, and the whole party in the wildest spirits. Hello, cried I, what sort of foot race do you call this, Master Jack? He shouted merrily as he dashed up to us, then flinging himself off and saluting us in a playful way. I very soon saw, said he, that I hadn't a chance, so renouncing all idea of the prize, I caught Storm and made him gallop home with me to be in time to see the others come puffing in. Lightfoot and old Grizzle chose to join me. I never invited them. By and by the other boys arrived, Ernest holding up the knife in token of being the winner, and after hearing all particulars about the running, and that he had reached Falconhurst two minutes before Fritz, we proceeded to test the climbing powers of the youthful athletes. In this exercise Jack performed wonders. He ascended with remarkable agility the highest palms whose stems he could clasp. And when he put on his shark-skin buskins, which enabled him to take firm hold of larger trees, he played antics like a squirrel or a monkey, peeping and grinning at us, at first on one side of the stem, and then on the other, in a most diverting way. Fritz and Ernest climbed well, but could not come near the grace and skill of their active and lively young brother. Riding followed, and marvellous feats were performed, Fritz and Jack proving themselves very equal in their management of their different steeds. I thought riding was over when little Franz appeared from the stable in the cave, leading young Grumble, the bull-calf, with a neat saddle of kangaroo hide, and a bridle passed through his nose-ring. The child saluted us with a pretty little air of confidence, exclaiming, "'Now, most learned judges, prepare to see something quite new and wonderful. The great bull-tamer, Milo of Cortona, desires the honour of exhibiting before you.' Then, taking a whip, and holding the end of a long cord, he made the animal, at the word of command, walk, trot, and gallop in a circle round him. He afterward mounted, and showed off Grumble's somewhat awkward paces." The sports were concluded by swimming matches, and the competitors found a plunge in salt water very refreshing, after their varied exertions. Fritz showed himself a master in the art. At home in the element, no moment betokened either exertion or weariness. Ernest exhibited too much anxiety and effort, while Jack was far too violent and hasty, and soon became exhausted. Franz gave token of future skill. By this time, as it was getting late, we returned to our dwelling, the mother having preceded us in order to make arrangements for the ceremony of prize-giving. We found her seated in great state, with the prizes set out by her side. The boys marched in, pretending to play various instruments in imitation of a band, and then all four, bowing respectfully, stood before her, like the victors in a tournament of old, awaiting the reward of valour from the Queen of Beauty which she bestowed with a few words of praise and encouragement. Fritz, to his immense delight, received, as the prize for shooting and swimming, a splendid double-barreled rifle and a beautiful hunting knife. To Ernest, as winner of the running match, was given a handsome gold watch. For climbing and riding Jack had a pair of silver-plated spurs and a riding whip, both of which gave him extraordinary pleasure. Franz received a pair of stirrups and a driving whip made of rhinoceros hide, which we thought would be of use to him in the character of bull-trainer. When the ceremony was supposed to be over I advanced, and solemnly presented to my wife a lovely work-box filled with every imaginable requirement for a lady's work-table, which she accepted with equal surprise and delight. The whole entertainment afforded the boys such intense pleasure 
and their spirits rose to such a pitch that nothing would serve them but another salvo of artillery in order to close with befitting dignity and honor so great a day. They gave me no peace till they had leave to squander some gunpowder, and then at last their excited feelings seeming relieved, we were able to sit down to supper. Shortly afterward we joined in family worship and retired to rest. Soon after the great festival of our grand Thanksgiving Day, I recollected that it was now the time when the figs at Falconhurst being ripe, immense flocks of ortolans and wild pigeons were attracted thither, and as we had found those preserved last year of the greatest use among our stores of winter provisions, I would not miss the opportunity of renewing our stock, and therefore, laying aside the building work, we removed with all speed to our home in the tree, where sure enough we found the first detachment of the birds already busy with the fruit. In order to spare ammunition, I resolved to concoct a strong sort of bird lime, of which I had read in some account of the Palm Islanders, who make it of fresh caoutchouc mixed with oil, and of so good a quality that it has been known to catch even peacocks and turkeys. Fritz and Jack were therefore dispatched to collect some fresh caoutchouc from the trees, and as this involved a good gallop on Storm and Lightfoot, they, nothing loath, set off. They took a supply of calabashes in which to bring the gum, and we found it high time to manufacture a fresh stock of these useful vessels. I was beginning to propose an expedition to the gourd tree wood, regretting the time it would take to go such a distance, when my wife reminded me of her plantation near the potato field. There, to our joy, we found that all the plants were flourishing, and crops of gourds and pumpkins, in all stages of ripeness, covered the ground. Selecting a great number suited to our purpose, we hastened home, and began the manufacture of basins, dishes, plates, flasks, and spoons of all sorts and sizes, with even greater success than before. When the riders returned with the caoutchouc, they brought several novelties besides. A crane, for example, shot by Fritz, and an animal which they called a marmot, but which to me seemed much more like a badger. Aniseed, turpentine, and wax berries for candles they had also collected, and a curious root which they introduced by the name of the monkey plant. And pray, wherefore monkey plant, may I ask? "'Well, for this reason, father,' answered Fritz, "'we came upon an open space in the forest near Woodlands, "'and perceived a troop of monkeys, "'apparently engaged, as Jack said, "'in cultivating the soil. "'Being curious to make out what they were at, "'we tied up the dogs as well as Storm and Lightfoot, "'and crept near enough to see that the apes "'were most industriously grubbing up and eating roots. "'This they did in a way that nearly choked us with laughter,' for when the root was rather hard to pull up, and the leaves were torn off, they seized it firmly in their teeth, and flung themselves fairly heels over head in the most ludicrous fashion you ever saw, and up came the root, unable to resist the leverage. Of course we wanted to see what this dainty morsel was like, so we loosed the dogs, and the apes cleared out double quick, leaving plenty of the roots about. We tasted them, and thought them very nice. Will you try one? The plant was quite new to me, but I imagined it might be what is called in China ginseng, and there prized and valued beyond everything. The children being curious to hear more about this ginseng, I continued. In China it is considered so strengthening and wholesome that it is used as a sort of universal medicine, being supposed to prolong human life. The emperor alone has the right to permit it to be gathered, and guards are placed round land where it grows. Ginseng is to be found in Tartary, and has lately been discovered in Canada. It is cultivated in Pennsylvania, because the Americans introduce it secretly into China as smuggled merchandise. Fritz then continued. After this we went on to woodlands, but mercy on us what a confusion the place was in. Everything smashed or torn, and covered with mud and dirt. The fowls terrified, the sheep and goats scattered, the contents of the rooms dashed about as if a whirlwind had swept through the house. What? I exclaimed, while my wife looked horrified at the news, conjuring up in her imagination hordes of savages who would soon come and lay waste Falconhurst and Tentholm as well as Woodlands. 
How can that have happened? Did you discover the authors of all this mischief? Oh, said Jack, it was easy to see that those dreadful monkeys had done it all. First they must have got into the yards and sheds, and hunted the fowls and creatures about, and then I dare say the cunning rascals put a little monkey in at some small opening, and bid him unfasten the shutters. You know what nimble fingers they have. Then, of course, the whole posse of them swarmed into our nice tidy cottage, and skylarked with every single thing they could lay paws on, till perhaps they got hungry all at once, and bethought them of the ginseng, as you call it, out in the woods yonder, where we found them so busy refreshing themselves, the mischievous villains. While we were gazing at all this ruin in a sort of bewilderment, pursued Fritz, we heard a sound of rushing wings and strange ringing cries, as of multitudes of birds passing high above us, and looking up we perceived them flying quickly in a wedge-shaped flock at a great height in the air. They began gradually to descend, taking the direction of the lake, and separated into a number of small detachments, which followed in a long straight line, and at a slower rate, the movements of the leaders, who appeared to be examining the neighborhood. We could now see what large birds they must be, but dared not show ourselves or follow them, lest they should take alarm. Presently, and with one accord, they quickened their motion, just as if the band had begun to play a quick march after a slow one, and rapidly descended to earth in a variety of lively ways, and near enough for us to see that they must be cranes. Some alighted at once, while others hovered sportively over them. Many darted to the ground, and, just touching it, would soar again upward with a strong but somewhat heavy flight. After gambling in this way for a time, the whole multitude, as though at the word of command, alighted on the rice fields, and began to feast on the fresh grain. We thought now was our time to get a shot at the cranes, and cautiously approached, but they were too cunning to let themselves be surprised, and we came unexpectedly upon their outposts or sentinels, who instantly sprang into the air, uttering loud trumpet-like cries, upon which the whole flock arose, and followed them with a rush like a sudden squall of wind. We were quite startled, and it was useless to attempt a shot, but— Unwilling to miss the chance of securing at least one of the birds, I hastily unhooded my eagle and threw him into the air. With a piercing cry he soared away high above them, then shot downward like an arrow, causing wild confusion among the cranes. The one which the eagle attacked sought to defend itself. A struggle followed, and they came together to the ground not far from where we stood. Hastening forward, to my grief I found the beautiful crane already dead. The eagle, luckily unhurt, was rewarded with a small pigeon from my game bag. After this we went back to Woodlands, got some turpentine and a bag of rice, and set off for home. Fritz's interesting story being ended, and supper ready, we made trial of the new roots, and found them very palatable, either boiled or stewed. The monkey plant, however, if it really proved to be the ginseng of the Chinese, would require to be used with caution, being of an aromatic and heating nature. We resolved to transplant a supply of both roots to our kitchen garden. On the following morning we were early astir, and as soon as breakfast was over, we went regularly to work with the bird lime. The tough adhesive mixture of caoutchouc, oil, and turpentine turned out well. The boys brought rods, which I smeared over, and made them place among the upper branches, where the fruit was plentiful, and the birds most congregated. The prodigious number of the pigeons, far beyond those of last year, reminded me that we had not then, as now, witnessed their arrival at their feeding places, but had seen only the last body of the season, a mere party of stragglers, compared to the masses which now weighed down the branches of all the trees in the neighborhood. The sweet acorns of the evergreen trees were also patronized. Large flocks were then congregated, and from the state of the ground under the trees it was evident that at night they roosted on the branches. Seeing this, I determined to make a raid upon them by torchlight, after the manner of the colonists in Virginia. Meantime the bird lime acted well. The pigeons alighting stuck fast. The more they fluttered and struggled, the more completely were they bedaubed with the tenacious mixture, and at length, with piteous cries, fell to the ground, bearing the sticks with them. 
The birds were then removed, fresh lime spread, and the snare set again. The boys quickly became able to carry on the work without my assistance, so, leaving it to them, I went to prepare torches, with pine wood and turpentine, for the night attack. Jack presently brought me a very pretty pigeon, unlike the rest, to show me, as he felt unwilling to kill it, and seeing that it must be one of our own European breed, which we wished to preserve until their numbers greatly increased, I took the trembling captive and gently cleansed its feet and wings, with oil and ashes, from the stiff sticky mess with which it was bedaubed, placing it then in a wicker cage, and telling Jack to bring me any others like it which were caught. This he did, and we secured several pairs, greatly to my satisfaction, as having necessarily let them go free when we landed, they had become quite wild, and we derived no advantage from them, whereas now we would have a cot, and pigeon pie whenever we liked. When evening drew on, we set out for the wood of sweet acorns, provided merely with long bamboo canes, torches, and canvas sacks. These weapons appeared very curious and insufficient to the children, but their use was speedily apparent, for, darkness having come upon us almost before we reached the wood, I lighted the torches, and perceived, as I expected, that every branch was thickly laden with ortolans and wild pigeons, who were roosting there in amazing numbers. Suddenly aroused by the glare of the light, confusion prevailed among the terrified birds, who fluttered helplessly through the branches, dazzled and bewildered, and many falling, even before we began to use the sticks, were picked up and put in the bags. When we beat and struck the branches, it was as much as my wife and Franz could do to gather up the quantities of pigeons that soon lay on the ground. The sacks were speedily quite full. We turned homeward, and on reaching Falconhurst, put our booty in safety, and gladly withdrew to rest. The following day was wholly occupied in plucking, boiling, roasting, and stewing, so that we could find time for nothing else, but next morning a great expedition to woodlands was arranged, that measures might there be taken to prevent a repetition of the monkey invasion. I hoped, could I but catch the mischievous rascals at their work of destruction, to inflict upon them such a chastisement as would effectually make them shun the neighborhood of our farm for the future. My wife provided us with a good store of provisions, as we were likely to be absent several days, while she, with Franz and Turk, remained at home. I took with me abundance of specially prepared bird lime, far stronger than that which we used for the pigeons, a number of short posts, plenty of string, and a supply of coconut shells and gourds. The buffalo carried all these things, and one or two of the boys beside. I myself bestrode the ass, and in due time we arrived at a convenient spot in the forest, near woodlands, well concealed by thick bushes and underwood, where we made a little encampment, pitching the small tent and tethering the animals. The dogs, too, were tied up, lest they should roam about and betray our presence. We found the cottage quiet and deserted, and I lost no time in preparing for the reception of visitors, hoping to be all ready for them and out of sight before they arrived. We drove the stakes lightly into the ground, so as to form an irregular paling round the house, winding string in and out in all directions between them, thus making a kind of labyrinth, through which it would be impossible to pass without touching either the stakes or the cords. Everything was plentifully besmeared with bird lime, and basins of the mixture were set in all directions, strewn with rice, maize, and other dainties for bait. Night came without any interruption to our proceedings, and all being then accomplished, we retired to rest beneath the shelter of our little tent. Very early in the morning we heard a confused noise, such as we knew betokened the approach of a large number of apes. We armed ourselves with strong clubs and cudgels, and holding the dogs in leash made our way silently behind the thickets, till, ourselves unseen, we could command a view of all that went on, and strange indeed was the scene which ensued. The noise of rustling, cracking, and creaking among the branches, with horrid cries and shrieks and chattering, increased to a degree sufficient to make us perfectly giddy, 
and then out from the forest poured the whole disorderly rabble of monkeys, scrambling, springing, leaping from the trees, racing and tumbling across the grassy space toward the house, when, at once attracted by the novelties they saw, they made for the jars and bowls. They seemed innumerable, but the confused, rapid way in which they swarmed hither and thither made it difficult to judge accurately of their numbers. They dashed fearlessly through and over the palings in all directions, some rushing at the eatables, some scrambling onto the roof, where they commenced tugging at the wooden pegs, with a view to forcing an entrance. Gradually, however, as they rambled over the place, all in turn became besmeared with our bird-lime, on head, paws, or back, or breast. The wretched predicament of the apes increased every instant. Some sat down, and with the most ludicrous gestures tried to clean themselves. Others were hopelessly entangled in stakes and cordage, which they trailed about after them, looking the picture of bewildered despair. Others again endeavoured to help one another, and stuck fast together. The more they pulled and tugged and kicked, the worse became their plight. Many had the gourds and coconut shells lumbering and clattering about with them, their paws having been caught when they sought to obtain the rice or fruit we had put for bait. Most ridiculous of all was the condition of one old fellow, who had found a calabash containing palm wine, and, eagerly drinking it, was immediately fitted with a mask, for the shell stuck to his forehead and whiskers, of course covering his eyes, and he blundered about, cutting the wildest capers in his efforts to get rid of the encumbrance. Numbers took to flight, but as we had spread bird-lime on several of the trees around, many apes found themselves fixed to, or hanging from, the branches, where they remained in woeful durance, struggling and shrieking horribly. The panic being now general, I loosed the three dogs, whose impatience had been almost uncontrollable, and who now rushed to the attack of the unfortunate monkeys, as though burning with zeal to execute justice upon desperate criminals. The place soon had the appearance of a ghastly battlefield, for we were obliged to do our part with the clubs and sticks, till the din of howling, yelling, barking, in every conceivable tone of rage and pain, gave place to an awful silence, and we looked with a shudder on the shocking spectacle around us. At least forty apes lay mangled and dead, and the boys began to be quite sad and downhearted, till I, fully sharing their feelings, hastened to turn their thoughts to active employment in removing and burying the slain, burning the stakes, cordage, bowls, everything concerned in the execution of our deadly stratagem. After that we betook ourselves to the task of restoring order to our dismantled cottage, and seeking for the scattered flock of sheep, goats, and poultry, we gradually collected them, hoping to settle them once more peacefully in their yards and sheds. While thus engaged we repeatedly heard a sound as of something heavy falling from a tree. On going to look we found three splendid birds, caught on some of the limed sticks we had placed loose in the branches. Two of these proved to be a variety of the blue Maluka pigeon, the third I assumed to be the Nicobar pigeon, having met with descriptions of its resplendent green, bronze, and steely blue plumage, and I was pleased to think of domesticating them, and establishing them as first tenants of a suitable dwelling near the cave. First tenants, father,' said Fritz, do you expect to catch more like these? Not exactly catch them. I mean to practice a secret art. Much can be done by magic, Fritz. Further explanation I declined to give. In a few days Woodlands was once more set in order, and everything settled and comfortable, so that we returned without further adventure to Falconhurst, where we were joyfully welcomed. Every one agreed that we must go at once to Tentholm, to make the proposed pigeon-house in the rock. Several other things there also requiring our attention, we made arrangements for a prolonged stay. My plan for the pigeon-house was to hollow out an ample space in the cliff, facing toward Jackal River, and close to our rocky home, fitting that up with partitions, perches, and nesting places, while a large wooden front was fitted on to the opening, with entrance holes, slides or shutters, 
and a broad platform in front, where the birds could rest and walk about. When, after the work of a few weeks, we thought it was fit for habitation, I set the other children to work at some distance from our cavern, and summoning Fritz. Now, my faithful assistant, said I, it is time to conjure the new colonists to their settlement here. Yes, I continued, laughing at his puzzled look, I mean to play a regular pigeon dealer's trick. You must know such gentry are very ingenious, not only in keeping their own pigeons safe, but in adding to their numbers by attracting those of other people. All I want is some soft clay, aniseed, and salt, of which I will compound a mixture which our birds will like very much, and the smell of which will bring others to share it with them. I can easily get you some of those things, father. I shall want some oil of aniseed besides, said I, to put on the pigeonholes, so that the bird's feathers may touch it as they may pass in and out, and become scented with what will attract the wild pigeons. This I can obtain by pounding aniseed, therefore bring me the mortar and some oil. When this was strongly impregnated with the aromatic oil from the seeds, for I did not propose to distill it in regular style, I strained it through a cloth, pressing it strongly. The result answered my purpose, and the scent would certainly remain for some days. All my preparations being completed, the pigeons were installed in their new residence, and the slides closed. The European birds were by this time quite friendly with the three beautiful strangers, and when the other boys came home, and scrambled up the ladder to peep in at a little pane of glass I had fixed in front, they saw them all contentedly picking up grain, and pecking at the magic food, as Fritz called it, although he did not betray my secret arts to his brothers. Early on the third morning I aroused Fritz, and directed him to ascend the rope ladder, and arrange a cord on the sliding door of the dovecot, by which it could be opened or closed from below. Also he poured fresh aniseed oil all about the entrance, after which we returned, and awoke the rest of the family, telling them that if they liked to make haste, they might see me let the pigeons fly. Everybody came to the dovecot, understanding that some ceremony was to attend the event, and I waved a wand with mock solemnity, while I muttered a seeming incantation, and then gave Fritz a sign to draw up the sliding panel. Presently out popped the pretty heads of the captives, the soft eyes glanced about in all directions, they withdrew, they ventured forth again, they came timidly out on the veranda, as little Franz expressed it, then, as though suddenly startled, the whole party took wing, with the shrill whizzing sound peculiar to the flight of pigeons, and circling above us as they rose higher and higher, finally darting quite out of sight. While we were yet gazing after them, they reappeared, and settled quietly on the dovecot, but as we congratulated ourselves on a return which showed that they accepted this as a home, up sprang the three blue pigeons, the noble foreigners, for whom chiefly I had planned the house, and rising in circles high in the air, winged their rapid way direct toward Falconhurst. Their departure had such an air of determination and resolve about it, that I feared them lost to us for ever. Endeavouring to console ourselves by petting our four remaining birds, we could not forget this disappointment, and all day long the dovecot remained the centre of attraction. Nothing, however, was seen of the fugitive until about the middle of the next day, when most of us were hard at work inside the cavern, Jack sprang in, full of excitement, exclaiming, "'He is there! He is come! He really is!' "'Who? Who is there? What do you mean?' "'The blue pigeon, to be sure! Hurrah! Hurrah!' "'Oh, nonsense!' said Ernest. "'You want to play us a trick.' "'Why should it be nonsense?' cried I. "'I fully believe we shall see them all soon.' Out ran everybody to the dovecot, and there, sure enough, stood the pretty fellow, but not alone, for he was billing and cooing to a mate, a stranger of his own breed, apparently inviting her to enter his dwelling, for he popped in and out of the door, bowing, sidling, and cooing in a most irresistible manner, until the shy little lady yielded to his blandishments, and tripped daintily in. Now let's shut the door. "'Pull the cord and close the panel!' shouted the boys, making a rush at the string. 
"'Stop!' cried I. "'Let the string alone. "'I won't have you frighten the little darlings. "'Besides, the others will be coming. "'Would you shut the door in their faces?' "'Here they come, here they come!' exclaimed Fritz, "'whose keen eye marked the birds afar. "'And to our delight the second blue pigeon arrived, "'likewise with a mate, "'whom, after a pretty little flirtation scene "'of real and assumed modesty on her part, "'he succeeded in leading home. "'The third and handsomest of the new pigeons "'was the last in making his appearance. "'Perhaps he had greater difficulty than the others,' in finding a mate as distinguished in rank and beauty as himself. However, we fully expected them, and the boys talked of the arrival of Mr. and Mrs. Nicobar as a matter of course. Late in the day Franz and his mother went out to provide for supper, but the child returned directly, exclaiming that we must hasten to the dovecot to see something beautiful. Accordingly a general rush was made out of the cave, and we saw with delight that the third stranger also had returned with a lovely bride, and, encouraged by the presence of the first arrivals, they soon made themselves at home. In a short time nest-building commenced, and among the materials collected by the birds I observed a long grey moss or lichen, and thought it might very possibly be the same which, in the West Indies, is gathered from the bark of old trees, where it grows, and hangs in great tuft-like beards, to be used instead of horse-hair for stuffing mattresses. My wife no sooner heard of it than her active brain devised fifty plans for making use of it. Would we but collect enough, she would clean and sort it, and there would be no end to the bolsters, pillows, saddles, and cushions she would stuff with it. For the discovery of nutmegs we had also to thank the pigeons, and they were carefully planted in our orchard. For some time no event of particular note occurred, until at length Jack, as usual, got into a scrape, causing thereby no little excitement at home. He went off early on one of his own particular private expeditions. He was in the habit of doing this that he might surprise us with some new acquisition on his return. This time, however, he came back in most wretched plight, covered with mud and green slime, a great bundle of Spanish canes was on his back, muddy and green like himself. He had lost a shoe, and altogether presented a ludicrous picture of misery, at which we could have laughed had he not seemed more ready to cry. "'My dear boy, what has happened to you? Where have you been?' "'Only in the swamp behind the powder magazine, father,' replied he. "'I went to get reeds for my wicker work, because I wanted to weave some baskets and hen-coops, and I saw such beauties a little way off in the marsh, much finer than those close by the edge, that I tried to get at them. I jumped from one firm spot to another, till at last I slipped and sank over my ankles. I tried to get on toward the reeds which were close by, but in I went, deeper and deeper, till I was above the knees in thick soft mud, and there I stuck. I screamed and shouted, but nobody came, and I can tell you I was in a regular fright. At last who should appear but my faithful fangs? He knew my voice and came close up to me, right over the swamp, but all the poor beast could do was to help me make a row. I wonder you did not hear us. The very rocks rang, but nothing came of it, so despair drove me to think of an expedient. I cut down all the reeds I could reach round and round me, and bound them together into this bundle, which made a firm place on which to lean while I worked and kicked about to free my feet and legs, and after much struggling I managed to get astride on the reeds. There I sat, supported above the mud and slime, while fangs ran yelping backward and forward between me and the bank, seeming surprised I did not follow. Suddenly I thought of catching hold of his tail. He dragged and pulled, and I sprawled and crawled and waded, sometimes on my reeds like a raft, sometimes lugging them along with me, till we luckily got back to terra firma. But I had a near squeak for it, I can tell you. A fortunate escape indeed, my boy, cried I, and I thank God for it. Fangs has really acted a heroic part as your deliverer, and you have shown great presence of mind. Now go with your mother and get rid of the slimy traces of your disaster. You have brought me splendid canes, "'exactly what I want for a new scheme of mine.' 
The fact was, I meant to try to construct a loom for my wife, for I knew she understood weaving, so I chose two fine strong reeds, and splitting them carefully, bound them together again, that when dry they might be quite straight and equal, and fit for a frame. Smaller reeds were cut into pieces and sharpened, for the teeth of the comb. The boys did this for me without in the least knowing their use, and great fun they made of father's monster toothpicks. In time all the various parts of the loom were made ready and put together, my wife knowing nothing of it, while to the incessant questions of the children I replied mysteriously, Oh, it is an outlandish sort of musical instrument. Mother will know how to play upon it. And when the time came for presenting it, her joy was only equaled by the amusement and interest with which the children watched her movements while playing the loom, as they always said. About this time a beautiful little foal, a son of the onager, was added to our stud, and as he promised to grow up strong and tractable, we soon saw how useful he would be. The name of Swift was given to him, and he was to be trained for my own riding. The interior arrangements of the cavern being now well forward, I applied myself to contriving an aqueduct, that fresh water might be led close up to our cave, for it was a long way to go to fetch it from Jackal River, and especially inconvenient on washing days. As I wanted to do this before the rainy season began, I set about it at once. Pipes of hollow bamboo answered the purpose well, and a large cask formed the reservoir. The supply was good, and the comfort of having it close at hand so great that the mother declared she was as well pleased with our engineering as if we had made her a fountain and marble basin adorned with mermaids and dolphins. Anticipating the setting in of the rains, I pressed forward all work connected with stores for the winter, and great was the ingathering of roots, fruits, and grains, potatoes, rice, guavas, sweet acorns, pine cones. Load after load arrived at the cavern, and the mother's active needle was in constant requisition, as the demand for more sacks and bags was incessant. Casks and barrels of all sorts and sizes were pressed into the service, until at last the raft was knocked to pieces, and its tubs made to do duty in the storerooms. The weather became very unsettled and stormy. Heavy clouds gathered in the horizon, and passing storms of wind, with thunder, lightning, and torrents of rain, swept over the face of nature from time to time. The sea was in frequent commotion. Heavy ground swells drove masses of water hissing and foaming against the cliffs. Everything heralded the approaching rains. All nature joined in sounding forth the solemn overture to the grandest work of the year. It was now near the beginning of the month of June, and we had twelve weeks of bad weather before us. We established some of the animals with ourselves at the salt cave. The cow, the ass, Lightfoot, Storm, and the dogs were all necessary to us, while Knips, Fangs, and the eagle were sure to be a great amusement in the long evenings. The boys would ride over to Falconhurst very often to see that all was in order there, and fetch anything required. Much remained to be done in order to give the cave a more comfortable appearance, which became more desirable now that we had to live indoors. The darkness of the inner regions annoyed me, and I set myself to invent a remedy. After some thought I called in Jack's assistance, and we got a very tall, strong bamboo, which would reach right up to the vaulted roof. This we planted in the earthen floor, securing well by driving wedges in round it. Jack ascended this pole very cleverly, taking with him a hammer and chisel, to enlarge a crevice in the roof so as to fix a pulley, by means of which, when he descended, I drew up a large ship's lantern, well supplied with oil, and as there were four wicks, it afforded a very fair amount of light. Several days were spent in arranging the different rooms. Ernest and Franz undertook the library, fixing shelves and setting books in order. Jack and his mother took in hand the sitting-room and kitchen, while Fritz and I, as better able for heavy work, arranged the workshops. The carpenter's bench, the turning-lathe, and a large chest of tools were set in convenient places, 
and many tools and instruments hung on the walls. An adjoining chamber was fitted up as a forge, with fireplace, bellows, and anvil, complete, all which we had found in the ship, packed together and ready to set up. When these great affairs were settled, we still found in all directions work to be done. Shelves, tables, benches, movable steps, cupboards, pegs, door handles, and bolts. There seemed no end to our requirements, and we often thought of the enormous amount of work necessary to maintain the comforts and conveniences of life, which at home we had received as matters of course. But in reality the more there was to do the better, and I never ceased contriving fresh improvements, being fully aware of the importance of constant employment as a means of strengthening and maintaining the health of mind and body. This, indeed, with a consciousness of continual progress toward a desirable end, is found to constitute the main element of happiness. Our rocky home was greatly improved by a wide porch, which I made along the whole front of our rooms and entrances, by leveling the ground to form a terrace, and sheltering it with a veranda of bamboo, supported by pillars of the same. Ernest and Franz were highly successful as librarians. The books, when unpacked and arranged, proved to be a most valuable collection, capable of affording every sort of educational advantage. Besides a variety of books of voyages, travels, divinity, and natural history, several containing fine colored illustrations, there were histories and scientific works, as well as standard fictions in several languages, Also, a good assortment of maps, charts, mathematical and astronomical instruments, and an excellent pair of globes. I foresaw much interesting study on discovering that we possessed the grammars and dictionaries of a great many languages, a subject for which we all had a taste. With French we were well acquainted. Fritz and Ernest had begun to learn English at school, and made further progress during a visit to England. The mother, who had once been intimate with a Dutch family, could speak that language pretty well. After a great deal of discussion, we agreed to study different languages, so that in the event of meeting with people of other nations, there should be at least one of the family able to communicate with them. All determined to improve our knowledge of German and French. The two elder boys were to study English and Dutch with their mother. Ernest, already possessing considerable knowledge of Latin, wished to continue to study it, so as to be able to make use of the many works on natural history and medicine written in that language. Jack announced that he meant to learn Spanish, because it sounded so grand and imposing. I myself was interested in the Malay language, knowing it to be so widely spoken in the islands of the eastern seas, and thinking it as likely as any other to be useful to us. Our family circle, by and by, represented Babel in miniature, for scraps and fragments of all these tongues kept buzzing about our ears from morning to night, each sporting his newly acquired word or sentence on every possible occasion, propounding idioms and peculiar expressions like riddles to puzzle the rest. In this way the labor of learning was very considerably lightened, and every one came to know a few words of each language. Occasionally we amused ourselves by opening chests and packages hitherto untouched, and brought unexpected treasures to light. Mirrors, wardrobes, a pair of console tables with polished marble tops, elegant writing tables and handsome chairs, clocks of various descriptions, a musical box, and a chronometer were found, and by degrees our abode was fitted up like a palace, so that sometimes we wondered at ourselves— and felt as though we were strutting about in borrowed plumes. The children begged me to decide on a name for our salt cave dwelling, and that of Ruckburg was chosen unanimously. The weeks of imprisonment passed so rapidly that no one found time hang heavy on his hands. Books occupied me so much that but little carpentering was done, yet I made a yoke for the oxen, a pair of cotton-wool carders, and a spinning-wheel for my wife. As the rainy season drew to a close, the weather for a while became wilder, and the storms fiercer than ever. Thunder roared, lightning blazed, torrents rushed toward the sea, 
which came in raging billows to meet them, lashed to fury by the tempests of wind which swept the surface of the deep. The uproar of the elements came to an end at last. Nature resumed her attitude of repose, her smiling aspect of peaceful beauty, and soon all traces of the ravages of floods and storms would disappear beneath the luxuriant vegetation of the tropics. Gladly quitting the sheltering walls of Rockburg, to roam once more in the open air, we crossed Jackal River, for a walk along the coast, and presently Fritz, with sharp eyes, observed something on the small island near Flamingo Marsh, which was, he said, long and rounded, resembling a boat bottom upward. Examining it with the telescope, I could form no other conjecture, and we resolved to make it the object of an excursion next day, being delighted to resume our old habit of starting in pursuit of adventure. The boat was accordingly got in readiness. It required some repairs and fresh pitching, and then we made for the point of interest, indulging in a variety of surmises as to what we should find. It proved to be a huge, stranded whale. The island being steep and rocky, it was necessary to be careful, but we found a landing place on the further side. The boys hurried by the nearest way to the beach, where lay the monster of the deep, while I clambered to the highest point of the islet, which commanded a view of the mainland, from Rockburg to Falkenhurst. On rejoining my sons I found them only halfway to the great fish, and as I drew near they shouted in high glee, "'Oh, father, just look at the glorious shells and coral branches we are finding. How does it happen that there are such quantities?' Only consider how the recent storms have stirred the ocean to its depths. No doubt thousands of shellfish have been detached from their rocks, and dashed in all directions by the waves, which have thrown ashore even so huge a creature as the great whale yonder. "'Yes, isn't he a frightful great brute?' cried Fritz. "'Ever so much larger than he seemed from a distance. "'The worst of it is, one does not well see what use to make of the huge carcass.' "'Why, make train oil, to be sure,' said Ernest. "'I can't say he's a beauty, though, "'and it is much pleasanter to gather these lovely shells "'than to cut up blubber.' "'Well, let us amuse ourselves with them for the present,' said I. "'But in the afternoon, when the sea is calmer, "'we will return with the necessary implements "'and see if we can turn the stranded whale to good account.' "'We were soon ready to return to the boat,' but Ernest had a fancy for remaining alone on the island till we came back, and asked my permission to do so, that he might experience, for an hour or two, the sensations of Robinson Crusoe. To this, however, I would not consent, assuring him that our fate, as a solitary family, gave him quite sufficient idea of shipwreck on an uninhabited island, and that his lively imagination must supply the rest." The boys found it hard work to row back, and began to beg of me to exert my wonderful inventive powers in contriving some kind of rowing machine. "'You lazy fellows,' returned I. "'Give me the great clockwork out of a church tower. Perhaps I might be able to relieve your labors.' "'Oh, father,' cried Fritz, "'don't you know there are iron wheels in the clockwork of the large kitchen jacks? I'm sure mother would give them up.' "'and you could make something out of them, could you not?' "'By the time I have manufactured a rowing machine out of a roasting jack, "'I think your arms will be pretty well inured to the use of your oars. "'However, I am far from despising the hint, my dear Fritz.' "'Is coral of any use?' demanded Jack suddenly. "'In former times it was pounded and used by chemists, "'but it is now chiefly used for various ornaments.' and made into beads for necklaces, etc. As such it is greatly prized by savages, and were we to fall in with natives, we might very possibly find a store of coral useful in bartering with them. For the present we will arrange these treasures of the deep in our library, and make them the beginning of a museum of natural history, which will afford us equal pleasure and instruction. One might almost say that coral belongs at once to the animal, "'Vegetable and mineral kingdoms,' remarked Fritz. "'It is hard like stone, it has stems and branches like a shrub, "'and I believe tiny insects inhabit the cells, do they not, father?' 
You are right, Fritz. Coral consists of the calcareous cells of minute animals, so built up as to form a tree-like structure. The coral fishery gives employment to many men in the Persian Gulf, the Mediterranean Sea, and other places. The instrument commonly used consists of two heavy beams of wood, secured together at right angles and loaded with stones. Hemp and netting are attached to the underside of the beams, to the middle of which is fastened one end of a strong rope, by which the apparatus is let down from a boat and guided to the spots where the coral is most abundant. The branches of the coral become entangled in the hemp and network. They are broken off from the rock and are drawn to the surface of the water. Left undisturbed, these coral insects, laboring incessantly, raise foundations on which, in course of time, fertile islands appear, clothed with verdure, and inhabited by man. "'Why, father, here we are at the landing-place!' exclaimed Jack. "'It has seemed quite easy to pull, since you began to tell us such interesting things.' "'Very interesting indeed, but did you notice that the wind had changed, Jack?' remarked Ernest, as he shipped his oar. The animated recital of our adventures, the sight of the lovely shells and corals, and the proposed work for the afternoon, inspired the mother and Franz with a great wish to accompany us. To this I gladly consented, only stipulating that we should go provided with food, water, and a compass. For, said I, the sea has only just ceased from its raging, and being at the best of times of uncertain and capricious nature, we may chance to be detained on the island, or forced to land at a considerable distance from home. Dinner was quickly dispatched, and preparations set on foot. The more oil we could obtain, the better, for a great deal was used in the large lantern which burnt day and night in the recesses of the cave. Therefore all available casks and barrels were pressed into the service. Many, of course, once full of pickled herrings, potted pigeons, and other winter stores, were now empty, and we took a goodly fleet of these in tow. Knives, hatchets, and the boys' climbing buskins were put on board, and we set forth, the labor of the oar being greater than ever now that our freight was so much increased. The sea being calm, and the tide suiting better, we found it easy to land the boat close to the whale. My first care was to place the boat, as well as the casks, in perfect security, after which we proceeded to a close inspection of our prize. Its enormous size quite startled my wife and her little boy, the length being from sixty to sixty-five feet, and the girth between thirty and forty, while the weight could not have been less than fifty thousand pounds. The color was a uniform velvety black, and the enormous head about one-third of the length of the entire bulk, the eyes quite small, not much larger than those of an ox, and the ears almost undiscernible. The jaw opened very far back, and was nearly sixteen feet in length, the most curious part of its structure being the remarkable substance known as whalebone, masses of which appeared all along the jaws, solid at the base, and splitting into a sort of fringe at the extremity. This arrangement is for the purpose of aiding the whale in procuring its food, and separating it from the water. The tongue was remarkably large, soft, and full of oil, the opening of the throat wonderfully small, scarcely two inches in diameter. "'Why, what can the monster eat?' exclaimed Fritz. "'He never can swallow a proper mouthful down this little gullet.' "'The mode of feeding adopted by the whale is so curious,' I replied, "'that I must explain it to you before we begin work.' "'This animal, for I should tell you that a whale is not a fish, "'he possesses no gills, he breathes atmospheric air, "'and would be drowned if too long detained below the surface of the water. "'This animal, then, frequents those parts of the ocean "'best supplied with the various creatures on which he feeds. "'Shrimps, small fish, lobsters, various mollusks and medusae form his diet. "'Diving with open mouth through the congregated shoals of these little creatures, "'the whale engulfs them by millions in his enormous jaws.' and continues his destructive course until he has sufficiently charged his mouth with prey. Closing his jaws and forcing out through the interstices of the whalebone, 
the water which he has taken together with his prey, he retains the captured animals and swallows them at his leisure. The nostrils or blowholes are placed, you see, on the upper part of the head, in order that the whale may rise to breathe and repose on the surface of the sea, showing very little of his huge carcass. The breathings are called spoutings, because a column of mixed vapor and water is thrown from the blowholes, sometimes to a height of twenty feet. And now, boys, fasten on your buskins, and let me see if you can face the work of climbing this slippery mountain of flesh and cutting it up. Fritz and Jack stripped and went to work directly, scrambling over the back to the head, where they assisted me to cut away the lips, so as to reach the whalebone, a large quantity of which was detached and carried to the boat. Ernest labored manfully at the creature's side, cutting out slabs of blubber, while his mother and Franz helped as well as they could to put it in casks. Presently we had a multitude of unbidden guests. The air was filled by the shrill screams and hoarse croaks and cries of numbers of birds of prey. They flew around us in ever-narrowing circles, and becoming bolder as their voracity was excited by the near view of the tempting prey, they alighted close to us, snatching morsels greedily from under the very strokes of our knives and hatchets. Our work was seriously interrupted by these feathered marauders, who, after all, were no greater robbers than we ourselves. We kept them off as well as we could by blows from our tools, and several were killed, my wife taking possession of them immediately for the sake of the feathers. It was nearly time to leave the island, but first I stripped off a long piece of the skin, to be used for traces, harness, and other leather work. It was about three quarters of an inch thick, and very soft and oily, but I knew it would shrink and be tough and durable. I also took part of the gums in which the roots of the baleen, or whalebone, was still embedded, having read that this is considered quite a delicacy, as well as the skin, which, when properly dressed and cut in little cubes like black dice, has been compared, by enthusiastic and probably very hungry travellers, to coconut and cream cheese. The boys thought the tongue might prove equally palatable, but I valued it only on account of the large quantity of oil it contained. With a heavy freight we put to sea, and made what haste we could to reach home, and cleanse our persons from the unpleasant traces of the disgusting work in which we had spent the day. Next morning we started at dawn. My wife and Franz were left behind, for our proposed work was even more horrible than that of the preceding day. They could not assist, and had no inclination to witness it. It was my intention to open the carcass completely, and, penetrating the interior, to obtain various portions of the intestines, thinking that it would be possible to convert the larger ones into vessels fit for holding the oil. This time we laid aside our clothes, and wore only strong canvas trousers when we commenced operations, which were vigorously carried on during the whole of the day. Then, satisfied that we could do so with a clear conscience, we abandoned the remains to the birds of prey, and, with a full cargo, set sail for land." On the way it appeared to strike the boys, who had made not the slightest objection to the singularly unpleasant task I had set them, as very strange that I should wish to possess what they had been working so hard to procure for me. "'What can have made you wish to bring away that brute's entrails, father? Are they of any use?' "'There are countries,' I replied, "'where no wood grows of which to make barrels, and no hemp for thread, string, and cordage.' Necessity, the mother of all the more valuable inventions, has taught the inhabitants of these countries, Greenlanders, Eskimos, and others, to think of substitutes, and they use the intestines of the whale for one purpose, the sinews and nerves for the other. We were right glad to land, and get rid, for the present, of our unpleasant materials, the further preparation of which was work in store for the following day. A refreshing bath, clean clothes, and supper, cheered us all up, and we slept in peace. "'Now for the finishing up of this dirty job,' cried I, merrily, as we all woke up next morning at daybreak. And after the regular work was done, we commenced operations by raising a stand, 
or rough scaffold on which the tubs full of blubber were placed and heavily pressed, so that the purest and finest oil overflowed into vessels underneath. The blubber was afterward boiled in a cauldron over a fire kindled at some distance from our abode, and by skimming and straining through a coarse cloth, we succeeded in obtaining a large supply of excellent train oil, which, in casks and bags made of the intestines, was safely stowed away in the cellar, as the children called our roughest storeroom. This day's work was far from agreeable, and the dreadful smell oppressed us all, more especially my poor wife, who, nevertheless, endured it with her accustomed good temper. Although she very urgently recommended that the new island should be the headquarters for another colony, where, said she, any animals we leave would be safe from apes and other plunderers, and where you would find it so very convenient to boil whale blubber, strain train oil, and the like. This proposal met with hearty approval, especially from the boys, who were always charmed with any new plan, and they were eager to act upon it at once. But when I reminded them of the putrefying carcass which lay there, they confessed it would be better to allow wind and storms, birds and insects, to do their work in purging the atmosphere, and reducing the whale to a skeleton, before we revisited the island. The idea of a rowing machine kept recurring to my brain. I determined to attempt to make one. I took an iron bar, which, when laid across the middle of the boat, projected about a foot each way. I provided this bar in the middle with ribbed machinery, and at each end with a sort of nave in which, as in a cartwheel, four flat spokes or paddles were fixed obliquely. These were intended to do the rower's part. Then the jack was arranged to act upon the machinery in the middle of the iron crossbar in such a way that one of its strong cog wheels bit firmly into the ribs, so that, when it was wound up, it caused the bar to revolve rapidly, of course turning with it the paddles fixed at either end, which consequently struck the water so as to propel the boat. Although this contrivance left much to be desired in the way of improvement, still when Fritz and I wound up the machinery, and went off on a trial trip across the bay, we splashed along at such a famous rate that the shores rang with the cheers and clapping of the whole family, delighted to behold what they considered my brilliant success. Everyone wanted to go on board and take a cruise, but as it was getting late I could not consent. A trip next day, however, was promised to Cape Disappointment, and the little settlement of Prospect Hill. This proposal satisfied everybody. The evening was spent in preparing the dresses, arms, and food, which would be required, and we retired early to rest. Intending to be out all day, the house was left in good order, and we departed on our expedition provided, among other things, with spades and mattocks, for I wished to get young coconut trees and shrubs of different kinds that, on our way back, we might land on Whale Island and begin our plantation there. We directed our course toward the opposite side of the bay. The sea was smooth, my rowing machine performed its work easily, and, leaving Safety Bay and Shark Island behind us, we enjoyed at our ease the panorama of all the coast scenery. Landing near Prospect Hill, we moored the boat, and walked through the woods to our little farm, obtaining some fresh coconuts, as well as young plants, on the way. Before coming in sight of the cottage at the farm, we heard the cocks crow, and I experienced a sudden rush of emotion as the sound recalled, in a degree painfully vivid, the recollection of many a ride and walk at home, when we would be greeted by just such familiar sounds as we approached some kind friend's house. Here, but for the unconscious animals, utter solitude and silence prevailed, and I, with my dear family, whose visit would have been hailed with delight in so many homes, advanced unnoticed to this lonely cottage. So long had been our absence that our arrival created a perfect panic. The original animals had forgotten us, and to their progeny, lambs, kids, and chickens, who had never seen the face of man, we seemed an army of fierce foes. The boys found it impossible to milk the goats, until, by the use of the lasso, they captured them one after the other, bound their legs, then giving them salt to lick, they soon obtained a supply of excellent milk, 
which was poured from the coconut shells they used into calabash flasks, so that we could take with us what was not required at dinner. The fowls were enticed by handfuls of grain and rice, and my wife caught as many as she wished for. We were by this time very ready for dinner, and the cold provisions we had with us were set forth, the chief dish consisting of the piece of whale's tongue, which, by the boy's desire, had been cooked with a special view to this entertainment. But woeful was the disappointment when the tongue was tasted. One after another, with dismal face, pronounced it horrid stuff, begged for some pickled herring to take away the taste of train oil, and willingly bestowed on fangs the cherished dainty. Fortunately there was a sufficient supply of other eatables, and the fresh delicious coconuts and goat's milk put every one in good humour again. While the mother packed everything up, Fritz and I got some sugar-cane shoots which I wished to plant, and then we returned to the shore and again embarked. Before returning to Whale Island I felt a strong wish to round Cape Disappointment and survey the coast immediately beyond, but the promontory maintained the character of its name, and we found that a long sandbank, as well as hidden reefs and rocks, ran out a great way into the sea. Fritz espying breakers ahead, we put about at once, and, aided by a light breeze, directed our course toward Whale Island. On landing I began at once to plant the saplings we had brought. The boys assisted me for a while, but wearied somewhat of the occupation, and one after another went off in search of shells and coral, leaving their mother and me to finish the work. Presently Jack came back, shouting loudly, "'Father, mother, do come and look. There is an enormous skeleton lying here, the skeleton of some fearful great beast. A mammoth, I should think.' "'Why, Jack,' returned I, laughing, "'have you forgot our old acquaintance, the whale? What else could it be?' "'Oh, no, father, it is not the whale. This thing has not fish bones, but real, good, honest, huge beast bones. I don't know what can have become of the whale, floated out to sea, most likely. This mammoth is ever so much bigger. Come and see.' As I was about to follow the boy, a voice from another direction suddenly cried, "'Father, father, a great enormous turtle. Please make haste. It is waddling back to the sea as hard as it can go, and we can't stop it.' This appeal being more pressing, as well as more important than Jack's, I snatched up an oar and hastened to their assistance. Sure enough a large turtle was scrambling quickly toward the water, and was within a few paces of it, although Ernest was valiantly holding on by one of its hind legs. I sprang down the bank, and, making use of the oar as a lever, we succeeded with some difficulty in turning the creature on its back. It was a huge specimen, fully eight feet long, and being now quite helpless we left it sprawling, and went to inspect Jack's mammoth skeleton, which, of course, proved to be neither more nor less than that of the whale. I convinced him of the fact by pointing out the marks of our feet on the ground, and the broken jaws where we had hacked out the whalebone. "'What can have made you take up that fancy about a mammoth, my boy?' "'Ernest put it into my head, father,' He said there seemed to be the skeleton of an antediluvian monster there, so I ran to look closer, and I never thought of the whale when I saw no fish bones. I suppose Ernest was joking. Whales are generally considered as fishes by those little acquainted with the animal kingdom, but they belong to the class of mammals, which comprises man, the monkey tribes, the bats, the dogs and cats, all hoofed animals, whales and their allies, with other animals, the last on the list being the sloth. The name by which they are distinguished is derived from the Latin word mamma, a breast, and is given to them because all the species belonging to this class are furnished with a set of organs called the mammary glands, secreting the liquid known as milk, by which the young are nourished. The bones of the whale differ from those of animals, simply in being of a hollow construction, and filled with air, so as to render the carcass more buoyant. The bones of birds are also hollow, for the same reason, and in all this we see conspicuously the wisdom and goodness of the great Creator. "'What a marvellous structure it is, father,' said Fritz. "'What a ponderous mass of bones! Can we not make use of any of them?' "'Nothing strikes me at this moment. We will leave them to bleach here yet a while, and, perhaps by sawing them up afterward, make a few chairs.' 
or a reading desk for the museum. But now it is time to return home. Bring the boat round to where the turtle awaits his fate, and we must settle how to deal with him. It was soon decided that he must swim. I fastened the empty water cask to a long line, one end of which was made fast to the bow of the boat, the other carefully passed round the neck and forepaws of the creature, who was then lifted, so as to let him regain his feet, when he instantly made for the water, plunged in, the cask floated after him, and prevented his sinking. We were all on board in a moment, and the worthy fellow, after vainly attempting to dive, set himself diligently to swim right forward, towing us comfortably after him. I was ready to cut the line at the least appearance of danger, and kept him on the course for safety bay, by striking the water with a boat-hook, right or left, according as the turtle was disposed to turn too much one way or the other. The boys were delighted with the fun, and compared me to Neptune in his car, drawn by dolphins, and accompanied by Amphitrite and attendant tritons. We landed safely at the usual place near Rockburg, and the turtle was condemned and executed soon afterward. The shell, which was quite eight feet long and three broad, was, when cleaned and prepared, to form a trough for the water supply at the cave, and the meat was carefully salted and stored up for many a good and savory meal. It had been my intention to bring a piece of land under cultivation before the next rainy season, to be sown with different sorts of grain, but many unforeseen circumstances had intervened to hinder this, and our animals, unaccustomed to the yoke, were not available for the plough. I therefore gave up the idea for the present, and applied myself, with Ernest's assistance, to completing the loom, which, although the workmanship was clumsy, I succeeded in making quite fit for use. I had fortunately, in my younger days, spent many hours in the workshops of weavers and other artisans, and therefore I understood more than might have been expected of their various crafts. Paste or size was required to smear over the threads, but we could not spare floor for such a purpose, and I used isinglass, which kept the warp moist perfectly well, and spared us the necessity of setting up the loom in a damp, uncomfortable place, which has often to be done to prevent the over-drying of the web. Of this isinglass I also made thin plates, to be used as window panes, they were at least as transparent as horn, and when fixed deep in the rock, and beyond the reach of rain, did good service in admitting light. Success encouraging me to persevere, I next began harness-making, the spoils of the chase having furnished us with plenty of leather, with which I covered light frames of wood, using a hairy moss or lichen for stuffing, and ere long the animals were equipped with saddles, stirrups, bridles, yokes, and collars, to the very great satisfaction of their youthful riders and drivers. This occupation was followed by a great deal of work connected with the annual return of the herring shoals, which now took place, to them succeeding, as on former occasions, shoals of other fish and many seals. More than ever aware of the value of all these, we did not fail to make good use of our opportunities, and captured large numbers. The boys were getting anxious for another shooting expedition, but before undertaking that I wished to do some basket-making, as sacks were beginning to fail us, and there was constant demand for baskets in which to carry and keep our roots and fruits. Our first attempts were clumsy enough, but, as usual, perseverance was rewarded, and we produced a good supply of all sorts and sizes. One very large basket I furnished with openings through which to pass a strong stick, so that it might, when heavily laden, be carried by two persons." No sooner did the children see the force of this idea than they got a bamboo and, popping little fronts into the basket, carried him about in triumph. This amusement suggested a fresh notion to Fritz. "'Oh, father,' cried he, "'don't you think we might make something like this for mother and carry her much more comfortably than jolting along in the cart?' The boys shouted with glee at the proposal, and though their mother thought the plan feasible enough, she confessed that she did not much like the thoughts of sitting in the middle of a basket, and just looking out now and then over the rim. However, I assured her it should be a well-shaped, comfortable sedan-chair, or litter, and the next question was how it should be carried, since the boys could not play the part of Indian palanquin-bearers, either with safety to their mother, or with any pleasure to themselves. 
"'The bull and the buffalo!' cried Jack. "'Why not use them for it? Let's go and try them now!' Off ran the boys, and in a short time the basket was securely hung between Storm and Grumble. Fritz and Jack sprang into their saddles, and Ernest very gingerly deposited himself in the cradle, as Franz called it. They set forth at a most sober pace, the animals, who were perfectly docile, appearing only a little surprised at the new arrangement. "'Oh, it is so pleasant, mother. It is a delightful motion,' cried Ernest as they passed us. "'It swings and rocks really soothingly. Quicker, Fritz, go quicker!' And, the trot pleasing him equally well, the pace gradually quickened, till the animals were going along at a rate which shook and jolted the basket about most fearfully. Ernest called and screamed in vain for a halt. His brothers thought it capital fun to shake up the professor, and made the circuit of the level ground near Rockburg, finally pulling up in front of us, like performers stopping to receive the applause of spectators. It was impossible to help laughing, the scene was so ridiculous, but Ernest was very angry with his brothers. His reproaches provoked high words in reply, and a quarrel was imminent, but I interfered, and showed them how easily a joke, carried too far, would lead to disputes and bad feeling, urging them to avoid on all occasions any breach of the good fellowship and brotherly love, which was the mainstay of our strength and happiness. Good humor was soon restored, Ernest himself helped to unharness the beasts, and got some handfuls of salt and barley to reward their exertions, saying that they must have some more palanquin practice another day. I was seated with my wife and Fritz beneath the shade of the veranda, engaged in wicker work, and chatting pleasantly, when suddenly Fritz got up, advanced a step or two, gazing fixedly along the avenue which led from Jackal River. Then he exclaimed, "'I see something so strange in the distance, father. What in the world can it be? First it seems to be drawn in coils on the ground like a cable, then up rises as if it were a little mast, then that sinks, and the coils move along again. It is coming toward the bridge.' My wife took alarm at this description, and, calling the other boys, retreated into the cave, where I desired them to close up the entrances and keep watch with firearms at the upper windows. These were openings we had made in the rock at some elevation, reached within by steps, and a kind of gallery which passed along the front of the rooms. Fritz remained by me while I examined the object through my spyglass. "'It is, as I feared, an enormous serpent,' cried I. "'It advances directly this way, and we shall be placed in the greatest possible danger, for it will cross the bridge to a certainty.' "'May we not attack it, father?' exclaimed the brave boy. "'Only with the greatest caution,' returned I. "'It is far too formidable and too tenacious of life for us rashly to attempt its destruction. "'Thank God we are at Rockburg, where we can keep in safe retreat while we watch for an opportunity to destroy this frightful enemy. "'Go up to your mother now and assist in preparing the firearms. "'I will join you directly.' but I must further observe the monster's movements. Fritz left me unwilling, while I continued to watch the serpent, which was of gigantic size, and already much too near the bridge to admit of the possibility of removing that means of access to our dwelling. I recollected, too, how easily it would pass through the walls. The reptile advanced with writhing and undulatory movements, from time to time rearing its head to the height of fifteen or twenty feet, and slowly turning it about, as though on the lookout for prey. As it crossed the bridge, with a slow, suspicious motion, I withdrew, and hastily rejoined my little party, which was preparing to garrison our fortress in warlike array, but with considerable trepidation, which my presence served in a measure to allay. We placed ourselves at the upper openings, after strongly barricading everything below, and, ourselves unseen, awaited with beating hearts the further advance of the foe, which speedily became visible to us. Its movements appeared to become uncertain, as though puzzled by the trace of human habitation. It turned in different directions, coiling and uncoiling, and frequently rearing its head, but keeping about the middle of the space in front of the cave, when suddenly, as though unable to resist doing so, one after another the boys fired, and even their mother discharged her gun. 
the shots took not the slightest effect beyond startling the monster, whose movements were accelerated. Fritz and I also fired with steadier aim, but, with the same want of success for the monster, passing on with a gliding motion, entered the reedy marsh to the left, and entirely disappeared. A wonderful weight seemed lifted from our hearts, while all eagerly discussed the vast length and awful though magnificent appearance of the serpent. I had recognized it as the boa constrictor. It was a vast specimen, upward of thirty feet in length. I explained to the children that its name in South America is Boaguacu, the first syllable of that word with the Latin addition, which indicates that it kills its prey by pressure, or constriction, gives the name by which it is commonly known. The near neighborhood of this terrific reptile occasioned me the utmost anxiety, and I desired that no one should leave the house on any pretense whatever, without my express permission. During three whole days we were kept in suspense and fear, not daring to stir above a few hundred steps from the door, although during all that time the enemy showed no sign of his presence. In fact, we might have been induced to think the boa had passed across the swamp, and found his way by some cleft or chasm through the wall of cliffs beyond, had not the restless behavior of our geese and ducks given proof that he still lurked in the thicket of reeds which they were accustomed to make their nightly resting place. They swam anxiously about, and with much clapping of wings and disturbed cackling showed their uneasiness. Finally taking wing they crossed the harbor and took up their quarters on Shark Island. My embarrassment increased as time passed on. I could not venture to attack with insufficient force a monstrous and formidable serpent concealed in dense thickets amidst dangerous swamps. Yet it was dreadful to live in a state of blockade, cut off from all the important duties in which we were engaged, and shut up with our animals in the unnatural light of the cave, enduring constant anxiety and perturbation. Out of this painful state we were at last delivered by none other than our good old simple-hearted donkey, not, however, by the exercise of a praiseworthy quality, such as the vigilance of the time-honored geese of the capital, but by sheer stupidity. Our situation was rendered the more critical from having no great stock of provisions or fodder for the animals, and, the hay failing us on the evening of the third day, I determined to set them at liberty by sending them, under guidance of Fritz, across the river at the ford. He was to ride Lightfoot, and they were to be fastened together until safely over. Next morning we began to prepare for this by tying them in a line, and while so engaged my wife opened the door, when old Grizzle, who was fresh and frolicsome after the long rest and regular feeding, suddenly broke away from the halter, cut some awkward capers, then, bolting out, careened at full gallop straight for the marsh. In vain we called him by name. Fritz would even have rushed after him had not I held him back. In another moment the ass was close to the thicket, and with the cold shudder of horror we beheld the snake rear itself from its lair. The fiery eyes glanced around, the dark deadly jaws opened widely, the forked tongue darted greedily forth. Poor Grizzle's fate was sealed. Becoming aware on a sudden of his danger, he stopped short, spread out all four legs, and set up the most piteous and discordant bray that ever rung echo from the rocks. Swift and straight as a fencer's thrust, the destroyer was upon him, wound round him, entangled and folded compressed him, all the while cunningly avoiding the convulsive kicks of the agonized animal. A cry of horror arose from the spectators of this miserable tragedy. "'Shoot him, father! Oh, shoot him! Do save poor Grizzle!' "'My children, it is impossible,' cried I. "'Our old friend is lost to us forever. "'I have hopes, however, that when gorged with his prey, "'we may be able to attack the snake with some chance of success.' "'But the horrible wretch is never going to swallow him all at once, father,' cried Jack. "'That will be too shocking.' "'Snakes have no grinders, but only fangs.' Therefore they cannot chew their food, and must swallow it whole. But although the idea is startling, it is not really more shocking than the rending, tearing, and shedding of blood which occurs 
when the lions and tigers seize their prey. But, said Franz, how can the snake separate the flesh from the bones without teeth? And is this kind of snake poisonous? No, dear child, said I, only fearfully strong and ferocious. And it has no need to tear the flesh from the bones. It swallows them, skin, hair, and all, and digests everything in its stomach. It seems utterly impossible that the broad ribs, the strong legs, hoofs, and all should go down that throat, exclaimed Fritz. Only see, I replied, how the monster deals with his victim. Closer and more tightly he curls his crushing folds. The bones give way. He is kneading him into a shapeless mass. He will soon begin to gorge his prey, and slowly but surely it will disappear down that distended maw. The mother, with little Franz, found the scene all too horrible, and hastened into the cave, trembling and distressed. To the rest of us there seemed a fearful fascination in the dreadful sight, and we could not move from the spot. I expected that the boa, before swallowing his prey, would cover it with saliva to aid in the operation, although it struck me that its very slender forked tongue was about the worst possible implement for such a purpose. It was evident to us, however, that this popular idea was erroneous. The act of lubricating the mass must have taken place during the process of swallowing. Certainly nothing was applied beforehand. This wonderful performance lasted from seven in the morning until noon. When the awkward morsel was entirely swallowed, the serpent lay stiff, distorted, and apparently insensible along the edge of the marsh. I felt that now or never was the moment for attack. Calling on my sons to maintain their courage and presence of mind, I left our retreat with a feeling of joyous emotion quite new to me, and approached with rapid steps and leveled gun the outstretched form of the serpent. Fritz followed me closely. Jack, somewhat timidly, came several paces behind, while Ernest, after a little hesitation, remained where he was. The monster's body was stiff and motionless, which made its rolling and fiery eyes, and the slow spasmodic undulations of its tail, more fearful by contrast. We fired together, and both balls entered the skull. The light of the eye was extinguished, and the only movement was in the further extremity of the body, which rolled, writhed, coiled, and lashed from side to side. Advancing closer, we fired our pistols directly into its head, a convulsive quiver ran through the mighty frame, and the boa constrictor lay dead. As we raised a cry of victory, Jack, desirous of a share in the glory of conquest, ran close to the creature, firing his pistol into its side, when he was sent sprawling over and over by a movement of its tail, excited to a last galvanic effort by the shot. Being in no way hurt, he speedily recovered his feet, and declared he had given it its quietus. "'I hope the terrible noise you made just now was the signal of victory,' said my wife, drawing near, with the utmost circumspection, and holding Franz tightly by the hand. "'I was half afraid to come, I assure you. "'See this dreadful creature dead at our feet, and let us thank God that we have been able to destroy such an enemy.' "'What's to be done with him now?' asked Jack. "'Let us get him stuffed,' said Fritz, "'and set him up in the museum among our shells and corals.' "'Did anybody ever think of eating serpents?' inquired Franz. "'Of course not,' said his mother. "'Why, child, serpents are poisonous. It would be very dangerous.' "'Excuse me, my dear wife,' said I. First of all, the boa is not poisonous, and then, besides that, the flesh of even poisonous snakes can be eaten without danger, as, for instance, the rattlesnake, from which can be made a strong and nourishing soup, tasting very like good chicken broth, of course the cook must be told to throw away the head, containing the deadly fangs. It is remarkable that pigs do not fear poisonous snakes, but can kill and eat them without injury. An instance of this occurs in my memory. A vessel on Lake Superior in North America was wrecked on a small island abounding in rattlesnakes, and for that reason uninhabited. The vessel had a cargo of live pigs. The crew escaped to the mainland in a boat, but the pigs had to be left for some time, till the owner could return to fetch them, but with the small hope of finding many alive. 
To his surprise, the animals were not only alive, but remarkably fat and flourishing, while not a single rattlesnake remained on the island. The pigs had clearly eaten the serpents. But might not some other cause have been assigned for their disappearance? asked Ernest. Suppose, for example, that a great flight of secretary birds had arrived. They might have cleared the island of rattlesnakes. Oh, what is a secretary bird? interrupted Franz. I thought a secretary meant a man who wrote letters. So it does, Franz, and the bird Ernest spoke of has curious long feathers projecting from either side of its head, something like pens stuck behind a man's ear, hence its name. It is perfectly true that it lives on snakes, lizards, toads, and frogs, but, Ernest, I cannot give up my pigs, for, in the first place, the secretary bird is an inhabitant of southern Africa, and is never seen in North America. Neither does it ever fly in a flock. Still, so ravenous is its appetite that, no doubt, even one or two, had they by some miracle found themselves on Lake Superior, would have been able to give a very good account of the deadly reptiles, and at least shared in the glory of their extermination. My wife having gone to prepare dinner, we continued talking as we rested in the shade of some rocks, near the serpent, for a considerable time. The open air was welcome to us after our long imprisonment, and we were, besides, desirous to drive off any birds of prey who might be attracted to the carcass, which we wished to preserve entire. My boys questioned me closely on the subject of serpents in general, and I described to them the action of the poison fangs, how they folded back on the sides of the upper jaw, and how the poison secreting glands and reservoir are found at the back and sides of the head, giving to the venomous serpents that peculiar width of head which is so unfailing a characteristic. The fangs are hollow, said I, and when the creature bites, the pressure forces down a tiny drop of the liquid poison, which enters the wound and, through the veins, quickly spreads over the entire system. Sometimes, if taken in time, cures are effected, but in most cases the bite of a serpent is followed by speedy death. The children were much interested in my account of the snake charmers of India, how they fearlessly handle the most deadly of the serpent tribe, the cobra di capello, or hooded cobra, cause them to move in time to musical sounds from a small pipe, twine the reptile about their arms and bare necks, and then, to prove that the poison fangs have not been removed, make them bite a fowl, which soon dies from the effect. "'How is it possible to extract the fangs, father?' asked Ernest. "'No instrument is required,' replied I. "'I have read an account written by a gentleman in India, who saw a snake-charmer catch a large cobra in the jungle, and, for the purpose of removing the fangs, held up a cloth, at which the irritated snake flew, and the fangs being caught in it, the man seized the reptile by the throat, extracted them, and then squeezed out the poison, a clear, oily substance, upon a leaf. What does the rattle of the rattlesnake look like, and how does it sound? At the tip of the tail are a number of curious, loose, horny structures, formed of the same substance as the scales. A very good idea of the structure of the rattle may be formed, by slipping a number of thimbles loosely into each other. The rattlesnake lies coiled with its head flat, and the tip of its tail elevated. When alarmed or irritated, it gives a quivering movement to the tail, which causes the joints of the rattle to shake against each other with a peculiar sound not easily described. All animals, even horses newly brought from Europe, tremble at this noise and try to escape. What is the best thing to be done for the bite of a serpent? inquired Fritz. Remedies are very various, very uncertain, and differ with the species inflicting the bite. Suction, ammonia, oil, the use of the knife, application of fresh mold, lunar caustic, leaves of certain plants, all these and more are mentioned. There is a creeping plant called Aristolochia indica, the leaves of which have in repeated instances done wonders for fearful bites. It is found in many parts of the world, but most plentifully in the hotter regions. A mode of cure adopted by the natives of India, Ceylon, and parts of Africa is by the application of a remarkable object called snake stone. These are described as flattish, something like half an almond with squared ends, rather light, bearing a very high polish, and of an intense jetty black. 
On being bitten by a cobra, the sufferer applies one of these stones to each puncture, where they adhere strongly for a time, five or six minutes being about the average. They seem to absorb the blood as it flows from the wound, and at last fall off, when the danger is considered to be over. But now we must leave this fertile subject of discussion, and I can only say I sincerely trust we may never have cause to resume it, from the appearance of another serpent here of any sort, size, or description. Come, Ernest, can you not give us an epitaph for our unfortunate friend the donkey? We must afford him more honorable sepulchre than he enjoys at present, when we proceed, as we speedily must, to disembowel his murderer. Ernest took the matter quite seriously, and, planting his elbows on his knees, he bent his thoughtful brow in his hands, and remained wrapped in poetic meditation for about two minutes. "'I have it,' cried he. "'But perhaps you will all laugh at me.' "'No, no. Don't be shy, old fellow. Spit it out.' And, thus encouraged by his brother, Ernest, with the blush of a modest author, began. "'Beneath this stone poor Grizzle's bones are laid. A faithful ass he was, and loved by all.' At length his master's voice he disobeyed, and thereby came his melancholy fall. A monstrous serpent, springing from the grass, seized, crushed, and swallowed him before our eyes, but we, though yet we mourn our honest ass, are grateful, for he thereby saved the lives of all the human beings on this shore, a father, mother, and their children four. "'Hurrah for the epitaph! Well done, Ernest!' resounded on all sides." and taking out a large red pencil I used for marking wood, the lines were forthwith inscribed on a great flat stone, being, as I told the boy, the very best poetry that had ever been written on our coast. We then had dinner, and afterward went to work with the serpent. The first operation was to recover the mangled remains of the ass, which, being affected, he was buried in the soft marshy ground close by, and the hole filled up with fragments of rock. Then we yoked Storm and Grumble to the serpent, and dragged it to a convenient distance from Rockburg, where the process of skinning, stuffing, and sewing up again afforded occupation of the deepest interest to the boys for several days. We took great pains to coil it round a pole in the museum, arranging the head with the jaws wide open, so as to look as alarming as possible, and contriving to make eyes and tongue sufficiently well to represent nature." In fact, our dogs never passed the monster without growling, and must have wondered at our taste in keeping such a pet. Over the entrance leading to the museum and library were inscribed these words, No admittance for asses. The double meaning of this sentence pleased us all immensely. The greatest danger to which we had yet been exposed was now over, but there remained much anxiety in my mind, lest another serpent might, unseen by us, have entered the swamp, or might appear, as this had done, from the country beyond Falconhurst. I projected, then, two excursions, the first to make a thorough examination of the thicket and morass, the next right away to the gap, through which alone the arch-enemy could have entered our territory. On summoning my sons to accompany me to the marsh, I found neither Ernest nor Jack very eager to do so, the latter vowing he had the cold shivers each time he thought how his ribs might have been smashed by the last flap of the snake's tail. But I did not yield to their reluctance, and we finally set about crossing the marsh, by placing planks and wicker hurdles on the ground, and changing their places as we advanced. Nothing was discovered beyond tracks in the reeds and the creature's lair, where the rushes, grass, and bog plants were beaten down. Emerging beyond the thicket, we found ourselves on firm ground, near the precipitous wall of rock, and perceived a clear sparkling brook flowing from an opening, which proved to be a cave or grotto of considerable size. The vaulted roof was covered with stalactites, while many formed stately pillars, which seemed as though supporting the roof. The floor was strewn with fine snow-white earth, with a smooth soapy feeling, which I felt convinced was Fuller's earth. "'Well, this is a pleasant discovery,' said I. "'This is as good as soap for washing, "'and will save me the trouble of turning soap-boiler.' "'Perceiving that the streamlet flowed from an opening "'of some width in the inner rock, "'Fritz passed through, in order to trace it to its source, 
presently shouting to me that the opening widened very much, and begging me to follow him. I did so, leaving the other boys in the outer cave, and fired a pistol shot, the reverberating echoes of which testified to the great extent of the place, and lighting the bit of candle I always carried with me, we advanced, the light burning clear and steadily, though shedding a very feeble light, in so vast a space. Suddenly Fritz exclaimed, I verily believe this is a second cave of salt. See how the walls glance, and how the light is reflected from the roof. These cannot be salt crystals, said I. The water which flows over them leaves no track, and tastes quite sweet. I am rather inclined to believe that we have penetrated into a cave of rock crystal. Oh, how splendid! Then we have discovered a great treasure. Certainly, if we could make any use of it. Otherwise, in our situation, it is about as valuable as the lump of gold found by good old Robinson Crusoe. Anyhow, I will break off a piece for a specimen. See, here is a fine bit, only rather dull and not transparent. What a pity! I must knock off another. You must go more carefully to work, or it will look as dull as the first. You destroyed its true form, which is that of a pyramid with six sides or faces. We remained some time in this interesting grotto, but our light burnt low after we had examined it in different directions, and Fritz having secured a large lump, which exhibited several crystals in perfection, we quitted the place, Fritz discharging a farewell shot for the sake of hearing the grand echoes. On reaching the open air we saw poor Jack sobbing bitterly, but as soon as we appeared he ran joyfully toward us and threw himself into my arms. My child, what is the matter? I cried anxiously. Oh, I thought you were lost. I heard a noise twice, as if the rocks had shattered down, and I thought you and Fritz were crushed in the ruins. It was horrible. How glad I am to see you. I comforted the child and explained the noises he had heard, inquiring why he was alone. Ernest is over there among the reeds. I dare say he did not hear the shots. I found Ernest busily engaged in weaving a basket in which to catch fish. He had devised it ingeniously, with a funnel shaped entrance, through which the fish passing would not easily find their way out, but would remain swimming about in the wide part of the apparatus. I shot a young serpent while you were away, father, said he. It lies there, covered with rushes. It is nearly four feet long and as thick as my arm. A serpent, cried I, hurrying toward it in alarm, and fearing there must be a brood of them in the swamp after all. A fine large eel, you mean, my boy. This will provide an excellent supper for us tonight. I am glad you had the courage to kill it, instead of taking to your heels and fleeing from the supposed serpent. Well, I thought it would be so horrid to be pursued and caught that I preferred facing it. My shot took effect. But it was very difficult to kill the creature outright. It moved about, although its head was smashed. The tenacity of life possessed by eels is very remarkable, I said. I have heard that the best mode of killing them is to grasp them by the neck and slap their tails smartly against a stone or post. We made our way back more easily by keeping close to the cliffs, where the ground was firmer, and found the mother washing clothes at the fountain. She rejoiced greatly at our safe return, and was much pleased with the supply of Fuller's earth, as she said there was now very little soap left. The eel was cooked for supper, and during the evening a full account was given of our passage through the swamp, and discovery of the rock crystal cavern. It was most important to ascertain whether any serpent lurked among the woods of our little territory between the cliffs and the sea. Preparations were set on foot for the second and greater undertaking of a search throughout the country beyond the river, as far as the gap. I wished all the family to go on the expedition, a decision which gave universal satisfaction. Intending to be engaged in this search for several weeks, we took the small tent and a store of all sorts of necessary provisions, as well as firearms, tools, cooking utensils, and torches. All these things were packed on the cart, which was drawn by storm and grumble. Jack and Franz mounted them and acted at once the part of riders and drivers. My wife sat comfortably in the cart. Fritz rode in advance, while Ernest and I walked. We were protected in flank by the dogs and fangs, the tame jackal. Directing our course toward woodlands, 
we saw many traces of the serpent's approach to Rockburg. In some places where the soil was loose, the trail, like a broad furrow, was very evident indeed. At Falconhurst we made a halt, and were as usual welcomed by the poultry, as well as by the sheep and goats. We then passed on to Woodlands, where we arrived at nightfall. All was peaceful and in good order. No track of the boa in that direction, no signs of visits from mischievous apes. The little farm and its inhabitants looked most flourishing. Next day was passed in making a survey of the immediate neighborhood, at the same time collecting a quantity of cotton, which was wanted for new pillows and cushions. In the afternoon Franz was my companion, carrying a small gun entrusted to him for the first time. We took Fawn and Bruno with us, and went slowly along the left bank of the lake, winding our way among reedy thickets, which frequently turned us aside a considerable distance from the water. The dogs hunted about in all directions, and raised duck, snipe, and heron. These usually flew directly across the lake, so that Franz got no chance of a shot. He began to get rather impatient, and proposed firing at the black swans we saw sailing gracefully on the glassy surface of the lake. Just then a harsh booming sound struck our ears. I paused in wonder as to whence the noise proceeded, while Franz exclaimed, "'Oh, father, can that be Swift, our young onager?' "'It cannot possibly be Swift,' said I, adding, after listening attentively a minute or two, "'I am inclined to think it must be the cry of a bittern, a fine, handsome bird of the nature of a heron. "'Oh, may I shoot it, father? But I wonder how a bird can make that roaring noise. One would think it was an ox. It is more like lowing than braying.' "'The noise creatures make depends more on the construction of the windpipe, its relation to the lungs and the strength of the muscles which force out the breath, than on their size.' as, for example, how loud is the song of the nightingale and the little canary bird. Some people say the bittern booms with his long bill partly thrust into the boggy ground, which increases the hollow muffled sound of its very peculiar cry. Franz was anxious that the first trophy of his gun should be so rare a bird as the bittern. The dogs were sent into the wood, and we waited some distance apart, in readiness to fire. All at once there was a great rustling in the thicket. Franz fired, and I heard his happy voice calling out, "'I've hit him! I've hit him!' "'What have you hit?' shouted I in return. "'A wild pig,' said he, "'but bigger than Fritz's.' "'Aha! I see you remember the agouti. Perhaps it is not a hog at all, but one of our little pigs from the farm. What will the old sow say to you, Franz?' I soon joined my boy, and found him in transports of joy, over an animal certainly very much like a pig, although its snout was broad and blunt. It was covered with bristles, had no tail, and in colour was a yellowish-grey. Examining it carefully, and noticing its web feet and its curious teeth, I decided that it must be a capybara, a water-loving animal of South America, and Franz was overjoyed to find that he had shot a new creature, as he said. It was difficult to carry it home, but he very sensibly proposed that we should open and clean the carcass, which would make it lighter. And then, putting it in a game-bag, he carried it till quite tired out. He then asked if I thought Bruno would let him strap it on his back. We found the dog willing to bear the burden, and reached Woodlands soon afterward. There we were surprised to see Ernest surrounded by a number of large rats, which lay dead on the ground. "'Where can all these have come from?' exclaimed I. "'Have you and your mother been rat-hunting, instead of gathering rice as you intended?' "'We came upon these creatures quite unexpectedly,' he replied, while in the rice-swamp. Knips, who was with us, sprang away to a kind of long-shaped mound among the reeds, and pounced upon something which tried to escape into a hole. He chattered and gnashed his teeth, and the creature hissed and squeaked, and running up I found he had got a big rat by the tail. He would not let go, and the rat could not turn in the narrow entrance to bite him, but I soon pulled it out and killed it with my stick. The mound was a curious-looking erection, so I broke it open with some difficulty, and in doing this dislodged quite a dozen of the creatures. Some I killed, but many plunged into the water and escaped. 
On examining their dwelling, I found it a vaulted tunnel made of clay and mud, and thickly lined with sedges, rushes, and water lily leaves. There were other mounds or lodges close by, and seeking an entrance to one, I stretched my game bag across it, and then hammered on the roof till a whole lot of rats sprang out, several right into the bag. I hid away right and left, but began to repent of my audacity when I found the whole community swarming about in the wildest excitement, some escaping, but many stopping in bewilderment, while others actually attacked me. It was anything but pleasant, I assure you, and I began to think of Bishop Hatto in the Mouse Tower on the Rhine. Knips liked it as little as I did, and skipped about desperately to get out of their way, though he now and then seized a rat by the neck in his teeth. Just as I began to shout for help, Juno came dashing through the reeds and water, and made quick work with the enemy, all flying from her attack. My mother had great difficulty in forcing her way through the marsh to the scene of action, but reached me at last, and we collected all the slain to show you, and for the sake of their skins. This account excited my curiosity, and I went to examine the place Ernest described, where I found, to my surprise, an arrangement much like a beaver dam, though on a small scale, and less complete. "'You have discovered a colony of beaver rats,' said I to Ernest, so called from their resemblance in skill and manner of life to that wonderful creature. Muskrat, musquash, and ondatra are other names given to them. They have, you see, webbed feet and flattened tails, and we shall find that they carry two small glands containing the scented substance called musk. The sooner we strip off the skins, the better. They will be useful for making caps. We went back to the house, and met Fritz and Jack just returned from their excursion, reporting that no trace of serpents, great or small, had been met with. Jack carried in his hat about a dozen eggs, and Fritz had shot a couple of heath fowls, a cock and hen. We sat down to supper, Franz eager to partake of his capybara. Even he himself made a face at the peculiar flavor of the meat. "'It is the musk which you taste,' said I, and I described to them the various animals in which this strange liquid is found. The musk deer, musk ox, crocodile, muskrat of India, also called kudeli, which taints a corked bottle of wine if it only runs across it, concluding with an account of the civet, also called civet-cat. The civet, said I, is a handsome black and white animal, and the perfume obtained from it was formerly considered a valuable medicine. In the present day it is used chiefly as a scent. This odiferous substance is secreted, i.e. formed, in a double glandular pouch near the tail, and the Dutch keep the creature in captivity, so that it shall afford them a continual supply. The method of removing the civet perfume is ingenious. The animal is very quick and elastic in its movements, and having sharp teeth it is not pleasant to handle. So it is put into a long, narrow cage in which it cannot turn round. A horn spoon is then introduced, and the perfume, a thick, oily stuff, something like butter, is coolly scraped from the pouch, the plundered civet being then released from straight durance until the supply is reformed. Presently Jack ran for his game bag, producing some fruit which he had forgotten. Several pale green apples, quite new to us, excited general attention. "'Why, what are those? Are they good?' I asked. "'I hope so, for we sadly want something to take away the taste of Franz's beast,' said Jack. "'But Fritz and I were afraid of eating some awful poison or other, like the manchineel, so we brought them for the inspection of the learned master Knips.' I took one, and cut it in two, remarking that it contained a circle of seeds or pips, instead of the stone of the manchineel. At that moment Knips slyly came up behind me, and, snatching up one half, began to munch it with the liveliest satisfaction, an example which the boys were so eager to follow that a general scramble ensued, and I had some trouble in securing a couple of apples for myself and their mother. I imagined this to be the cinnamon apple of the Antilles. Everyone seeming wearied by the fatigues of the day, our mattresses and pillows were arranged, and the inmates of Woodlands betook themselves to repose. With early light we commenced the next day's journey, directing our course to a point between the sugar-break and the gap, 
where we had once made a sort of arbor of the branches of trees. As this remained in pretty good condition, we spread a sailcloth over the top of it, instead of pitching the tent, and made it very comfortable quarters for the short time I proposed to stay there. Our object being to search the neighborhood for traces of the boa constrictor, or any of his kindred, Fritz, Jack, and Franz went with me to the sugar cane break, and satisfied ourselves that our enemy had not been there. It was long since we had enjoyed the fresh juice of these canes, and we were refreshing ourselves therewith, when a loud barking of dogs, and loud rustling and rattling through the thicket of canes, disturbed our pleasant occupation, and, as we could see nothing a yard off where we stood, I hurried to the open ground, and, with guns in readiness, we awaited what was coming. In a few minutes a herd of creatures like little pigs issued from the thicket, and made off in single file at a brisk trot. They were of a uniform grey colour, and showed short, sharp tusks. My trusty double barrel speedily laid low two of the fugitives. The others continued to follow the leader in line, scarcely turning aside to pass the dead bodies of their comrades, and maintaining the same steady pace, although Fritz and Jack also fired and killed several. I felt certain that these were peccaries, and recollected that an odiferous gland in the back must be removed immediately, otherwise the meat will become tainted and quite unfit to eat. This operation, with the help of my boys, I accordingly performed at once. Presently, hearing shots in the direction of the hut where we had left Ernest and his mother, I sent Jack to their assistance, desiring him to fetch the cart, that the booty might be conveyed to our encampment, employing the time of his absence in opening and cleaning the animals, thus reducing their weight. Ernest came back with Jack and the cart, and told us that the procession of peccaries had passed near the hut, and that he, with Juno's help, had secured three of them. I was glad to hear of this, as I had determined to cure a good supply of hams, and we made haste to load the cart. The boys adorned it with flowers and green boughs, and with songs of triumph which made the woods ring, they conveyed the valuable supply of game to the hut, where their mother anxiously waited for us. After dinner we set to work upon our pigs, singeing and scalding off the bristles. I cut out the hams, divided the flitches, bestowed considerable portions of the carcass on the dogs, and diligently cleansed and salted the meat, while the boys prepared a shed where it was to be hung to be cured in the smoke of fires of green wood. This unexpected business, of course, detained us in the place for some time. On the second day, when the smoking shed was ready, the boys were anxious to cook the smallest porker in the Otahitian fashion. For this purpose they dug a hole, in which they burned a quantity of dry grass, sticks and weeds, heating stones which were placed round the sides of the pit. While the younger boys made ready the oven, Fritz singed and washed his peccary, stuffing it with potatoes, onions and herbs, and a good sprinkling of salt and pepper. He then sewed up the opening, and enveloped the pig in large leaves, to guard it from the ashes and dust of its cooking-place. The fire no longer blazed, but the embers and stones were glowing hot. The pig was carefully placed in the hole, covered over with hot ashes, and the hole with earth, so that it looked like a big mole-heap. Dinner was looked forward to with curiosity, as well as appetite. My wife, as usual, distrusting our experiments, was not sanguine of success, and made ready some plain food, as a pis aller. She was well pleased with the curing hut, which was roomy enough to hang all our hams and bacon. On a wide hearth in the middle we kindled a large fire, which was kept constantly smouldering by heaping it with damp grass and green wood. The hut being closed in above, the smoke filled it, and penetrated the meat thoroughly. This process it had to undergo for several days. In a few hours Fritz gave notice that he was going to open his oven. Great excitement prevailed as he removed the earth, turf, and stones, and a delicious appetizing odor arose from the opening. It was the smell of roast pork, certainly, but with a flavor of spices which surprised me, until I thought of the leaves in which the food had been wrapped up. The peccary was carefully raised, and when a few cinders were picked off it looked a remarkably well-cooked dish. Fritz was highly complimented on his success, even by his mother. The scented leaves were, I thought, those of a tree which I knew to be found in Madagascar, 
called by the natives Ravensara, or good leaf. It is said to combine the scent of the nutmeg, clove, and cinnamon. The fruit is a species of nut, possessing the scent of the leaves in a more delicate degree, and from it an oil or essence is distilled, which is highly valued in native cookery. During the process of curing our large supply of hams and bacon, which occupied several days, we roamed about the neighborhood in all directions, finding no trace of the serpent, but making many valuable acquisitions, among which were some gigantic bamboos, from fifty to sixty feet in length, and of proportionate thickness. These, when cut across near the joints, formed capital casks, tubs, and pots, while the long sharp thorns, which begirt the stem at intervals, were as strong and useful as iron nails. One day we made an excursion to the farm at Prospect Hill, and were grievously provoked to find that the vagabond apes had been there, and wrought terrible mischief, as before at Woodlands. The animals and poultry were scattered, and everything in the cottage so torn and dirtied that it was vain to think of setting things right that day. We therefore very unwillingly left the disorder as we found it, purposing to devote time to the work afterward. When all was in readiness for the prosecution of our journey, we closed and barricaded the hut in which, for the present, we left the store of bacon, and, arranging our march in the usual patriarchal style, we took our way to the gap, the thorough defense of which defile was the main object we had in view. Our last halting place being much enclosed by shrubs, bamboos, and brushwood, we had during our stay opened a path through the cane thicket, in the direction we were about to travel. This we now found of the greatest assistance, and the loaded cart passed on without impediment. The ground was open, and tolerably level beyond, so that in a few hours we arrived at the extreme limit of our coast territory. We halted on the outskirts of a little wood, behind which, to the right, rose the precipitous and frowning cliffs of the mountain gorge, while to the left flowed the torrent, leaving between it and the rocks the narrow pass we called the Gap, and passing outward to mingle its water with the sea. The wood afforded us pleasant shelter, and standing high and within gunshot of the mouth of the rocky pass, I resolved to make it our camping place. We therefore unpacked the cart, and made our usual arrangements for safety and comfort, not forgetting to examine the wood itself, so as to ascertain whether it harbored any dangerous animals. Nothing worse than wild cats was discovered. We disturbed several of these creatures in their pursuit of birds and small game, but they fled at our approach. By the time dinner was ready we felt much fatigued, and some hours of unusually sultry and oppressive heat compelled us to rest until toward evening, when returning coolness revived our strength. We pitched the tent, and then occupied ourselves with preparations for the next day, when it was my intention to penetrate the country beyond the defile, and make a longer excursion across the savannah than had yet been undertaken. All was ready for a start at an early hour. My brave wife consented to remain in camp with Franz as her companion, while the three elder boys, and all the dogs, except Juno, went with me. We expected to find it somewhat difficult to make our way through the narrowest part of the pass, which had been so strongly barricaded and planted with thorny shrubs, but found on the contrary that the fences and walls were broken down and disarranged. It was thus very evident that the great snake, as well as the herd of peccaries, had made an entrance here. This barricade was the first check that had been placed by hand of man upon the wild free will of nature in this lonely place. With one consent, storms, floods, torrents, and the wild beasts of the forest had set themselves to destroy it. We resolved to make the defences doubly strong, being convinced that the position was capable of being barricaded and fortified, so as to resist the invaders we dreaded. The prospect which opened before us on emerging from the rocky pass was wide and varied. Swelling hills and verdant wooded vales were seen on one hand, while a great plain stretched before us, extending from the banks of the river toward a chain of lofty mountains, whose summits were rendered indistinct in the haze of the distance. We crossed the stream, which we named East River, filling our flasks with water, and it was well we did so, 
for in continuing our journey we found the soil become more arid and parched than we had expected. In fact, we soon appeared surrounded by a desert. The boys were astonished at the altered appearance of the country, part of which had been explored when we met with the buffaloes. I reminded them of the difference of the season, that the expedition had been made directly after the rains, when vegetation had clothed with transient beauty this region, which, possessing no source of moisture itself, had become scathed and bare during the blazing heat of summer. Our march proceeded slowly, and many were the uncomplimentary remarks made on the new country. It was Arabia Petraea, groaned one. Desert of Sahara, sighed another. Fit abode for demons, muttered a third. Subterranean volcanic fires are raging beneath our feet. Patience, my dear fellows, cried I, you are too easily discouraged. Look beyond the toilsome way to those grand mountains, whose spurs are already stretching forward to meet us. Who knows what pleasant surprises await us amid their steep declivities? I, for my part, expect to find water, fresh grass, trees, and a lovely resting place. We were all glad to repose beneath the shade of the first overhanging rock we came to, although by pressing further upward we might have attained to a pleasanter spot. Looking back toward the gap, we marked the strange contrast of the smiling country bordering the river, and the dreary, monotonous plain we had traversed. After gazing on the distant scene, we produced our store of provisions, and were busily engaged when Knips, our constant companion, suddenly began to sniff and smell about in a very ridiculous way. Finally, with a shriek which we knew was expressive of pleasure, he set off at a full speed, followed by all the dogs, up a sort of glen behind us. We left them to their own devices, being far too pleasantly engaged with our refreshments, to care much what fancy the little rogue had got in his head. When hunger was somewhat appeased, Fritz once more cast his eyes over the expanse of plain before us, and after looking fixedly for a moment, exclaimed, "'Is it possible that I see a party of horsemen riding at full gallop toward us? Can they be wild Arabs of the desert?' "'Arabs, my boy, certainly not. But take the spyglass and make them out exactly. We shall have to be on our guard, whatever they are.' "'I cannot see distinctly enough to be sure,' said he presently. "'And imagination supplies the deficiency of sight in most strange fashion. "'I could fancy them wild cattle, loaded carts, wandering haycocks, "'in fact, most anything I like.' "'The spyglass passed from hand to hand. "'Jack and Ernest agreed in thinking the moving objects were men on horseback, "'but when it came to my turn to look, "'I at once pronounced them to be very large ostriches.' "'This is fortunate indeed!' I exclaimed. "'We must try to secure one of these magnificent birds. "'The feathers alone are worth having.' "'A live ostrich, father? That would be splendid. "'Why, we might ride upon him.' "'As the ostriches approached, "'we began to consider in what way we should attempt a capture. "'I sent Fritz and Jack to recall the dogs, "'and placed myself with Ernest behind some shrubs, which would conceal us from the birds as they came onward. The boys did not rejoin us for some little time. They found Knips and the dogs at a pool of water, formed by a small mountain stream, which the monkey's instinct had detected. His sudden departure was thus accounted for, and they availed themselves right gladly of his discovery, filling their flasks and hastily bathing before their return. The ostriches continued to come in our direction, varying their pace as though in sport, springing, trotting, galloping, and chasing each other round and round, so that their approach was by no means rapid. I could now perceive that of the five birds, only one was a male, the white plumes of the wings and tail contrasting finely with the deep glossy black of the neck and body. The color of the females being ashen brown, the effect of their white plumes was not so handsome. "'I do not believe we shall have a chance with these birds,' said I, "'except by sending Fritz's eagle in pursuit, "'and for that we must bide our time "'and let them come as near as possible. "'In what way, then, are ostriches caught "'by the natives of the African deserts?' inquired Fritz. 
sometimes by chase on horseback, but their speed is so very great that even that must be conducted by stratagem. When these birds are pursued, they will run for hours in a wide circle. The hunter gallops after them, but describes a much smaller circle, and can therefore maintain the pace for a longer time, waiting to make the attack until the bird is fatigued. Among the bushmen, the hunter sometimes envelops himself in the skin of an ostrich, his legs doing duty for those of the bird, and his arm managing the head and neck, so as to imitate the movements of the bird when feeding. The enterprising hunter is thus enabled to get among a flock of ostriches, and to shoot them with arrows, one after another. When aware of an enemy, they defend themselves desperately, using their powerful legs as weapons, always kicking forward and inflicting dreadful injuries on dogs, and even on men, if attacked without due precaution. But let us take up our positions and keep perfectly still, for the ostriches are at hand. We held the dogs concealed as much as possible. The stately birds, suddenly perceiving us, paused, hesitated, and appeared uneasy. Yet as no movement was made, they drew a few steps nearer, with outstretched necks, examining curiously the unwanted spectacle before them. The dogs became impatient, struggled from our grasp, and furiously rushed toward our astonished visitors. In an instant they turned and fled with the speed of the wind. Their feet seemed not to touch the ground, their wings aiding the marvelously rapid progress. In a few moments they would have been beyond our reach, but as they turned to fly the eagle was unhooded. Singling out the male bird, the falcon made his fatal swoop, and, piercing the skull, the magnificent creature was laid low. Before we could reach the spot, the dogs had joined the bird of prey, and were fiercely tearing the flesh, and bedabbling the splendid plumes with gore. The sight grieved us. "'What a pity we could not capture this glorious bird alive!' exclaimed Fritz, as we took its beautiful feathers. It must, I am sure, have stood more than six feet high, and two of us might have mounted him at once. In the vast sandy deserts where nothing grows, what can flocks of these birds find to live upon? inquired Ernest. That would indeed be hard to say, if the deserts were utterly barren and unfruitful, returned I. But over these sandy wastes a beneficent providence scatters plants of wild melons, which absorb and retain every drop of moisture, and which quench the thirst as well as satisfy the hunger of the ostriches and other inhabitants of the wilds. These melons, however, do not constitute his entire diet. He feeds freely on grasses, dates, and hard grain, when he can obtain them. Does the ostrich utter any cry? The voice of the ostrich is a deep, hollow, rumbling sound, so much resembling the roar of a lion as to be occasionally mistaken for it. But what does Jack mean by waving his cap and beckoning in that excited fashion? What has the boy found, I wonder? He ran a little toward us, shouting, "'Eggs, father! Ostrich's eggs! A huge nestful! Do come quick!' We all hastened to the spot, and in a slight hollow of the ground beheld more than twenty eggs, as large as an infant's head. The idea of carrying more than two away with us was preposterous, although the boys, forgetting what the weight would be, seriously contemplated clearing the nest. They were satisfied when a kind of landmark had been set up, so that if we returned we might easily find the nest. As each egg weighed about three pounds, the boys soon found the burden considerable, even when tied into a handkerchief and carried like a basket. To relieve them, I cut a strong elastic heath-stick, and, suspending an egg in its sling at each end, laid the bent stick over Jack's shoulder, and, like a Dutch dairy-maid with her milk-pails, he stepped merrily along without inconvenience. We presently reached a marshy place, surrounding a little pool, evidently fed by the stream which Knips had discovered. The soft ground was trodden and marked by the footsteps of many different sorts of animals. We saw tracks of buffaloes, antelopes, onagas or quaggas, but no trace whatever of any kind of serpent. Hitherto our journey in search of monster reptiles had been signalized by very satisfactory failure. By this brook we sat down to rest and take some food. 
Fangs presently disappeared, and Jack, calling to his pet, discovered him gnawing at something which he had dug from the marsh. Taking it for a root of some sort, Jack brought it for my inspection. I dipped it in water to clear off the mud, and, to my surprise, found a queer little living creature, no bigger than half an apple, in my hand. It was a small tortoise. "'A tortoise, I declare!' cried Fritz. "'What a long way from the sea! How came it here, I wonder?' "'Perhaps there has been a tortoise shower,' remarked Ernest. "'One reads of frog showers in the time of the ancient Romans.' "'Hello, Professor, you're out for once,' said I. "'This is nothing but a mud tortoise, which lives in wet, marshy ground and fresh water. "'They are useful in gardens, for although they like a few lettuce leaves now and then, "'they will destroy numbers of snails, grubs, and worms.' "'Resuming our journey, we arrived at a charming valley, verdant, fruitful, and shaded by clumps of graceful trees. It afforded us the greatest delight and refreshment to pass along this cool and lovely vale, which we agreed to call Glen Verdant. In the distance we could see herds of antelopes or buffaloes feeding, but as our dogs continually ranged a long way ahead of us they were quickly startled, and vanished up one or other of the narrow gorges which opened out of the valley. Following the imperceptible windings of the vale, we were surprised, on quitting it for the more open ground, to find ourselves in a country we were already acquainted with, and not far from the Jackal Cave, as we called the place where Fangs had been captured in cubhood. On recognizing the spot, Ernest, who was in advance with one of the dogs, hastened toward it. We lost sight of him for a few minutes, and then arose a cry of terror, violent barking, and deep surly growls. As we rushed forward, Ernest met us, looking white as ashes, and calling out, "'A bear! A bear, father! He is coming after me!' The boy clung to me in mortal fear. I felt his whole frame quivering. "'Courage, my son!' cried I, disengaging myself from his grasp. "'We must prepare for instant defence." The dogs dashed forward to join the fray, whatever it was, and not long were we in doubt. To my no small consternation, an enormous bear made his appearance, quickly followed by another. With leveled guns, my brave Fritz and I advanced slowly to meet them. Jack was also ready to fire, but the shock had so unnerved Ernest that he fairly took to his heels. We fired together, one at each bear, but though hit, the monsters were unfortunately only wounded. We found it most difficult to take aim, as the dogs beset them on all sides. However, they were much disabled, one having the lower jaw broken, and the other, with a bullet in his shoulder, was effectually lamed. The dogs, perceiving their advantage, pressed more closely round their foes, who yet defended themselves furiously with frightful yells of pain and rage. Such was the confusion and perpetual movement of the struggle that I dared not fire again, seeing that even slightly wounding one of our gallant hounds would instantly place him in the power of the raging bears. Watching our opportunity, we suddenly advanced with loaded pistols to within a very few paces of the animals, and firing, both fell dead, one shot through the head, the other, in the act of rearing to spring on Fritz, received his charge in its heart. "'Thank heaven!' cried I, as with dull groans the brute sank to the ground. "'We have escaped the greatest peril we have yet encountered.' The dogs continued to tear and worry the fallen foe, as though unwilling to trust the appearance of death. With feelings somewhat akin I drew my hunting-knife, and made assurance doubly sure. Seeing all safe, Jack raised a shout of victory, that poor Ernest might gain courage to approach the scene of conflict, which at last he did, and joined us in examining the dangerous animals as they lay motionless before us. Every point was full of interest, their wounds, their sharp teeth, their mighty claws, the extraordinary strength of neck and shoulder, all were remarked and commented on, and observing that the shaded brown hair was tipped with glossy white, I thought that these might be the silver bears mentioned in Captain Clark's journey to the northwest coasts of America. "'Well, my lads,' said I, "'if we have failed to catch sight of serpents,' We have at least made good riddance of some other bad rubbish. These fellows would one day have worked us woe, or I am much mistaken, 
"'What's to be done next?' "'Why, skin them, to be sure,' said Fritz. "'We shall have a couple of splendid bearskin rugs.' As this process would take time and evening drew on, we dragged the huge carcasses into their den, to await our return, concealing them with boughs of trees and fencing the entrance as well as we could. The ostrich eggs we also left behind us, hidden in a sandy hole. By sunset we reached the tent, and joyfully rejoined the mother and Franz, right glad to find a hearty meal prepared for us, as well as a large heap of brushwood for the watch-fire. When a full account of our adventures had been given, with a minute and special description of the bear fight, the mother related what she had done during our absence. She and Franz had made their way through the wood up to the rocks behind it, and discovered a bed of pure white clay, which it seemed to her might be used for making porcelain. Then she had contrived a drinking trough for the cattle out of a split bamboo. She had arranged a hearth in a sheltered place by building up large stones, cemented with the white clay, and finally she had cut a quantity of canes and brought them on the cart, to be in readiness for the building we had in hand. I praised the thoughtful diligence which had effected so much that was of real and definite use. In order to try the clay I put some balls of it in the fire now kindled, to burn during the night, and we then betook ourselves to rest under shelter of our tent. I awoke at dawn and aroused my little party. My first idea was to examine the clay balls, which I found baked hard and finely glazed, but too much melted down by the heat, a fault which, seeing the excellent quality of the clay, I knew it would be well worth while to remedy. After breakfast and our accustomed devotions, we harnessed the cart and took the way to the bear's den. Fritz headed the party, and, coming in sight of the entrance to the cave, called out softly, "'Make haste, and you will see a whole crowd of wild turkeys, "'who seem to have come to attend the funeral obsequies "'of their respected friend and neighbour, Bruin, here. "'But there appears to be a jealous watcher "'who is unwilling to admit the visitors to the bed of state.' "'The watcher, as Fritz called him, "'was an immensely large bird, "'with a sort of calm on his head, "'and a loose, fleshy skin hanging from beneath the beak.' Part of the neck was bare, wrinkled, and purplish-red, while around it, resting on the shoulders, was a downy collar of soft white feathers. The plumage was grayish-brown, marked here and there with white patches. The feet appeared to be armed with strong claws. This great bird guarded the entrance to the cave, occasionally retiring into it himself for a few minutes, but as soon as the other birds came pressing in after him, he hurried out again, and they were forced to retire. We stopped to observe this curious scene, and were startled suddenly by a mighty rush of wings in the air above us. We looked up. At the same moment Fritz fired, and an enormous bird fell heavily head foremost on the rocks, by which its neck was broken, while blood flowed from a wound in the breast. We had been holding back the dogs, but they, with Fritz, now rushed toward the cave, the birds rising around them and departing with heavy, ungainly flight, leaving only Fritz's prize, and one of the other birds killed by the large one in its fall. With the utmost caution I entered the cave, and rejoiced to find that the tongue and eyes only of the bears had been devoured. A little later and we should have had the handsome skins pecked and torn to rags, and all chance of stakes and bears' paws gone. On measuring the wings of the large bird from tip to tip, I found the length exceeded eleven feet, and concluded it to be a condor. It was evidently the mate of the Watcher, as Fritz called the first we saw. To work we now went on the bears, and no slight affair we found it to skin and cut them up, but by dint of perseverance we at last succeeded in our object. Determining to smoke the meat on the spot, we cut magnificent hams, and took off the rest of the meat in slices, after the manner of the buccaneers in the West Indies, preserving the paws entire to be cooked as a delicacy, and obtaining from the two bears together a prodigious supply of lard, which my wife gladly undertook to melt and prepare for keeping. The bones and offal we drew to some distance with the help of our cattle, and made the birds of the air most welcome to feast upon it. This, with the assistance of all sorts of insects, they did so effectually 
that before we left the place the skulls were picked perfectly clean, the sun had dried them, and they were ready for us to carry off to our museum. The skins had to be very carefully scraped, washed, salted, cleansed with ashes, and dried, which occupied fully two days. I was lamenting our distance from the Rascusara tree, the leaves of which had flavored our roast peccary so nicely, when I observed among the brushwood which the boys had brought from the thickets around us a climbing plant, whose leaves had a very strong smell. The stem resembled a vine, and the fruit grew in clusters like currants. Some were red, and some of a green color, which I supposed to denote various degrees of ripeness. They were hard, and the outer skin was quite thin. I recognized in this the pepper plant, a discovery particularly agreeable at this moment. The boys soon gathered a large supply. The red berries were soaked in salt and water for several days, then washed and rubbed, and finally, becoming perfectly white, were dried in the sun. The treatment of the green berries was simple. They were merely exposed to the sun's heat for a day or two, and then stored. In this way we obtained enough both of black and white pepper to last us a very long time. I took also a number of young plants, that we might have pepper growing at Rockburg and our various settlements. Some roots of another plant were also taken, which, from the pods, appeared to be a kind of bean. We were glad of this occupation during the tedious business of smoking the bear's meat, and availed ourselves of the leisure time by also preparing for stuffing the condor and the turkey buzzard, ubaru or black vulture, for I could not determine to which species the smaller bird belonged. The four boys at length became so weary of inaction that I determined to let them make an excursion alone on the savannah. Three of them received this permission with eager delight, but Ernest said he would prefer to remain with us, to which, as the expedition was to be entirely one of pleasure, I could make no objection. Little Franz, on the other hand, whom I would willingly have kept with us, was wild to go with his brothers, and I was obliged to consent, as I had made the proposal open to all, and could not draw back. In the highest spirits they ran to bring their steeds, as we were fain to call the cattle they rode, from their pasturage at a short distance. Speedily were they saddled, bridled, and mounted. The three lads were ready to be off. It was my wish that our sons should cultivate a habit of bold independence, for well I knew that it might be the will of God to deprive them easily of their parents, when, without an enterprising spirit of self-reliance, their position would be truly miserable. My gallant Fritz possessed this desirable quality in no small degree, and to him I committed the care of his young brothers, charging them to look up to and obey him as their leader. They were well armed, well mounted, had a couple of good dogs, and, with a hearty, God speed and bless you, my boys, I let them depart. We, who remained behind, passed the day in a variety of useful occupations. The bear's meat, which was being cured in a smoking shed, such as that we set up for the peccary hams, required a good deal of attention from my wife. Ernest had a fancy for making ornamental cups from the ostrich eggs, while I investigated the interior of the cave. I found the inner wall to consist of a kind of talc, mingled with threads of asbestos, and also indications of mica. Examining further, I detached a large block, and found to my joy that I could split it into clear transparent sheets, which would serve admirably for window panes. My wife saw this substitute for glass with unfeigned satisfaction, declaring that, although she would not complain, yet the want of glass for windows had been a downright trouble to her. As evening approached, the bear's paws, which were stewing for supper, sent forth savory odors, and we sat talking round the fire, while listening anxiously for sounds heralding the return of our young explorers. At last the tramp and beat of hoofs struck our ears. The little troop appeared, crossing the open ground before us at a sharp trot, and a shrill ringing cheer greeted us as we rose and went to meet them. They sprang from their saddles, the animals were set at liberty to refresh themselves, and the riders eagerly came to exhibit their acquisitions and give an account of themselves. Funny figures they cut! 
Franz and Jack had each a young kid slung on his back, so that the four legs, tied together, stuck out under their chins. Fritz's game bag looked remarkably queer. Round lumps, sharp points, and an occasional movement seemed to indicate a living creature or creatures within. Hurrah for the chase, father! cried Jack. Nothing like real hunting after all. And just see how storm and grumble go along over a grassy plain. It is perfectly splendid. We soon tired out the little antelopes and were able to catch them. Yes, father, said Franz. And Fritz has two Angora rabbits in his bag, and we wanted to bring you some honey. Only think, such a clever bird, a cuckoo, showed us where it was. My brothers forget the chief thing, said Fritz. We have driven a little herd of antelopes right through the gap into our territory, and there they are, all ready for us to hunt when we like, or to catch and tame. Well done, cried I. Here is indeed a list of achievements. But to your mother and me, the chief thing of all, Is God's goodness in bringing you safe back to us? Now let us hear the whole story, that we may have a definite idea of your performances. We had a splendid ride, said Fritz, down Glen Verdant and away to the defile through our rocky barrier, and the morning was so cool and fresh that our steeds galloped along nearly the whole way at the top of their speed. When we had passed through the gap, we moderated our furious pace and kept our eyes open on the lookout for game. We then trotted slowly to the top of a grassy hill, from whose summit we saw two herds of animals, whether antelopes, goats, or gazelles we did not know, grazing by the side of the stream below us. We were about to gallop down and try to get a shot at them, when it struck me that it would be wiser to try and drive the whole herd through the gap into our own domain, where they would be shut up, as it were, in a park, free and yet within reach. Down the hill we rode as hard as we could go, formed in a semicircle behind the larger herd, magnificent antelopes, and, aided by the dogs with shouts and cries, drove them along the stream toward the gap. As we came near the opening, they appeared inclined to halt and turn, like sheep about to be driven into the butcher's yard, and it was all we could do to prevent them from bolting past us. But at length one made a rush at the opening, and the rest following, They were soon all on the other side of the frontier, and inhabitants of New Switzerland. Capital, I said, capital, my boy, but I don't see what is to make them remain inhabitants of our domain, or to prevent them from returning through the gap whenever they feel inclined. Stop, father, he replied, you interrupt me too soon. We thought of that possibility too, and provided against it. We stretched a long line right across the defile, and strung on it feathers and rags and all sorts of other things, which danced and fluttered in the wind, and looked so strange that I am perfectly certain that the herd will never attempt to pass it. In fact, Le Vaillant, from whom I learned the trick, says, in his Voyage au Cap de Bonne Espérance, that the Hottentots make use of the method for penning in the antelopes they have caught in the chase. Well done, said I. I am glad to see that you remember what you have read. The antelopes are welcome to New Switzerland, but, my boy, I added, I cannot say the same for the rabbits you have there. They increase so rapidly that if you establish a colony of the little wretches, your next difficulty will be to get rid of them. True, he replied, but my idea was to place them upon Whale Island, where they would find abundant food, and at the same time in no way trouble us. May I not establish a warren there? It would be so useful. Do you know, my eagle caught these pretty little fellows for me? I saw a number of them running about, and so unhooded him, and in a few minutes he brought me three, one dead, with whose body I rewarded him, and these two here unhurt. Now, father, said Jack, interrupting him, do listen to me and hear my story, or else Fritz will begin upon my adventures, and tire you out with his rigmarole descriptions. Certainly, Jack, I said, I am quite ready to listen to you. First and foremostly, how did you bring down those beautiful little animals you have there? Oh, we galloped them down. The dogs sniffed about in the grass while Fritz was away after the rabbits. Out popped those little fawns, and away they went, bounding and skipping at the rate of thirty miles an hour, with Storm, Grumble, and the dogs at their heels. In about a quarter of an hour, we had left the dogs behind and were close upon our prey. Down went the little creatures in the grass. and, overcome with terror and fatigue, were at our mercy. 
"'So we shouted to Fritz, and—' "'My dear boy,' said I, "'according to your statement, "'Fritz must have been seven miles and a half off.' "'Oh, well, father, perhaps we did not ride for quite a quarter of an hour, "'and, of course, I can't say exactly how fast we were going. "'And then, you see, the fawns did not run in a straight line. "'At any rate, Fritz heard us, and he and Franz and I "'leashed the legs of the pretty creatures, "'and then we mounted again, and presently saw a wretch of a cuckoo, "'who led us ever so far out of our course by cuckooing "'and making faces at us, and then hopping away. "'Franz declared it must be an enchanted princess.' "'and so I thought I would rid it of its spell, "'but Fritz stopped me shooting it "'and said it was a honey indicator, "'and that it was leading us probably to a bee's bike, "'so we spared its life, "'and presently, sure enough, "'it stopped close by a bee's nest in a hollow tree. "'This was capital, we thought, "'and as we were in a great hurry to taste the honey, "'I threw in a lot of lighted lucifer matches, "'but somehow it did not kill the bees at all, "'but only made them awfully angry, "'and they flew out in a body and stung me all over.' I rushed to Storm and sprang on his back, but, though I galloped away for bare life, it was an age before I got rid of the little wretches, and now my face is in a perfect fever. I think I will get Mother to bathe it for me. And off rushed the noisy boy, leaving Fritz and me to see to the fawns and examine the rabbits. With these latter I determined to do as Fritz proposed, namely to colonize Whale Island with them. I was all the more willing to do this because I had been considering the advisability of establishing on that island a fortress to which we might retreat in any extreme danger, and where we should be very thankful, in case of such a retreat, to possess means of obtaining a constant supply of animal food. Having ministered to the wants of the antelopes, I tried to interest the boys in my discovery of the block of talc, but just then their mother summoned us to dinner. The principal dish in this meal consisted of the bear's paws, most savory-smelling delicacies, so tempting that their close resemblance to human hands, and even the roguish fee-fo-fum from Jack, did not prevent a single member of the family from enjoying them most heartily. Supper over, we lit our watch-fire, returned to our tent, and slept soundly. We had been working very diligently. The bear's meat was smoked— the fat melted down and stored, and a large supply of bamboos collected. But I wished to make yet another excursion, and at early dawn I aroused the boys. Fritz mounted the mule, I rode Lightfoot, Jack and Franz took their usual steeds, and with the two dogs we galloped off, first to visit the Euphorbia to collect the gum, and then to discover whether the ostrich had deserted her eggs in the sand. Ernest watched us depart without the slightest look or sigh of regret, and returned to the tent to assist his mother and study his books. Our steeds carried us down the green valley at a rapid rate, and we followed the direction we had pursued on our former expedition. We soon reached Turtle Marsh, and then, filling our water flasks, we arrived at the rising ground where Fritz discovered the mounted Arabs. As Jack and Franz wanted a gallop, I allowed them to press forward, while Fritz and I visited the euphorbia trees. A quantity of the red gum had exuded from the incisions I had made, and as this had coagulated in the sun, I rolled it into little balls, and stored it in a bamboo jar I had brought with me for the purpose. As we rode after the boys, who were some way ahead, Fritz remarked, "'Did you not tell me that the juice of that tree was poisonous, father? Why have you collected such a quantity?' "'I did indeed say so,' I replied. "'It is a most deadly poison. "'The inhabitants of the Cape of Good Hope "'use it to poison the springs "'where wild animals assemble to quench their thirst, "'and they thus slaughter an immense number of the creatures "'for the sake of their hides. "'I intend, however, to use it to destroy the apes, "'should they again commit depredations, "'and also in preparing the skins of animals "'to protect them from the attacks of insects.' The two boys were still at some distance from us, when suddenly four magnificent ostriches rose from the sand where they had been sitting. Jack and Franz perceived them, and, with a great shout, drove them toward us. In front ran a splendid male bird, his feathers of shining black, and his great tail plume waving behind. Three females of an ashen-gray color followed him. They approached us with incredible swiftness, and were within gunshot before they perceived us. 
Fritz had had the forethought to bind up the beak of his beagle so that, should he bring down an ostrich, he might be unable to injure it. He now threw up the falcon which, powering upward, swooped down upon the head of the foremost bird and, so confused and alarmed him, that he could not defend himself nor continue his flight. So greatly was his speed checked that Jack overtook him, and hurling his lasso, enfolded his wings and legs in its deadly coils, and brought him to the ground. The other ostriches were almost out of sight, so leaving them to their own devices, we leaped from our steeds and attempted to approach the captured bird. He struggled fearfully, and kicked with such violence right and left, that I almost despaired of getting him home alive. It occurred to me, however, that if we could cover his eyes, his fury might be subdued. I instantly acted upon this idea, and hung over his head my coat and hunting bag, which effectually shut out the light. No sooner had I done this than his struggles ceased, and we were able to approach. We first secured round his body a broad strip of sealskin, on each side of which I fastened a stout piece of cord, that I might be able to lead him easily. Then, fastening another cord in a loop round his legs, that he might be prevented from breaking into a gallop, we released him from the coils of the lasso. "'Do you know,' said I to the boys, "'how the natives of India secure a newly captured elephant?' "'Oh, yes,' said Fritz. "'They fasten him between two tame elephants. "'We'll do that to this fine fellow, and tame him double-quick.' "'The only difficulty will be,' remarked Jack, "'that we have no tame ostriches. "'However, I dare say Storm and Grumble will have no objection to perform their part, "'and it will puzzle even this great monster to run away with them.' "'So we at once began operations. "'Storm and Grumble were led up on either side of the recumbent ostrich,' and the cords secured to their girths. Jack and Franz, each armed with a stout whip, mounted their respective steeds, the wrappers were removed from the bird's eyes, and we stood by to watch what would next occur. For some moments after the return of his sight he lay perfectly still, then he arose with a bound, and, not aware of the cords which hampered him, attempted to dash forward. The thongs were stout, and he was brought to his knees. A fruitless struggle ensued, and then at length, seeming to accommodate himself to circumstances, he set off at a sharp trot, his guards making the air re-echo with their merry shouts. These cries stimulated the ostrich to yet further exertions, but he was at length brought to a stand by the determined refusal of his four-footed companions to continue such a race across loose sand. The boys having enjoyed the long run, I told them to walk with the prisoner slowly home, while Fritz and I returned to examine the ostrich's nest. The eggs were quite warm, and I was certain that the mother had quite recently left the nest. Leaving about half, I packed the rest of the eggs in a large bag I had brought for the purpose, and slung it carefully on the saddle before. We soon caught up our advance guard, and without other notable incident reached our tent. Astonishment and dismay were depicted on the face of the mother as we approached. "'My dear husband!' she exclaimed. "'Do you think our provisions so abundant "'that you must scour the deserts "'to find some great beast to assist us to devour them? "'You must discover an iron mine next, "'for iron is what ostriches chiefly live on, is it not? "'Oh, I do wish you would be content "'with the menagerie you have already collected, "'instead of bringing in a specimen of every beast you come across, "'and this is such a useless monster!' "'Useless, mother!' exclaimed Jack. "'You would not say so had you seen him run. "'Why, he will be the fleetest courser in our stables. "'I am going to make a saddle and bridle for him, "'and in future he shall be my only steed. "'Then, as for his appetite, father declares it is most delicate. "'He only wants a little fruit and grass, "'and a few stones and ten-penny nails to help his digestion.' "'The way in which Jack assumed proprietorship of our new prize,' seemed to strike his brothers as rather cool, and there was instantly a cry raised on the subject. "'Very well,' said Jack. "'Let us each take possession of the part of the ostrich we captured. Your bird, Fritz, seized the head. Keep that. Father shall have the body, I'll have the legs, and Franz a couple of feathers from the tail.' "'Come, come,' said I. "'I think that Jack has a very good right to the ostrich, seeing that he brought it to the ground, and if he succeeds in taming it, 
and converting it into a saddle horse, it shall be his. From this time, therefore, he is responsible for its training. The day was now too far advanced to allow us to think of setting out for Rockburg, so we fastened up the ostrich between two trees, and devoted the remainder of the evening to making preparations for our departure. At early dawn our picturesque caravan was moving homeward. The ostrich continued so refractory that we were obliged to make him again march between storm and grumble, and as these gallant steeds were thus employed, the cow was harnessed to the cart, laden with our treasures. Room was left in the cart for the mother, Jack and Franz mounted Storm and Grumble, I rode Lightfoot, and Fritz brought up the rear on Swift. At the mouth of the gap we called a halt, and replaced the cord the boys had strung with ostrich feathers by a stout palisade of bamboos. I also took the opportunity of collecting a store of pipe clay, as I intended during the winter months, which were close at hand, to try my hand at china making. When we reached the sugar-cane grove, we again stopped to collect the peccary hams we had left to be smoked, and my wife begged me to gather some seeds of an aromatic plant which grew in the neighborhood, and which had the scent of vanilla. I obtained a good supply, and we moved forward toward Woodlands, where we intended to rest for the night, after our long and fatiguing march. Our tent was pitched, and on our beds of cotton we slept soundly. Next morning early we examined our farmyard, which appeared in a most prosperous and flourishing condition. The sight of all these domestic animals made us long even more than ever for our home at Rockburg, and we determined to hasten thither with all possible speed. The number of our pigs, goats, and poultry had greatly increased, since we had last visited our colony, and some of these, two fine breeds of chickens especially, my wife wished to take back with her. We found that the herd of antelopes, which Fritz and Jack had driven through the gap, had taken up their abode in the neighborhood, and several times we saw the beautiful animals browsing among the trees. While at the farm, we repaired both the animals' stalls and our dwelling-room, that the former might be more secure against the attacks of wild beasts, and the latter fitted for our accommodation when we should visit the spot. Everything at length being satisfactorily arranged, we again retired to rest, and early next morning completed our journey to Rockburg. By midday we were once more settled at home. Windows and doors were thrown open to admit fresh air, the animals established in their stalls, and the cart's miscellaneous cargo discharged and arranged. As much time as I could spare, I devoted to the ostrich, whom we fastened, for the present, between two bamboo posts in front of our dwelling. I then turned my attention to the eggs we had brought, and which I determined to hatch, if possible, by artificial heat. For this purpose I arranged a stove, which I maintained at a uniform temperature, and on it I placed the eggs, carefully wrapped in cotton wool. Next morning Fritz and I went off in the boat, first to Whale Island, there to establish our colonists, the Angora rabbits, and then to Shark Island, where we placed the dainty little antelopes. Having made them happy with their liberty and abundance of food, we returned as quickly as possible to cure the bearskins, and add the provisions we had brought to the stores lying in our cellar. As we returned we caught up Jack, making his way in great glee toward Rockburg. He was carrying, in a basket, an immense eel, which he and Ernest had secured. Ernest had set, on the previous night, a couple of lines— one had been dragged away, but on the other they found this splendid fellow. It proved delicious. Half was prepared for dinner, and the other half salted and stowed away. We now, for a short time, again turned our attention to our duties about the house. Thinking that the veranda would be greatly improved by some creepers, I sowed, round the foot of each bamboo pillar, vanilla and pepper seeds, as well as that of other creeping plants which would not only give the house a pleasanter aspect, but also afford us shade during the summer months. I constructed a couple of hen-coops, too, for the hens and their little chicks, which we had brought from woodlands, for I knew that if I left them unprotected, the inquisitive dispositions of knips and fangs might induce them to make anatomical experiments, which would be detrimental to the welfare of the youngsters." Ernest's rat-skins were voted a nuisance within doors, and were tied together and hung up outside, 
So powerful was the odor they emitted that even then Jack would pretend to faint every time he passed near them. The museum received its addition. The condor and vulture were placed there to be stuffed when we should find time during the rainy season. The mica and asbestos, too, we brought in for the present, not to lie there idle, but to wait until I could use them as I intended for china and lamp wicks. Having occupied two days in this way, we turned our attention to other duties the cultivation of a wheat, barley, and maize field, the management of the ostrich's eggs, and the taming of the captives. As agriculture was, though the least to our taste, the most important of these several duties, we set about it first. The animals drew the plow, but the digging and hoeing taxed our powers of endurance to the utmost. We worked two hours in the morning and two in the evening. Fully did we realize the words of Scripture, In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread. In the interval we devoted our attention to the ostrich. But our efforts on behalf of his education seemed all in vain. He appeared as untamable as ever. I determined, therefore, to adopt the plan which had subdued the refractory eagle. The effect of the tobacco fumes almost alarmed me. The ostrich sank to the ground and lay motionless. Slowly at length he arose and paced up and down between the bamboo posts. He was subdued, but to my dismay resolutely refused all food. I feared he would die. For three days he pined, growing weaker and weaker each day. Food he must have, said I to my wife. Food he must have. The mother determined to attempt an experiment. She prepared balls of maize flour mixed with butter. One of these she placed within the bird's beak. He swallowed it and stretched out his long neck, looking inquiringly for a second mouthful. A second, third, and fourth ball followed the first. His appetite returned, and his strength came again. All the wild nature of the bird had gone, and I saw with delight that we might begin his education as soon as we chose. Rice, guavas, maize, and corn he ate readily, washing it down, as Jack expressed it, with small pebbles, to the great surprise of Franz, to whom I explained that the ostrich was merely following the instinct common to all birds, that he required these pebbles to digest his food, just as smaller birds require gravel. After a month of careful training, our captive would trot, gallop, obey the sound of our voice, feed from our hand, and in fact showed himself perfectly docile. Now our ingenuity was taxed to the utmost. How were we to saddle and bridle a bird? First, for a bit for his beak. Vague ideas passed through my mind, but every one I was obliged to reject. A plan at length occurred to me. I recollected the effect of light and its absence upon the ostrich, how his movements were checked by sudden darkness, and how, with the light, power returned to his limbs. I immediately constructed a leathern hood to reach from the neck to the beak, cutting holes in it for the eyes and ears. Over the eye holes I contrived square flaps or blinkers, which were so arranged with whalebone springs that they closed tightly of themselves. The reins were connected with these blinkers, so that the flaps might be raised or allowed to close at the rider's pleasure. When both blinkers were open, the ostrich would gallop straight ahead, close his right eye, and he turned to the left, close his left, and he turned to the right, shut both, and he stood stock still. I was justly proud of my contrivance, but before I could really test its utility, I was obliged to make a saddle. After several failures I succeeded in manufacturing one to my liking, and in properly securing it. It was something like an old-fashioned trooper's saddle, peaked before and behind, for my great fear was lest the boys should fall. This curious-looking contrivance I placed upon the shoulders as near the neck as possible, and secured it with strong girths round the wings and across the breast, to avoid all possibility of the saddle slipping down the bird's sloping back. I soon saw that my plan would succeed, though skill and considerable practice was necessary in the use of my patent bridle. 
It was difficult to remember that to check the courser's speed it was necessary to slacken rein, and that the tighter the reins were drawn, the faster he would fly. We at length, however, all learned to manage Master Hurricane, and the distance between Rockburg and Falconhurst was traversed in an almost incredibly short space of time. The marvellous speed of the bird again revived the dispute as to the ownership, and I was obliged to interfere. "'Jack shall retain the ostrich,' said I, "'for it is most suited to him. He is a lighter weight than either of you his elder brothers, and Franz is not yet strong enough to manage such a fleet courser. But he is so far to be considered common property that all may practice on him occasionally, and in case of necessity any one may mount him. Our field work was by this time over. The land had been ploughed and sown with wheat, barley, and maize. On the other side of Jackal River we had planted potatoes and cassava roots, and all sorts of other seeds had been carefully sown. We had not neglected the ostrich's eggs, and one day Fritz introduced me with great glee to three little ostriches. But, alas, the little creatures were not destined to enjoy life long. One died almost as soon as it was hatched, and the others, after tottering about on their stilt-like legs for a few days, followed its example. I now found time to turn my attention to the bear's skins, which required preparation before they would be fit for use as leather. They had been salted and dried, and now required tanning. I had no tan, however. This was unfortunate, but not to be deterred from my purpose, I determined to use a mixture of honey and water in its place. The experiment proved successful. When the skins were dried they remained flexible and free from smell, while the fur was soft and glossy. This was not the only result of the experiment, for the honey water which I boiled appeared so clear and tempting that it struck me that I might prepare from it an excellent drink. I put by some of the liquid before making use of it as tan, and reboiled it with nutmeg and cinnamon. The preparation, which much resembled English mead, was pronounced delicious, and the mother begged me to brew a large supply. As our cellar was now well stocked with provisions for the winter, and our other preparations were completed, I was able to turn my attention to details of lesser importance. The boys had been clamoring for hats, and as my success in so many trades had surprised me, I agreed to turn hatter for the nonce. With the rat skins and a solution of India rubber, I produced a kind of felt, which I dyed a brilliant red with cochineal, and, stretching this on a wooden block I had prepared, I passed over it a hot iron to smooth the nap, and by next morning had the satisfaction of presenting to my wife a neat little red Swiss cap, to be lined and finished by her for one of the boys. And by next morning had the satisfaction of presenting to my wife a neat little red Swiss cap, to be lined and finished by her for one of the boys. The mother admired the production immensely, and, lining it with silk, added yet more to its gay appearance by adorning it with ribbons and ostrich feathers, and finally placed it upon the head of little Franz. So delighted was every one with the hat that all were eager to be similarly provided, and begged me to manufacture more. I readily agreed to do so as soon as they should furnish me with the necessary materials, and advised them to make half a dozen rat traps, that they might secure the water rats, with which the stream abounded, and whose rich glossy fur would serve admirably for felt. Every fifth animal that they brought me, I told them, should be mine, that I might obtain material for a hat for myself and their mother. The boys at once agreed to this arrangement, and began the manufacture of the traps, which were all so made that they should kill the rats at once, for I could not bear the idea of animals being tortured or imprisoned. While they were thus engaged, I applied myself to the manufacture of porcelain. I first cleaned the pipe clay and talc from all foreign substances, and made them ready to be beaten down with water into a soft mass, and then prepared my moulds of gypsum plaster. These preparations were at length made, and the moulds received a thin layer of the porcelain material. When this was partly baked, I sprinkled over it a powder of coloured glass beads which I had crushed, and which looked very pretty in patterns upon the transparent porcelain. 
Some of my china vessels cracked with the heat of the stove, some were very ill-shaped, but, after many failures, I succeeded in producing a set of white cups and saucers, a cream jug, a sugar basin, and half a dozen small plates. I must allow that my china was far from perfect, the shape of some of the vessels was faulty, and none were really transparent, nevertheless the general appearance gave great satisfaction, and when the plates were filled with rosy and golden fruit resting on green leaves, and fragrant tea filled the cups, it greatly added to the appearance of the table. Scarcely had I completed my pottery, when great black clouds and terrific storms heralded the approach of another winter. The rainy season having set in, we were compelled to give up our daily excursions. Even in the spacious house which we now occupied, and with our varied and interesting employments, we yet found the time dragging heavily. The spirits of all were depressed, and even occasional rapid rides, during a partial cessation of the rain, failed permanently to arouse them. Fritz, as well as I, had perceived this, and he said to me, "'Why, father, should we not make a canoe, something swifter and more manageable than those vessels we as yet possess? I often long for a light skiff, in which I might skim over the surface of the water.' The idea delighted all hands, but the mother, who was never happy when we were on the sea, declared that our chances of drowning were, with the pinnace and canoe, already sufficiently great, and that there was not the slightest necessity for our adding to these chances by constructing another craft which would tempt us out upon the perfidious element. My wife's fears were, however, speedily allayed, for I assured her that the boat I intended to construct should be no flimsy cockle-shell, but as safe and stout a craft as ever floated upon the sea. The Greenlander's kayak I intended to be my model, and I resolved not only to occupy the children, but also to produce a strong and serviceable canoe, a masterpiece of art. The boys were interested, and the boat-building was soon in operation. We constructed the skeleton of whalebone, using split bamboo canes to strengthen the sides, and also to form the deck, which extended the whole length of the boat, leaving merely a square hole in which the occupant of the canoe might sit. The work engrossed our attention most entirely, and by the time it was complete, the rain had passed away, and the glorious sun again shone brightly forth. Our front door was just wide enough to admit of the egress of our boat, and we completed her construction in the open air. We quickly cased the sides and deck with sealskin, making all the seams thoroughly watertight with caoutchouc. The kayak was indeed a curious-looking craft, yet so light that she might be lifted easily with one hand, and when at length we launched her she bounded upon the water like an India rubber ball. Fritz was unanimously voted her rightful owner, but before his mother would hear of his entering the frail-looking skiff, she declared that she must contrive a swimming dress, that— should his boat receive a puncture from a sharp rock or the dorsal of a fish and collapse, he might yet have a chance of saving his life. Though I did not consider the kayak quite the soap bubble the mother imagined it, I yet willingly agreed to assist her in the construction of the dress. The garment we produced was most curious in appearance, and I must own that I doubted its efficiency. It was like a double waistcoat, made of linen prepared with a solution of India rubber, the seams being likewise coated with caoutchouc, and the hole rendered perfectly air-tight. We arranged it so that one little hole was left, by means of which air could be forced into the space between the outer covering and the lining, and the dress inflated. Meanwhile I perceived with pleasure the rapid vegetation the climate was producing. The seeds we had scattered had germinated, and were now promising magnificent crops. The veranda, too, was looking pleasant with its gay and sweet-scented creepers, which were already aspiring to the summit of the pillars. The air was full of birds, the earth seemed teeming with life. The dress was at length completed, and Fritz one fine afternoon offered publicly to prove it. We all assembled on the beach, the boy gravely donned and inflated the garment, and, amid roars of laughter from his brothers, entered the water. Quickly and easily he paddled himself across our bay toward Shark Island, whither we followed in one of our boats. 
the experiment was most successful, and Ernest, Jack, and Franz, in spite of their laughter at their brother's garment, begged their mother to make for each of them a similar dress. While on the island we paid a visit to the colonists whom we had established there the previous autumn. All was well. We could perceive by the footprints that the antelopes had discovered and made use of the shelter we had erected for them, and feeling that we could do nothing more we scattered handfuls of maize and salt, and strolled across to the other side of the island. The shore was covered with lovely shells, many of which, with beautiful pieces of delicate coral, the boys collected for their museum. Strewn by the edge of the water, too, lay a great quantity of seaweed of various colors, and as the mother declared that much of it was of use, the boys assisted her to collect it and store it in the boat. As we pulled back to the land, I was surprised to see that my wife chose from among the seaweed a number of curious leaves with edges notched like a saw. When we reached home, she carefully washed these and dried them in the oven. There was evidently something mysterious about this preparation, and my curiosity at length prompted me to make an attempt to discover the secret. Are these leaves to form a substitute for tobacco? said I. Do you so long for its refreshing smell? My wife smiled, for her dislike to tobacco was well known, and she answered in the same jocular tone. Do you not think that a mattress stuffed with these leaves would be very cool in summer? The twinkle in her eyes showed me that my curiosity must still remain unsatisfied, but it nevertheless became greater than ever. The boys and I had one day made a long and fatiguing expedition, and, tired out, we flung ourselves down in the veranda. As we lay there resting, we heard the mother's voice. Could any of you enjoy a little jelly? She presently appeared, bearing a porcelain dish laden with most lovely transparent jelly. Cut with a spoon and laid before us, it quivered and glittered in the light. Ambrosia! exclaimed Fritz, tasting it. It was indeed delicious, and still marveling from whence the mother could have obtained a dish so rare, we disposed of all that she had set before us. Aha! laughed the mother. Is not this an excellent substitute for tobacco, far more refreshing than the nasty weed itself? Behold the product of my mysterious seaweed. My dear wife, exclaimed I, this dish is indeed a masterpiece of culinary art, but where had you met with it? What put it into your head? While staying with my Dutch friends at the Cape, replied she, I often saw it, and at once recognized the leaves on Shark Island. Once knowing the secret, the preparation of the dish is extremely simple. The leaves are soaked in water, fresh every day, for a week, and then boiled for a few hours with orange juice, citron, and sugar. We were all delighted with the delicacy, and thanked the mother for it most heartily, the boys declaring that they must at once go off again to the island to collect as many of the leaves as they could find. I agreed to accompany them, for I wished to examine the plantations we had made there. All were flourishing, the palms and mangroves had shot up in a most marvellous manner, and many of the seeds which I had cast at random among the cliffs in the rocks had germinated, and promised to clothe the nakedness of the frowning boulders. Away up among the rocks, too, we discovered a bright sparkling spring of delicious water, at which, from the footprints around, we saw that the antelopes must have refreshed themselves. Finding everything so satisfactory, we were naturally anxious to discover how our colony and plantations on Whale Island had fared. It was evident at a glance that the rabbits had increased. The young and tender shoots of the trees bore the marks of many greedy, mischievous little teeth. The coconut palms alone had they spared. Such depredations as these could not be allowed, and with the help of the boys, I erected round each stem a hedge of prickly thorn, and then prepared again to embark. Before we did so, however, I noticed that some of the seaweed had also been gnawed by the rabbits, and wondering what it could have been to tempt them, I collected some of it to examine more fully at home. The skeleton of the whale, too, attracted our attention, for, picked clean by the birds and bleached by the sun and rain, the bones had been purified to a most perfect whiteness. Thinking that the joints of the vertebrae might be made of use, I separated some ten or twelve, and rolled them down to the boat, and then returned to the shore, towing them after us. 
A scheme now occupied my mind for the construction of a crushing machine, which would prove of the greatest service to us. I knew that to make such a machine of stone was far beyond my power, but it had struck me that the vertebrae of the whale might serve my purpose. I determined next morning to look out a tree from which I might cut the blocks of wood that I should require to raise my crushers. My expedition was destined to be a solitary one, for when I went to the stables for a horse, I discovered that the boys had gone off by themselves with their guns and traps, and had left to me a choice between the bull and buffalo. With storm, therefore, I was fain to be content. I crossed the bridge, but as I reached the cassava field, I noticed, to my great annoyance, that it had been overrun and laid waste by some mischievous animals. I examined the footprints, and seeing that they greatly resembled those of pigs, determined to follow the trail and see who these invaders of our territory would prove to be. The track led me on for some way until I almost lost sight of it near our old potato field. For some time I hunted backward and forward without seeing a sign of the animals. At length a loud barking from Floss and Bruno, who were with me, announced that they had been discovered. The whole family of our old sow, and she herself, were standing at bay, showing their teeth and grunting so savagely that the dogs feared to approach them. I raised my gun and fired twice among the herd. Two of the pigs fell, and the rest fled, followed by the dogs. I picked up the pigs and, calling back the pursuers, continued my way through the forest. A tree suited to my purpose was soon found. I marked it and returned home. Ernest, who had remained at home, assisted me to flay the young porkers, and I handed them over to the mother to prepare for supper, by which time I hoped the other lads would have returned. Late in the evening we heard the sounds of trampling hoofs, and presently Jack appeared, thundering along upon his two-legged steed, followed in the distance by Fritz and Franz. These latter carried upon their cruppers game bags, the contents of which were speedily displayed. Four birds, a kangaroo, twenty muskrats, a monkey, two hares, and half a dozen beaver rats were laid before me. Besides these, Fritz threw down, without a word of explanation, a bundle of thistles. The boys seemed almost wild with excitement at the success of their expedition, and presently Jack exclaimed, "'Oh, father, you can't think what grand fun hunting on an ostrich is. We flew along like the wind. Sometimes I could scarcely breathe. We were going at such a rate, and was obliged to shut my eyes because of the terrific rush of air. Really, father, you must make me a mask with glass eyes to ride with, or I shall be blinded one of these fine days.' "'Indeed,' replied I, "'I must do no such thing.' "'Why not?' asked he, with a look of amazement upon his face. "'For two reasons. Firstly, because I do not consider that I must do anything that you demand, and secondly, because I think that you are very capable of doing it yourself. However, I must congratulate you upon your abundant supply of game. You must have indeed worked hard.' Yet I wish that you would let me know when you intend on starting on such a long expedition as this. You forget that, though you yourselves know that you are quite safe, and that all is going on well, yet that we at home are kept in a constant state of anxiety. Now, off with you, and look to your animals, and then you may find supper ready. Presently the boys returned, and we prepared for a most appetizing meal, which the mother set before us. While we were discussing the roast pig, and washing it down with fragrant mead, Fritz described the day's expedition. They had set their traps near woodlands, and had there captured the muskrats, attracting them with small carrots, while with other traps baited with fish and earthworms, they had caught several beaver rats and a duck-billed platypus. Hunting and fishing had occupied the rest of the day, and it was with immense pride that Jack displayed the kangaroo, which he had run down with his swift courser. Contributions to the garden had not been forgotten, and Fritz handed over to his mother several cuttings from cinnamon and sweet apple trees. Finally, when all the other treasures had been displayed, Fritz begged me to examine his thistles which he had gathered, thinking, he said, that it was a plant used in the manufacture of wool. He was perfectly right, for I recognized it at once as the fuller's teasel, a plant whose sharp little thorns, which cover the stem and leaves, are used to raise the nap of cloth. 
we resolved to be up betimes the following morning, that we might attend to the preparation of the booty, and as I now noticed that the boys were all becoming extremely drowsy, I closed the day with evening devotions. The number of the creatures we killed rendered the removal of their skins a matter of no little time and trouble. It was not an agreeable task at any time, and when I saw the array of animals the boys had brought me to flay, I determined to construct a machine which would considerably lessen the labor. Among the ship's stores in the surgeon's chest I discovered a large syringe. This, with a few alterations, would serve my purpose admirably. Within the tube I first fitted a couple of valves, and then, perforating the stopper, I had in my possession a powerful air pump. The boys stared at me in blank amazement when, armed with this instrument, I took up the kangaroo and declared myself ready to commence operations. "'Skin a kangaroo with a squirt,' said they, and a roar of laughter followed the remark. I made no reply to the jests which followed, but silently hung the kangaroo by its hind legs to a branch of a tree. I then made a small incision in the skin, and, inserting the mouth of the syringe, forced air with all my might between the skin and the body of the animal. By degrees the hide of the kangaroo distended, altering the shape of the creature entirely. Still I worked on, forcing in yet more air, until it had become a mere shapeless mass, and I soon found that the skin was almost entirely separated from the carcass. A bold cut down the belly, and a few touches here and there, where the ligature still bound the hide to the body, and the animal was flayed. "'What a splendid plan!' cried the boys. "'But why should it do it?' "'For a most simple and natural reason,' I replied. "'Do you not know that the skin of an animal is attached to its flesh "'merely by slender and delicate fibres, "'and that between these exist thousands of little bladders or air chambers? "'By forcing air into these bladders the fibres are stretched, "'and at length, elastic as they are, cracked. "'The skin has now nothing to unite it to the body,' and consequently may be drawn off with perfect ease. This scientific fact has been known for many years. The Greenlanders make constant use of it. When they have killed a seal or walrus, they distend the skin, that they may tow the animal more easily ashore, and then remove its hide at a moment's notice. The remaining animals were subjected to the same treatment, and, to my great joy, in a couple of days the skins were all off and being prepared for use. I now summoned the boys to assist me in procuring blocks of wood for my crushing machine, and the following day we set forth with saws, ropes, axes, and other tools. We soon reached the tree I had selected for my purpose, and I began by sending Fritz and Jack up into the tree with axes to cut off the larger of the high branches that, when the tree fell, it might not injure its neighbors. They then descended, and Fritz and I attacked the stem. As the easiest and most speedy method, we used a saw, such a one as is employed by sawyers in a saw pit, and Fritz taking one end, and I the other, the tree was soon cut half through. We then adjusted ropes that we might guide its fall, and again began to cut. It was laborious work, but when I considered that the cut was sufficiently deep, we took the ropes and pulled with our united strength. The trunk cracked, swayed, tottered, and fell with a crash. The boughs were speedily lopped off, and the trunk sawed into blocks four feet long. To cut down and divide this tree had taken us a couple of days, and on the third we carted home four large and two small blocks, and with the vertebrae joints of the whale I, in a very short time, completed my machine. While engaged on this undertaking I had paid little attention to our fields of grain, and accordingly great was my surprise when one evening the fowls returned, showing most evident indifference to their evening meal, and with their crops perfectly full. It suddenly struck me that these birds had come from the direction of our cornfield. I hurried off to see what damage they had done, and then found, to my great joy, that the grain was perfectly ripe. The amount of work before us startled my wife. This unexpected harvest, which added reaping and threshing, to the fishing, salting, and pickling already on hand, quite troubled her. "'Only think,' said she, 
of my beloved potatoes and manioc roots. What is to become of them, I should like to know. It is time to take them up, and how to manage it with all this press of work, I can't see. Don't be downhearted, wife, said I. There is no immediate hurry about the manioc, and digging potatoes in this fine light soil is easy work, compared to what it is in Switzerland. While as to planting more, that will not be necessary, if we leave the younger plants in the ground. The harvest we must conduct after the Italian fashion, which, although anything but economical, will save time and trouble, and as we are to have two crops in the year, we need not be too particular. Without further delay, I commenced leveling a large space of firm, clayey ground to act as a threshing floor. It was well sprinkled with water, rolled, beaten, and stamped. As the sun dried the moisture, it was watered anew, and the treatment continued until it became as flat, hard, and smooth as a threshing floor need be. Our largest wicker basket was then slung between storm and grumble. We armed ourselves with reaping hooks, and went forth to gather in the corn in the simplest and most expeditious manner imaginable. I told my reapers not to concern themselves about the length of the straw, but to grasp the corn where it was convenient to them, without stooping. Each was to wind a stalk around his own handful, and throw it into the basket. In this way great labor was saved. The plan pleased the boys immensely, and in a short time the basket had been filled many times, and the field displayed a quantity of tall, headless stubble, which perfectly horrified the mother, so extravagant and untidy did she consider our work. "'This is dreadful,' cried she. "'You have left numbers of ears growing on short stalks, and look at that splendid straw completely wasted. I don't approve of your Italian fashion at all.' "'It is not a bad plan, I can assure you, wife, and the Italians do not waste the straw by not cutting it with the grain.' Having more arable than pasture land, they use this high stubble for their cattle, letting them feed in it and eat what grain is left. Afterward, allowing the grass to grow up among it, they mow all together for winter fodder. And now for threshing, also in the Italian fashion. We shall find it spare our arms and backs, as much in that as in reaping. The little sheaves were laid in a large circle on the floor. The boys mounted storm, grumble, lightfoot, and hurry— starting off at a brisk trot, with many a merry jest, and round they went, trampling and stamping out the grain, while dust and chaff flew in clouds about them. My wife and I were incessantly occupied with hay-forks, by means of which we shook up and moved the sheaves over which the threshers rode, so as to throw them in the track. From time to time the animals took mouthfuls of the tempting food they were beating out. We thought they well deserved it, and called to mind the command given to the Jews— Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. After threshing we proceeded to winnowing. By simply throwing the threshed corn with shovels high in the air, when the land or sea breeze blew strong, the chaff and refuse was carried away by the wind, and the grain fell to the ground. During these operations our poultry paid the threshing floor many visits, testifying a lively interest in the success of our labors, and gobbling up the grain at such a rate that my wife was obliged to keep them at a reasonable distance. But I would not have them altogether stinted in the midst of our plenty. I said, Let them enjoy themselves. What we lose in grain, we gain in flesh. I anticipate delicious chicken pie, roast goose, and boiled turkey. When our harvest stores were housed, we found that we had reaped sixty, eighty, even a hundredfold what had been sown. Our garner was truly filled with all manner of store. Expecting a second harvest, we were constrained to prepare the field for sowing again, and immediately therefore commenced mowing down the stubble. While engaged in this, flocks of quails and partridges came to glean among the scattered ears. We did not secure any great number, but resolved to be prepared for them next season, and by spreading nets, to catch them in large quantities. My wife was satisfied when she saw the straw carried home and stacked. Our crop of maize, which of course had not been threshed like the other corn, afforded soft leaves, which were used for stuffing mattresses, while the stalks, when burnt, left ashes so rich in alkali as to be especially useful. I changed the crops sown on the ground to rye, barley, and oats, and hoped they would ripen before the rainy season. 
The shoals of herring made their appearance just as we finished our agricultural operations. This year we pickled only two barrels of them, but we were not so merciful toward the seals, which arrived on the coast directly afterward. We hunted them vigorously, requiring their skins for many purposes, more especially for the completion of the kayak. On the little deck of that tiny vessel I had made a kind of magazine, in which to store pistols, ammunition, water, and provisions, and this I meant to cover with seal skin, so as to be quite water tight. A couple of harpoons furnished with seal bladders were to be suspended alongside. At last came the day when Fritz was to make his trial trip with the kayak. Completely equipped in swimming costume, trousers, jacket, and cap, it was most ludicrous to see him cower down in the canoe and puff and blow till he began to swell like the frog in the fable. All trace of his original figure was speedily lost, and shouts of laughter greeted his comical appearance. Even his mother could not resist a smile, although the dress was her invention. I got the other boat out that my wife might see we were ready to go to his assistance the moment it became necessary. The kayak was launched from a convenient shelving point and floated lightly on the sea green ocean mirror. Fritz with his paddles then began to practice all manner of evolutions, darting along with arrowy swiftness, wheeling to the right, then to the left, and at last flinging himself quite on his side, while his mother uttered a shriek of terror, he showed that the tiny craft would neither capsize nor sink. Then, recovering his balance, he sped securely on his further way. Encouraged by our shouts of approbation, he now boldly ventured into the strong current of Jackal River, and was rapidly carried out to sea. This being more than I had bargained for, I lost no time in giving chase in the boat with Ernest and Jack, my wife urging us to greater speed, and declaring that some accident could not fail to happen to that horrid soap-bubble. We soon arrived outside the bay, at the rocks where formerly lay the wreck, and gazed in all directions for signs of the runaway. After a time we saw, at a considerable distance, a faint puff of smoke, followed by the crack of a pistol. Upon this we fired a signal shot, which was presently answered by another, and, steering in the direction of the sound, we soon heard the boy's cheery halloo. The kayak darted from behind a point of land, and we quickly joined company. "'Come to this rocky beach,' cried Fritz. "'I have something to show you.' With blank amazement we beheld a fine, well-grown young walrus, harpooned and quite dead. "'Did you kill this creature, my dear Fritz?' I exclaimed, looking round in some anxiety, and half expecting to see a naked savage come to claim the prize. "'To be sure, father, don't you see my harpoon? Why do you doubt it?' "'Well, I scarcely know,' replied I, laughing. "'but success so speedy, so unexpected, and so appropriate to an amateur Greenlander, took me by surprise. I congratulate you, my boy. But I must tell you that you have alarmed us by making this long trip. You should not have gone out of the bay. I left your mother in grievous trouble.' "'Indeed, father, I had no idea of passing out of sight. But once in the current I was carried along, and could not help myself. Then I came on a herd of walruses, and I did so long to make a prize of one that I forgot everything else, and made chase after them, when beyond the influence of the current, until I got near enough to harpoon this fine fellow. He swam more slowly, and I struck him a second time. Then he sought refuge among these rocks, and expired. I landed and scrambled to where he lay, but I took care to give him the contents of my pistol before going close up, having a salutary recollection of the big serpent's parting fling at you, Jack." "'You ran a very great risk,' said I. "'The walrus is an inoffensive creature, "'but when attacked and wounded, it often becomes furious, "'and, turning upon its pursuer, can destroy with its long tusks "'a strongly built whale-boat. "'However, thank God for your safety. "'I value that above a thousand such creatures. "'Now, what's to be done with him? "'He must be quite fourteen feet long, although not full-grown.' "'I am very glad you followed me, father,' said Fritz. "'but our united strength will not remove this prodigious weight from among these rocks. "'Only do let me carry away the head with those grand snow-white tusks. 
I should so like to fasten it on the prow of the kayak, and name it the seahorse. We must certainly carry away the beautiful ivory tusks, said I, but make haste. The air feels so excessively close and sultry. I think a storm is brewing. But the head, the head, we must have the whole head, cried Jack. Just think how splendid it will look on the kayak. And how splendid it will smell, too, when it begins to putrefy, added Ernest. What a treat for the steersman. Oh, we will prepare for that, said Fritz. It shall be soaked and cleaned and dried until it is as hard as a wooden model. It shall not offend your delicate nose in the least, Ernest. I supposed the walrus to be an animal peculiar to the Arctic regions, remarked Ernest. And so it is, I replied, though they may occasionally be seen elsewhere. These may have wandered from the Antarctic seas. I know that on the eastern coast of Africa is found a smaller species of walrus called the dugong. It has long incisor teeth, but not tusks, and certainly resembles a seal rather than a walrus. While thus speaking, we were actively engaged in the decapitation of the walrus and in cutting off long strips of its skin. This took some time, as we had not the proper implements, and Fritz remarked that in future the kayak must be provided with a hunting knife and a hatchet, adding that he should like to have a small compass in a box, with a glass top, fixed in front of the hole where the steersman sits. I saw the necessity of this, and I promised it should be done. Our work being accomplished, we were ready to go, and I proposed to take Fritz and the canoe on board our boat. So that we might all arrive together, but I yielded to his earnest wish to return alone as he came. He longed to act as our avant courier and announce our approach to his mother, so he was soon skimming away over the surface of the water while we followed at a slower rate. Black clouds, meanwhile, gathered thick and fast around us, and a tremendous storm came on. Fritz was out of sight and beyond our reach. We buckled on the swimming belts and firmly lashed ourselves to the boat, so that we might not be washed overboard by the towering seas which broke over it. The horizon was shrouded in darkness, fearful gusts of wind lashed the ocean into foam, rain descended in torrents, while livid lightning glared athwart the gloom. Both my boys faced the danger nobly, and my feelings of alarm were mingled with hope on finding how well the boat behaved. The tempest swept on its way, and the sky began to clear as suddenly as it had been overcast, yet the stormy waves continued for a long time to threaten our frail bark with destruction, in spite of its buoyancy and steadiness. Yet I never lost hope for ourselves. All my fears were for Fritz. In fact, I gave him up for lost, and my whole agonized heart arose in prayer for strength to say, Thy will be done. At last we rounded the point, and once more entering Safety Bay, quickly drew near the little harbor. What was our surprise, our overwhelming delight, when there we saw the mother with Fritz, as well as her little boy, on their knees in prayer so earnest for our deliverance, that our approach was unperceived, until with cries of joy we attracted their notice. Then indeed ensued a happy meeting, and we gave thanks together for the mercy which had spared our lives. Returning joyfully to Rockburg, we changed our drenched garments for warm, dry clothes, and, seated at a comfortable meal, considered and described at our ease the perils of the storm. Afterward, the head of the walrus was conveyed to our workshop, where it underwent such a skillful and thorough process of cleaning, embalming, and drying, that ere long it was actually fixed on the prow of the kayak, and a most imposing appearance it presented. The strips of hide, when well tanned and prepared, made valuable leather. Much damage had been done by the late storm. The heavy rain had flooded all the streams and injured crops which should have been housed before the regular rainy season. The bridge over Jackal River was partly broken down, and the water tanks and pipes all needed repair. So our time was much occupied in restoring things to order. On going to work one day near the Cascade, we found a great number of dark red berries scattered on the ground. They were about the size of ordinary hazelnuts, with small leafy coronets at the tip. 
The boys thought them so inviting that they tasted them at once, but angry exclamations and much spitting and spluttering followed the experiment. Even Knips rejected them, and they would have been cast aside with contempt had not the smell induced me to examine them. I decided that this was the fruit of the clove. Some plants were immediately set in the nursery garden, and my wife was pleased to have this excellent spice wherewith to flavor her boiled rice and other dishes, in lieu of pepper, a very welcome variety to every one. Having a good supply of clay, brought from the bed near Falconhurst, I proposed to use it for making aqueducts, and observing how much the recent rain had promoted the growth of our young corn, I determined to irrigate the fields with the drainage from our crushing mill. The fishing season was again successful. Large takes of salmon, sturgeon, and herring rewarded our annual exertions, and our storeroom again assumed a well-stocked appearance. Much as I wished that we could obtain a constant supply of these fish fresh, I was obliged to reject the naive proposal from Jack that we should tether a shoal of salmon by the gills to the bottom of the bay, as we had secured the turtles. Many quiet, uneventful days passed by, and I perceived that the boys, wearied by the routine of farm work at Rockburg, were longing for a cruise in the yacht, or an expedition into the woods, which would refresh both mind and body. "'Father,' said Fritz at length, "'we want a quantity of hurdles, and have scarcely any more bamboos of which to make them. Had we not better get a supply from woodlands?' And you said, too, the other day that you wished you had some more of the fine clay. We might visit the gap at the same time. I had really no objection to propose, and it was shortly afterward settled that Fritz, Jack, and Franz should start together, and that Ernest, who had no great desire to accompany his brothers, should remain with his mother and me, and assist in the construction of a sugar mill, the erection of which I had long contemplated." Before they started, Fritz begged some bear's meat from the mother to make pemmican. "'And what may pemmican be?' she asked. "'It is a food carried by the fur traders of North America on their long journeys through the wild country they traverse, and consists of bear or deer's flesh, first cooked and then pounded or ground to powder. It is very portable and nourishing.' His mother consented to humor him, as she said, although without much faith in the value of the preparation, and in the course of two days a stock of pemmican, sufficient for a polar expedition, was fabricated by our enthusiastic son. They were ready to start, when I observed Jack quietly slip a basket, containing several pigeons, under the packages in the cart. Oh, oh thought I, the little fellow has his doubts about that pemmican, and thinks a tough old pigeon would be preferable." The weather was exquisite, and, with exhortations to prudence and caution from both me and their mother, the three lads started in the very highest spirits. Storm and Grumble, as usual, drew the cart, and were ridden by Fritz and Franz, while Hurry carried Jack swiftly across the bridge in advance of them, followed by Floss and Bruno, barking at his heels. The sugar mill occupied us for several days, and was made so much like our other mills that I need not now describe it. On the evening of the first day, as we sat resting in the porch at Rockburg, we naturally talked of the absentees, wondering and guessing what they might be about. Ernest looked rather mysterious, and hinted that he might have news of them next morning. Just then a bird alighted on the dovecot and entered. I could not see, in the failing light, whether it was one of our own pigeons or an intruder. Ernest started up, and said he would see that all was right. In a few minutes he returned with a scrap of paper in his hand. "'News, father! The very latest news by pigeon-post, mother!' "'Well done, boys! What a capital idea!' said I, and, taking the note, I read, "'Dearest parents and Ernest, a brute of a hyena has killed a ram and two lambs. The dogs seized it. Franz shot it. It is dead and skinned. The pemmican isn't worth much, but we are all right. Love to all. Fritz. Woodlands. 15th instant. A true hunter's letter, laughed I. But what exciting news. When does the next post come in, Ernest? 
"'Tonight, I hope,' said he, while his mother sighed, and doubted the value of such glimpses into scenes of danger through which her sons were passing, declaring she would much rather wait and hear all about it when she had them safe home again. Thus the winged letter-carriers kept us informed from day to day of the outline of adventures which were afterward more fully described. On approaching the farm at Woodlands, the boys were startled by hearing, as they thought, human laughter, repeated again and again, while, to their astonishment, the oxen testified the great uneasiness, the dogs growled and drew close to their masters, and the ostrich fairly bolted with Jack into the rice swamp. The laughter continued, and the beasts became unmanageable. "'Something is very far wrong,' cried Fritz. "'I cannot leave the animals, but while I unharness them, do you, Franz, take the dogs,' and advance cautiously to see what is the matter. Without a moment's hesitation, Franz made his way among the bushes with his gun, closely followed by the dogs, until, through an opening in the thicket, he could see, at a distance of about forty paces, an enormous hyena, in the most wonderful state of excitement, dancing round a lamb just killed, and uttering, from time to time, the ghastly hysterical laughter which had pealed through the forest. The beast kept running backward and forward, rising on its hind legs, and then rapidly whirling round and round, nodding its head, and going through most frantic and ludicrous antics. Franz kept his presence of mind very well, for he watched till, calming down, the hyena began with horrid growls to tear its prey, and then, firing steadily both barrels, he broke its foreleg and wounded it in the breast. Meanwhile, Fritz, having unyoked the oxen and secured them to trees, hurried to his brother's assistance. The dogs and the dying hyena were by this time engaged in mortal strife, but the latter, although it severely wounded both Floss and Bruno, speedily succumbed, and was dead when the boys reached the spot. They raised a shout of triumph which guided Jack to the scene of action, and their first care was for the dogs, whose wounds they dressed before minutely examining the hyena. It was as large as a wild boar. Long stiff bristles formed a mane on its neck. Its color was gray marked with black. The teeth and jaws were of extraordinary strength. The thighs muscular and sinewy. The claws remarkably strong and sharp altogether. But for his wounds he would certainly have been more than a match for the dogs. After unloading the cart at the farm, the boys returned for the carcass of the tiger-wolf, as it is sometimes called, and occupied themselves in skinning it during the remainder of the day, when, after dispatching the carrier pigeon to Rockburg, they retired to rest on their bearskin rugs, to dream of adventures past and future. The following day they devised no less a scheme than to survey the shores of Wood Lake, and place marks wherever the surrounding marsh was practicable and might be crossed either to reach the water or leave it. Fritz in the kayak and the boys on shore carefully examined the ground together, and when they found firm footing to the water's edge, the spot was indicated by planting a tall bamboo, bearing on high a bundle of reeds and branches. They succeeded in capturing three young black swans, after considerable resistance from the old ones. They were afterward brought to Rockburg, and detained as ornaments to Safety Bay. Presently a beautiful heron thrust his long neck from among the reeds, to ascertain what all the noise on the lake was about. Before he could satisfy his curiosity, Fritz unhooded his eagle, and though vainly he flapped and struggled, his legs and wings were gently but firmly bound, and he had to own himself vanquished, and submit to the inspection of his delighted captors. It was their turn to be alarmed next, for a large, powerful animal came puffing, with a curious whistling sound, through the dense thicket of reeds, passing close by and sorely discomposing them by its sudden appearance. It was out of sight immediately, before they could summon the dogs, and from their description it must have been a taper, the color dark brown, and in form resembling a young rhinoceros, but with no horn on the nose, and the upper lip prolonged into a trunk something like that of an elephant on a smaller scale. It is a gentle creature, but when attacked becomes a fierce opponent, 
and can wound dogs dangerously with its powerful teeth. The taper can swim and dive with perfect ease, and abounds in the densely wooded swamps and rivers of tropical America. Fritz in his kayak followed for a time the direction in which the taper proceeded, but saw no more of it. Meanwhile, the other two boys returned to the farm by the rice fields, and there fell in with a flock of cranes, five or six of which they caught alive, among them two demoiselles or Numidian cranes. These birds they shot at with arrows arranged in a skillful and original way, with loops of cord dipped in bird lime attached to them, so that it often happened that the bird aimed at was entangled and brought down uninjured. The young hunters seemed to have lived very comfortably on peccary ham, cassava bread, and fruit, and plenty of baked potatoes and milk. One trial of the pemmican was sufficient, and it was handed over to the dogs. Fritz, however, determined again to attempt the manufacture, knowing its value when properly prepared. After collecting a supply of rice and cotton, they took their way to Prospect Hill, and, said Fritz, as he afterward vividly described the dreadful scene there enacted. When we entered the pine wood, we found it in possession of troops of monkeys, who resolved to make our passage through it as disagreeable as possible, for they howled and chattered at us like demons, pelting us as hard as they could with pine cones. They became so unbearable that at last we fired a few shots right and left among them. Several bit the dust, the rest fled, and we continued our way in peace to Prospect Hill, but only to discover the havoc the wretches had made there. Would you believe it, father? The pleasant cottage had been overrun and ruined by apes, just as woodland last summer. The most dreadful dirt and disorder met our eyes wherever we turned, and we had hard work to make the place fit for human habitation, and even then we preferred the tent. I felt quite at a loss how to guard the farm for the future, but seeing a bottle of the poisonous gum of the euphorbia in the tool chest, I devised a plan for the destruction of the apes, which succeeded beyond my expectations. I mixed poison with milk, bruised millet, and anything I thought the monkeys would eat, and put it in coconut shells, which I hung about in the trees, high enough to be out of reach of our own animals. The evening was calm and lovely. The sea murmured in the distance, and the rising moon shed a beauty over the landscape which we seemed never before to have so admired and enjoyed. The summer night closed around us in all its solemn stillness, and our deepest feelings were touched, when suddenly the spell was broken by an outburst of the most hideous and discordant noises. As by one consent, every beast of the forest seemed to arise from its den. And utter its wild nocturnal cry. Snorting, snarling, and shrieking filled the wood beneath us. From the hills echoed the mournful howl of the jackals, answered by Fangs in the yard, who was backed up by the barking and yelping of his friends, Floss and Bruno. Far away beyond the rocky fastnesses of the gap sounded unearthly hollow snortings and neighings, reminding one of the strange cry of the hippopotamus. Above these, occasional deep, majestic roaring made our hearts quail with the conviction that we heard the voices of lions and elephants. Overawed and silent, we retired to rest, hoping to forget in sleep the terrors of the midnight forest. But ere long, the most fearful cries in the adjoining woods gave notice that the apes were beginning to suffer from the poisoned repast prepared for them. As our dogs could not remain silent amid the uproar and din, we had not a wink of sleep until the morning. It was late, therefore, when we rose and looked on the awful spectacle presented by the multitude of dead monkeys and baboons thickly strewn under the trees round the farm. I shall not tell you how many there were, I can only say I wished I had not found the poison, and we made all haste to clear away the dead bodies and the dangerous food. Burying some deep in the earth, and carrying the rest to the shore, we pitched them over the rocks into the sea. That day we travelled on to the gap. The same evening that the boys reached the rocky pass, a messenger pigeon arrived at Rockburg, bearing a note which concluded in the following words 
The barricade at the gap broken down. Everything laid waste as far as the sugar break, where the hut is knocked to pieces and the fields trampled over by huge footmarks. Come to us, father. We are safe, but feel we are no match for this unknown danger. I lost not an instant, but saddled swift, late as it was, in order to ride to the assistance of our boys, desiring Ernest to prepare the small cart and follow me with his mother at daybreak, bringing everything we should require for camping out for some days. The bright moonlight favored my journey, and my arrival at the gap surprised and delighted the boys, who did not expect me till the next day. Early on the following morning I inspected the footprints and ravages of the great unknown. The cane break had, without doubt, been visited by an elephant. That great animal alone could have left such traces and committed such fearful ravages. Thick posts in the barricade were snapped across like reeds. The trees in the vicinity, where we planned to build a cool summer house, were stripped of leaves and branches to a great height, but the worst mischief was done among the young sugar cane plants, which were all either devoured or trampled down and destroyed. It seemed to me that not one elephant, but a troop, must have invaded our grounds. The tracks were very numerous, and the footprints of various sizes, but, to my satisfaction, I saw that they could be traced not only from the gap, but back to it in evidently equal numbers. We did not therefore suppose that the mighty animals remained hidden in the woods of our territory, but concluded that, after this freebooting incursion, they had withdrawn to their native wilds, where, by greatly increasing the strength of our ramparts, we hoped henceforth to oblige them to remain. In what manner to effect this we laid many plans, during the night of my arrival, when, sitting by an enormous watch-fire, I chatted with my boys, and heard details of their numerous adventures, so interesting for them to relate, and for me to hear, that every one was more disposed to act sentinel than retire to sleep. The mother and Ernest arrived next day, and she rejoiced to find all well, making light of trodden fields and trampled sugar-canes, since her sons were sound in life and limb. A systematic scheme of defense was now elaborated, and the erection of the barricade occupied us for at least a month, as it was to be a firm and durable building, proof against all invasion. As our little tent was unsuited to a long residence of this sort, I adopted Fritz's idea of a Kamchatkin dwelling, and to his great delight forthwith carried it out. Instead of planting four posts, on which to place a platform, we chose four trees of equal size, which, in a very suitable place, grew exactly in a square, twelve or fourteen feet apart. Between these, at about twenty feet from the ground, we laid a flooring of beams and bamboo, smoothly and strongly planked. From this rose, on all four sides, walls of cane. The frame of the roof was covered so effectually by large pieces of bark that no rain could penetrate. The staircase to this tree cottage was simply a board plank with bars nailed across it for steps. The flooring projected like a balcony in front of the entrance door, and underneath, on the ground, we fitted up sheds for cattle and fowls. Various ornaments in Chinese or Japanese style were added to the roof and eaves, and a most convenient, cool, and picturesque cottage, overhung and adorned by the graceful foliage of the trees, was the result of our ingenuity. I was pleased to find that the various birds taken by the boys during this excursion seemed likely to thrive. They were the first inmates of the new sheds, and even the black swans and cranes soon became tame and sociable. Constantly roaming through the woods, the children often made new discoveries. Fritz brought one day, after an excursion to the opposite side of the stream beyond the gap, a cluster of bananas, and also of cacao beans, from which chocolate is made. The banana, although valuable and nourishing food for the natives of the tropical countries where it grows, is not generally liked by Europeans, and probably this variety was even inferior to many others, for we found the fruit much like rotten pears, and almost uneatable. The cacao seeds tasted exceedingly bitter, 
and it seemed wonderful that by preparation they should produce anything so delicious as chocolate. My wife, who now fancied no manufacture beyond my skill, begged for plants, seeds, or cuttings to propagate in her nursery garden, already fancying herself in the enjoyment of chocolate for breakfast, and I promised to make a cacao plantation near home. Let me have bananas also, said she, for we may acquire a taste for that celebrated fruit, and at all events I am sure I can make it into an excellent preserve. The day before our return to Rockburg, Fritz went again to the inland region beyond the river to obtain a large supply of young banana plants and the cacao fruit. He took the kayak and a bundle of reeds to float behind him as a raft to carry the fruit, plants, and anything else he might wish to bring back. On the evening he made his appearance, coming swiftly downstream. His brothers rushed to meet him, each eager to see and help to land his cargo. Ernest and Fritz were quickly running up the bank, with arms full of plants, branches, and fruits, when Fritz handed to Jack a dripping wet bag, which he had brought along partly under water. A curious pattering noise proceeded from this bag, but they kept the contents a secret for the present. Jack running with it behind a bush before peeping in, and I could just hear him exclaim, "Hullo! I say, what monsters they are! It's enough to make a fellow's flesh creep to look at them." With that, he hastily shut up the bag and put it away safely out of sight in water. Securing the kayak, Fritz sprang toward us, his handsome face radiant with pleasure, as he exhibited a beautiful waterfowl. Its plumage was rich purple, changing on the back to dark green. The legs, feet, and a mark above the bill, bright red. This lovely bird I concluded to be the sultan cock described by Buffon, and as it was gentle, we gladly received it among our domestic pets. Fritz gave a stirring account of his exploring trip, having made his way far up the river between fertile plains and majestic forests of lofty trees. Where the cries of vast numbers of birds, parrots, peacocks, guinea fowls, and hundreds unknown to him, quite bewildered and made him feel giddy. It was in the buffalo swamp, continued he, that I saw the splendid birds you call sultan cocks, and I set my heart on catching one alive, which, as they seemed to have little fear of my approach, I managed by means of a wire snare. Farther on, I saw a grove of mimosa trees, among which huge dark masses were moving in a deliberate way. Guess what they were? Savages? asked Franz timidly. Black bears, I bet, cried Jack. Your words suggest to my mind the manner and appearance of elephants, said Ernest. Right you are, Professor, exclaimed Fritz gaily, the words producing quite a sensation on the whole attentive family. From fifteen to twenty elephants were feeding peacefully on the leafy boughs, tearing down branches with their trunks and shoving them into their mouths with one jerk, or bathing in the deep waters of the marsh for refreshment in the great heat. You cannot imagine the wild grandeur of the scene. The river being very broad, I felt safe from wild animals, and more than once saw splendid jaguars crouched on the banks. Their glossy skin glancing in the sunlight. While considering if it would be simply foolhardy to try a shot at one of these creatures, I was suddenly convinced that discretion is the better part of valor, and urging my canoe into the center current, made a rapid retreat down the river. For just before me, in the calm deep water of a sheltered bay, where I was quietly floating, there arose a violent, boiling, bubbling commotion. And for an instant I thought a hot spring was going to burst forth. Instead of that, up rose the hideous head and gaping jaws of a hippopotamus, who, with a hoarse, terrific snort, seemed about to attack me. I can tell you I did not wait to see the rest of him. A glimpse of his enormous mouth and its array of white gleaming tusks was quite enough. Right about face, said I to myself, and shot down the stream like an arrow. Never pausing till a bend in the river brought me within sight of the gap, where I once more felt safe and joyfully made my way back to you all. This narrative was of thrilling interest to us, 
proving the existence of tribes of the most formidable animals beyond the rocky barrier which defended, in so providential a manner, the small and fertile territory on which our lot was cast. During the absence of the adventurer we had been busily engaged in making preparations for our departure, and everything was packed up and ready by the morning after his return. After some hesitation I yielded to his great wish, which was to return by sea in his kayak round Cape Disappointment, and so meet us at Rockburg. He was much interested in examining the outlines of the coast and the rugged precipices of the Cape. These were tenanted by vast flocks of sea-fowl and birds of prey, while many varieties of shrubs and plants, hitherto unknown to us, grew in the clefts and crevices of the rocks, some of them diffusing a strong aromatic odor. Among the specimens he brought I recognized the caper plant, and with still greater pleasure a shrub which was, I felt sure, the tea plant of China. It bore very pretty white flowers, and the leaves resembled myrtle. Our land journey was effected without accident or adventure of any kind. Jack, mounted as usual on Hurry, the ostrich, carried the mysterious wet bag very carefully slung at his side, and when near home started off at a prodigious rate in advance of us. He let fall the drawbridge, and we saw no more of him until, on reaching Rockburg, he appeared leisurely returning from the swamp, where apparently he had gone to deposit his moist secret, as Franz called it. We were all glad to take up our quarters once more in our large and convenient dwelling, and my first business was to provide for the great number of birds we now had on our hands, by establishing them in suitable localities, it being impossible to maintain them all in the poultry-yard. Some were, therefore, taken to the islands, and the black swans, the heron, the graceful demoiselle cranes, and our latest acquisition, the splendid sultan-cock, soon became perfectly at home in the swamp, greatly adding to the interest of the neighborhood of Safety Bay. The old bustards were the tamest of all our feathered pets, and never more so than at meal-times. They were unfailing in their attendance when we dined or supped in the open air. Toward evening, as we sat in the veranda listening to Fritz's account of his trip round the Cape, an extraordinary hollow roaring noise sounded from the swamp, not unlike the angry bellowing of a bull. The dogs barked, and the family rose in excitement, but I remarked a look of quiet humor in Fritz's eye, as he stood leaning against one of the veranda pillars, watching Jack, who, in some confusion, started off toward the marsh. "'Come back, you silly boy!' cried his mother. "'The child has not so much as a pistol, and is rushing off alone to face he knows not what.' "'Perhaps,' said I, looking at Fritz, "'this is not a case requiring the use of firearms. "'It may be only the booming of a bittern which we hear.' "'You need not be uneasy, mother,' said Fritz. "'Jack knows what he is about. "'Only this charming serenade took him by surprise, "'and I fancy he will have to exhibit his treasures "'before they reach perfection. "'Yes, here he comes.' "'Lugging his moist secret along with him, "'Jack, flushed and breathless, came up to us, exclaiming, "'They were to grow as big as rabbits before you saw them. "'Such a shame. "'I never thought they would kick up a row like that. "'Now for it.' "'And he turned out the bag. "'This is grace, and this is beauty. Two immense frogs rolled clumsily on the ground, "'and, recovering their feet, sat squat before us, "'swelling and puffing with a ludicrous air of insulted dignity.' while peals of laughter greeted them on all sides. Ladies and gentlemen, these are two very handsome young specimens of the famous African bullfrog, said Jack, pretending to be offended at the mingled disgust and amusement occasioned by their appearance. They are but half grown, and I hoped to maintain them in seclusion until they reached full size, when I would have introduced them with proper éclat but since their talent for music has brought them precociously into public notice, I must beg for your kind and indulgent patronage, and leave to take them back to the swamp. Great clapping of hands followed Jack's speech. Grace and beauty were examined, and commented on with much interest, and voted 
decidedly handsome in their way. Their general color was greenish-brown, mottled and spotted with reddish-brown and yellow, the sides green and black, the underpart yellow, mottled with orange. The eyes were positively beautiful, of a rich chestnut hue covered with golden-white dots, which shone with a metallic luster. The skin of the body was puckered into longitudinal folds. By general consent they were remanded to the swamp. Shortly after our return to Rockburg, my wife drew my attention to the somewhat neglected state of our dear old summer residence at Falconhurst, begging me to devote some time to its restoration and embellishment. This I most willingly undertook, and we removed thither, as soon as the boys had completed the arrangement of the artificial salt lick to their satisfaction. At Falconhurst things were quickly in good order, and we made a great improvement by completing the broad terrace, supported on the arching roots of the trees, it was better floored, and rustic pillars and trellis work sustained a bark roof, which afforded a pleasant shade. After this was done, I was compelled to consent to a plan long cherished by Fritz, who wished to construct a watch-tower and mount a gun on Shark Island. After great exertion, both mental and bodily, this piece of military engineering was completed, and a flagstaff erected, on which the guard at this outpost could run up a white flag to signal the approach of anything harmless from the sea, while a red flag would be shown on the least appearance of danger. To celebrate the completion of this great work, which occupied us during two months, we hoisted the white flag and fired a salute of six guns. We spend our years as a tale that is told, said King David. These words recurred to me again and again as I reviewed ten years, of which the story lay chronicled in the pages of my journal. Year followed year, chapter succeeded chapter, steadily, imperceptibly, time was passing away. The shade of sadness cast on my mind by retrospect of this kind was dispelled by thoughts full of gratitude to God for the welfare and happiness of my beloved family during so long a period. I had cause especially to rejoice in seeing our sons advance to manhood, strengthened by early training for lives of usefulness and activity, wherever their lot might fall. And my great wish is that young people who read this record of our lives and adventures should learn from it how admirably suited is the peaceful, industrious, and pious life of a cheerful, united family to the formation of strong, pure, and manly character. None take a better place in the great national family, none are happier or more beloved than those who go forth from such homes to fulfill new duties and to gather fresh interests around them. Having given a detailed account of several years' residence in New Switzerland, as we like to call our dominion, it is needless for me to continue what would exhaust the patience of the most long-suffering, by repeating monotonous narratives of exploring parties and hunting expeditions, wearisome descriptions of awkward inventions and clumsy machines, with an endless record of discoveries, more fit for the pages of an encyclopedia than a book of family history. Yet before winding up with the concluding events, I may mention some interesting facts illustrative of our exact position at the time these took place. Rockburg and Falconhurst continued to be our winter and summer headquarters, and improvements were added which made them more and more convenient, as well as attractive in appearance. The fountains, trellised verandas, and plantations round Rockburg completely changed the character of the residence which, on account of the heat and want of vegetation, had in former days been so distasteful to my wife. Flowering creepers overhung the balconies and pillars, while shrubs and trees, both native and European, grew luxuriantly in groves of our planting. In the distance, Shark Island, now clothed with graceful palms, guarded the entrance to Safety Bay, the battery and flagstaff prominently visible on its crested rock. The swamp, cleared and drained, was now a considerable lake, with just marsh and reeds enough beyond it, to form good cover for the waterfowl whose favorite retreat it was. On its blue waters sailed stately black swans, snow-white geese, 
and richly coloured ducks, while out and in among the water plants and rushes would appear at intervals glimpses of the brilliant sultan, marsh fowl, crimson flamingos, soft blue grey demoiselle cranes, and crested heron, all associating in harmony and with no fear of us their masters. The giant frogs, grace and beauty, delighted Jack by actually attaining in time to the size of small rabbits, and, perfectly knowing their very appropriate names, would waddle out of the marsh at his call to eat a grasshopper or dainty fly. Beneath the spreading trees and through the aromatic shrubberies, old Hurry, the ostrich, was usually to be seen marching about, with grave and dignified pace, as though monarch of all he surveyed. Every variety of beautiful pigeon nested in the rocks and dovecots, their soft cooing and glossy plumage making them favourite household pets. By the bridge alone could Rockburg be approached, for higher up the river, where near the cascade it was fordable, a dense and impenetrable thicket of orange and lemon trees, Indian figs, prickly pears, and all manner of thorn-bearing shrubs, planted by us, now formed a complete barrier. The rabbit warren on Shark Island kept us well supplied with food, as well as soft and useful fur, and, as the antelopes did not thrive on Whale Island, they also were placed among the shady groves with the rabbits, and their own island devoted to such work as candle-making, tanning, wool-cleaning, and any other needful but offensive operations. The farm at Woodlands flourished, and our flocks and herds supplied us with mutton, beef, and veal, while my wife's dairy was almost more than she could manage. My boys retained their old love for giving names to the animals. They had a beautiful creamy white cow called Blanche, and a bull with such a tremendous voice that he received the name of Stentor. Two fleet young onagers were named Arrow and Dart, and Jack had a descendant of his old favorite fangs, the jackal, which he chose to call Coco, asserting that no word could be distinguished at a distance without the letter O in it, giving illustrations of his theory till our ears were almost deafened. Excellent health had been enjoyed by us all during these ten years, though my wife occasionally suffered from slight attacks of fever, and the boys sometimes met with little accidents. They were all fine, handsome fellows. Fritz, now twenty-four, was of moderate height, uncommonly strong, active, muscular, and high-spirited. Ernest, two years younger, was tall and slight. In disposition, mild, calm, and studious. His early faults of indolence and selfishness were almost entirely overcome. He possessed refined tastes and great intellectual power. Jack, at twenty, strongly resembled Fritz, being about his height, though more lightly built, and remarkable rather for active grace and agility than for muscular strength. Franz, a lively youth of seventeen, had some of the qualities of each of his brothers. He possessed wit and shrewdness, but not the arch-drollery of Jack. All were honorable, God-fearing young men, dutiful and affectionate to their mother and myself, and warmly attached to each other. Although so many years had elapsed in total seclusion, it continued to be my strong impression that we should one day be restored to the society of our fellow men. But time, which was bringing our sons to manhood, was also carrying their parents onward to old age, and anxious gloomy thoughts relating to their future, should they be left indeed alone, sometimes oppressed my heart. On such occasions I would not communicate the sense of depression to my family, but, turning in prayer to the Almighty Father, laid my trouble before Him, with never-failing renewal of strength and hope. My elder sons often made expeditions of which we knew nothing until their return after many hours. When any uneasiness I might have felt was dissipated by their joyous appearance, and reproof always died away on my lips. Fritz had been absent one whole day from Rockburg, and not until evening did we remark that his kayak was gone, and that he must be out at sea. Anxious to see him return before nightfall, I went off to Shark Island with Ernest and Jack, in order to look out for him from the watchtower there, at the same time hoisting our signal flag and loading the gun. 
Long we gazed across the expanse of ocean glittering in the level beams of the setting sun, and finally discerned a small black speck in the distance which, by the telescope, was proved to be the returning wanderer. I remarked that his skiff sailed at a slower rate than usual toward the shore. The cannon was fired to let him know that his approach was observed, and then we joyfully hurried back to receive him at the harbor. It was easy to see as he drew near what had delayed his progress. The kayak towed a large sack, besides being heavily laden. "'Welcome, Fritz,' I cried. "'Welcome back, wherever you come from, and whatever you bring. You seem to have quite a cargo there.' "'Yes, and my trip has led to discoveries as well as booty,' answered he. "'Interesting discoveries, which will tempt us again in the same direction. "'Come, boys, let's carry up the things, and while I rest I will relate my adventures.' "'As soon as possible all assembled round him. "'I think my absence without leave deserves reproach instead of this warm reception, father, "'and I must apologize for it,' he began." But ever since I possessed the kayak, it has been my ambition to make a voyage of discovery along the coast, which we have never explored beyond the point at which I killed the walrus. In order to be ready to start without delay, when a convenient opportunity offered, I made preparations beforehand, such as provisioning my skiff, fixing the compass in front of my seat, arranging conveniently rifle, harpoon, axe, boat-hook, and fishing-net. I also resolved to take with me Pounce, my eagle, and this I always will do in future. This morning dawned magnificently. The calm sea, the gentle breeze, all drew me irresistibly to the fulfillment of my purpose. I left the harbor unperceived, the current quickly bore me out to sea, and I rounded the point to the left, passing just over the spot where, beneath the waves, lie the guns, cannonballs, ironwork, and all that was indestructible about our good old wreck. And would you believe it, Through the glassy clear water, undisturbed by a ripple, I actually saw many such things strewn on the flat rocky bottom. Pursuing my way, I passed among rugged cliffs and rocks, which jutted out from the shore, or rose in rugged masses from the water. Myriads of sea-fowl inhabited the most inaccessible of these, while on the lower ridges seals, sea-bears, and walruses were to be seen, some basking lazily in the sun, some plunging into the water, or emerging awkwardly from it, hoisting their unwieldy bodies up the rocks by means of their tusks. I must confess to feeling anything but comfortable while going through the places held in possession by these monsters of the deep, and used every effort to pass quickly and unnoticed. Yet it was more than an hour and a half before I got clear of the rocks, cliffs, and shoals to which they resorted, and neared a high and precipitous cape, running far out to sea. Right opposite me, in the side of this rocky wall, was a magnificent archway, forming, as it first appeared to me, a lofty entrance to an immense vaulted cavern. I passed beneath this noble portal and examined the interior. It was tenanted by numbers of a small species of swallow, scarcely larger than a wren, and the walls were covered by thousands of their nests. They were rudely built, and their peculiarity was that each rested on a kind of platform, something like a spoon without the handle. I detached a number, and found that they had a curious appearance, seemingly made of something fibrous and gelatinous, and more like a set of sponges, corals, or fungi, than nests of birds. I have brought them home in my fishing net. "'If we had commercial dealings with the Chinese,' said I, "'your discovery would be of value.' These are doubtless edible bird's nests. The bird is called the esculent swallow, and the trade in this strange article of diet is a very large one. The nests are of different value, but those which are quite new and nearly white are held in such esteem that they are worth their weight in silver. There are tremendous caverns in Java and other places where, at great risk, these nests are procured the annual weight obtained being upward of fifty thousand pounds, and the value more than two hundred thousand pounds. When placed in water and well soaked, they soften and swell, and are made into soup of very strengthening and restorative quality. I think you might try your hand on these, mother, just for curiosity's sake. I can't say I fancy the look of the queer things, said she, but I don't mind trying if they will turn to jelly, 
though boiling birds' nests is cookery quite out of my line. Oh, do, mother, let us taste birds' nests as soon as you can, though the idea makes me fancy a mouthful of feathers, laughed Jack. It is really a most curious formation, said Fritz. From whence are the swallows supposed to get this kind of gelatin? It has never been exactly ascertained, I replied, whether the birds discover or produce this curious substance. But whatever may be its basis, it is clear that a very large portion of it is furnished by certain glands, which pour out a viscid secretion. After laying in my store of nests, continued Fritz, I pursued my way through this vaulted cave or corridor, which, presently turning, opened into a very lonely bay, so calm and lake-like that, although of considerable size, I concluded at once it must be nearly landlocked. Its shores, beyond the rocky boundary through which I penetrated, extended in a fertile plain toward what seemed the mouth of a river, beyond which lay rough and probably marshy ground, and a dense forest of cedars, which closed the view. The water beneath me was clear as crystal, and gazing into its depths and shallows, I perceived beds of shellfish, like large oysters, attached to the rocks and to each other by tufts of hairy filaments. If these are oysters, thought I, they must be better worth eating, as far as size goes, than our little friends in Safety Bay. And thereupon I hooked up several clusters with my boat hook, and landing soon after on the beach I flung them on the sand, resolving to fetch another load, and then tow them after me in the fishing net. The hot sun disagreed with their constitution, I suppose, for when I came back the shells were all gaping wide open, so I began to examine them, thinking that after all they were probably much less delicate than the small oysters we have learnt to like so much. Somehow, when a thing is to be examined, one generally needs a knife. The blade met with resistance here and there in the creature's body, and still closer examination produced from it several pearly balls like peas, of different sizes. Do you think they can be pearls? I have a number here in a box. Oh, show them to us, Fritz, cried the boys. What pretty shining things, and how delicately rounded, and how softly they gleam. You have discovered treasure indeed, I exclaimed. Why, these are most beautiful pearls. Valueless, certainly, under present circumstances, but they may prove a source of wealth, should we ever again come into contact with the civilized world. We must visit your pearl oyster beds at the earliest opportunity. After resting for some time and refreshing myself with food, pursued Fritz, I resumed my survey of the coast, my progress somewhat impeded by the bag of shellfish which I drew after me. But I proceeded without accident past the mouth of the stream to the further side of the bay, which was there enclosed by a point corresponding to that through which I had entered, and between these headlands I found a line of reefs and sandbanks, with but a single channel leading out to the open sea, from which, therefore, Pearl Bay, as I named it, lies completely sheltered. The tide was setting strongly inshore, so that I could not then attempt a passage through it, but examined the crags of the headland, thinking I might perchance discover a second vaulted archway. I saw nothing remarkable, however, but thousands of sea-fowl of every sort and kind, from the gull and sea-swallow to the mighty albatross. My approach was evidently regarded as an invasion and trespass, for they regularly beset me, screaming and wheeling over my head, till, out of all patience, I stood up and hit furiously about me with the boat-hook, when, rather to my surprise, one blow struck an albatross with such force that he fell stunned into the water. I now once more attempted to cross the reef by the narrow channel, and, happily succeeding, found myself in the open sea, and speeding homeward, joyfully saw our flag flying, and heard the welcome salute you fired. Here ended the narrative, but next morning Fritz drew me aside, and confided to me a most remarkable sequel in these words. There was something very extraordinary about that albatross, father. I allowed you to suppose that I left it as it fell, but in reality I raised it to the deck of the canoe, and then perceived a piece of rag wound round one of its legs. This I removed, and to my utter astonishment saw English words written on it, 
which I plainly made out to be, Save an unfortunate Englishwoman from the smoking rock. This little sentence sent a thrill through every nerve. My brain seemed to whirl. I doubted the evidence of my senses. Is this reality or delusion? thought I. Can it be true that a fellow creature breathes with us the air of this lonely region? I felt stupefied for some minutes. The bird began to show signs of life. Which recalled me to myself, and quickly deciding what must be done, I tore a strip from my handkerchief, on which I traced the words, Do not despair, help is near. This I carefully bound round one leg, replacing the rag on the other, and then applied myself to the complete restoration of the bird. It gradually revived, and after drinking a little, surprised me by suddenly rising on the wing, faltering a moment in its flight. And then rapidly disappearing from my view in a westerly direction. Now, father, one thought occupies me continually. Will my note ever reach this Englishwoman? Shall I be able to find and to save her? I listened to this account with feelings of the liveliest interest and astonishment. My dear son, said I, you have done wisely in confiding to me alone your most exciting discovery. Unless we know more, we must not unsettle the others by speaking of it, for it appears to me quite possible that these words were penned long ago on some distant shore, where, by this time, the unhappy stranger may have perished miserably. By the smoking rock must be meant a volcano. There are none here. Fritz was not disposed to look at the case from this gloomy point of view, did not think the rag so very old. Believed smoke might rise from a rock which was not volcanic, and evidently cherished the hope that he might be able to respond effectually to this touching appeal. I was in reality as anxious as himself on the subject, but judged it prudent to abate rather than excite hopes of success which might be doomed to bitter disappointment. After earnest consultation on the subject, we decided that Fritz should go in search of the writer of the message. But not until he had so altered the canoe as to fit it for carrying two persons, as well as provisions sufficient to admit of his absence for a considerable time. Impatient as he was, he could not but see the wisdom of this delay. We returned to the house and saw the boys busily opening the oysters, which they had had no time to do the previous night, and greatly excited as ever and anon a pearl was found. May we not establish a pearl fishery at once, father? shouted they. We might build a hut on the shore of the bay and set about it regularly. An excursion to Pearl Bay was now the event to which all thoughts turned, and for which preparations on a grand scale were made. It was to form, as it were, the basis of the more important voyage Fritz had in view, and to which, unsuspected by the rest, he could devote all his attention. I took an opportunity one day when all were present. To remark in a serious tone, I have been considering, dear wife, that our eldest son is now of an age to be dependent on himself. I shall, therefore, henceforth leave him at liberty to act in all respects according to his own judgment, and, especially in the matter of voyages or excursions, he must not be hampered by the fear of alarming us should he choose to remain absent longer than we expect. I have such entire confidence in his prudence. And at the same time, in his affection for us, that I am certain he will never needlessly cause us anxiety. Fritz looked gratefully toward me as I spoke, and his mother ratified my words, embracing him affectionately and saying, with emotion, God bless and preserve thee, my boy. It took some time to make several raking or scraping machines, which I invented for the purpose of detaching and lifting the oysters from their native rocks. But that gave Fritz leisure to change the fittings of his canoe so as to have a spare seat in it. His brothers naturally concluded that he meant to take one of them as shipmate on board, and he allowed the mistake to continue. They occupied themselves in making various articles they expected to be of use, and bore the delay with tolerable patience. At last came the day when, taking leave of the mother and Franz, we went on board the yacht, accompanied by some of the dogs. While Jack, proudly occupying the new seat beside Fritz in the canoe, shared with him the honor of leading the way in the character of pilots. 
we passed safely through the rocks and shoals near Walrus Island into an expanse of calm water, sheltered by jutting cliffs, where the sea glanced like a mirror, and for the first time we observed the fairy-like shells of the paper nautilus sailing lightly over the dazzling surface. It was impossible to see these lovely seafarers without wishing to obtain specimens, and the canoe accordingly gave chase, presently securing half a dozen, which were handed to us in the yacht, to be carefully preserved for the museum, and the place was ever after called Nautilus Creek. Further on we rounded a short promontory, flat, with an abrupt rock at the extremity, to which we gave the name of Cape Pugnose, and then at some distance appeared the grand cliffs of a headland, running far out to sea. This I suppose we should have to weather, but my pilots made no change in our course, and, following the canoe, we soon came in sight of the majestic archway, which offered us a short passage to Pearl Bay. The wonderfully architectural appearance of the pillars, arches, and pinnacles, surrounding and surmounting this noble entrance, struck me with admiration, resembling parts of a fine Gothic cathedral, and inducing me to propose for it the name Cape Minster. A perfect cloud of little swallows darted from the cavernous entrance on our approach, divided into flocks, soared, wheeled, flew right and left, and finally returned in a body as swiftly as they came, to the sides of the long dark tunnel, which were festooned with their nests. We detached a number of these as we passed, taking care to leave those containing eggs of young. The best were at a considerable height, but the broken shelving rocks afforded, in some places, footing for such daring and active climbers as Fritz and Jack, and they quickly obtained as many as we could possibly require. Our progress was much assisted by the tide, which, like a current, bore us onward along the nave of this natural cathedral. Aisles, transepts, screens, and side chapels appearing between the columns and arches, which in the dim religious light were revealed to our wondering eyes. On emerging into the dazzling sunshine we found ourselves floating in the calm expanse of Pearl Bay, but it was some minutes before we could look around on the bright and lovely scene. Fritz had not overrated its beauty, and the romantic islets which studded its waters seemed to give the effect of a pleasant smile, to features already perfect. We cruised about for some time, surveying the coast with its fertile meadows, shady groves, gently swelling hills and murmuring brooks, seeking a convenient landing place in the vicinity of the shallows where lay the oyster beds. This we found close to a sparkling streamlet, and as the day was fast declining, we made speedy arrangements for burning a watch fire, after which we partook of a hasty supper, and leaving the dogs with Coco the jackal to sleep on shore, we returned on board the yacht for the night, anchoring within gunshot of the land. The coast being quite strange to us, I knew not what wild beasts might frequent it, but, though I did not fear that any would approach us by swimming, yet I was glad to have with us our lively little ape, Mercury, the successor of our old favorite, Knips, long since gathered to his fathers, for he occupied at night a cosy berth on deck, and was certain to give vociferous notice, should anything alarming occur. Fritz moored the kayak alongside and came on board. The night passed in peace, although for a time we were disturbed by the yelping of jackals, with whom Coco persisted in keeping up a noisy conversation. We awoke at daybreak, and after breakfast, a la fourchette, we repaired in haste with nets, scrapers, and all other requisites to the oyster beds, where we worked with such diligence and success that in the course of two days we had an immense pile of shells built up like a stack on the beach, and left to decay. I collected a quantity of seaweed to spread over them, which was afterward burnt to make alkali, when we returned to secure our harvest of pearls. Every evening we went out shooting in the neighborhood, and kept ourselves supplied with game of one sort or another. The last day of our fishery we started earlier, intending to make a longer excursion into the woods. Ernest set off first with Floss, Jack and Coco strolling after them. Fritz and I were still employed in taking on board the last load of our tools, when we suddenly heard a shot, a loud cry of pain or fear, and then another shot. 
At the first alarm, the other two dogs rushed away from us toward the spot, and Fritz, who had just called Pounce from his perch to accompany us in the ramble, let him fly, and seizing his rifle, darted off in the same direction. Before I could reach the scene of action, more shots were heard, and then a shout of victory, after which appeared through the stems of the trees the disconsolate figure of Jack, hobbling along like a cripple, supported on each side by his brothers. When they came near me they stopped, and poor Jack, moaning and groaning, began to feel himself all over, as if to search for broken bones, crying out, I'm pounded like a half-crushed peppercorn. On examination I found some severe bruises. Who or what has been pummeling the boy? I exclaimed. One would think he had been beaten. It was a huge wild boar, said Ernest, with fierce eyes, monstrous tusks, and a snout as broad as my hand. We took Jack down to the yacht, bathed his bruises, gave him a cooling drink, and he soon fell fast asleep in his berth, where I left him, and returned to the shore. Now, Ernest, said I, enlighten me on the subject of this adventure. What you and the boar did is quite a mystery to me. Floss and I were going quietly along, replied he, when suddenly there was a rustling and snorting close by, and a great boar broke through the brushes, making for the outskirts of the wood. Floss gave chase directly, and the boar turned to bay. Then up came Jack with Coco, and the gallant little jackal attacked the monster in the rear. In another moment, however, he was sent sprawling upon his back, and this so provoked his master that he fired a hasty, ill-directed shot. The brute's notice and fury at once turned upon Jack, who prudently took to his heels, when I attempted to check the career of the boar by a shot, which, however, only slightly wounded it. Jack stumbled and fell over the root of a tree, just as the animal came up with him. Help! Murder! shouted he, and if the other dogs had not then arrived, and altogether tackled the boar, I fear it would have been a case of murder indeed. As it was, the poor fellow got mauled and trampled upon dreadfully. As I was waiting for an opportunity to fire without any risk of hitting Jack, Pounce rushed through the air and darted upon the beast, and Fritz came up quickly and shot it dead with a pistol. While we were helping Jack along and passing a place where the boar had been grubbing, I noticed some such curious knotty roots or tubercles that I brought away specimens. Are they worth anything, do you think? They have a strong smell. If I may trust my nose, said I, you have brought something by no means to be despised. Yes, I continued, putting them to my lips. These are very fine truffles. Taste them, Fritz. Indeed, they are excellent, said he, very different from the tough, leathery things I remember in Europe. These are tender and well flavored. Because they are fresh, said I, you have before tasted those only which have been brought from a distance. They are found in different parts of Europe, buried at a depth of ten or twelve inches in the soil of oak or beech woods. A small dog is employed to hunt for them, who perceives their musky odor in a singularly acute way, and at once scratches on the spot where they lie. Have the truffles no leaves or stalks, inquired Fritz, by which they might be found without the help of the dog? They have nothing of the sort, I replied. They are discovered simply by scent, and are considered to belong to the tribe of fungi. By this time it was late. We took supper, and made up the watch-fire, and withdrew to our yacht, where we slept peacefully. Early next morning we proceeded to visit the field of battle. The wild boar, which I had not before seen, proved to be much larger and more formidable in appearance than I had imagined, and Jack's escape seemed to be perfectly marvellous. The boys took it as a matter of course that we were to cut out hams and flitches, and we therefore did so, though I warned them that they need not expect much pleasure in eating bacon from a tough old African boar like this. We conveyed the mighty hams to the beach, each on a sledge of plaited boughs and twigs, and drawn by one of the dogs. The monstrous head travelled in the same way, and we collected a large number of truffles before quitting the forest. As soon as the dogs were released, they rushed back to the scene of operations in the wood, comprehending that they were now free to feast on what remained there. There was so much to be done in the consequence of this affair that Fritz, who had hoped to set out on his solitary expedition that day, deferred it until the next, and was, therefore, fortunately with us, when, late in the evening, we desisted from our labors, 
and having supped, were preparing to retire to rest. All at once a deep, fearful sound echoed through the neighboring woods. It made our blood curdle in our veins. We listened with straining ears, hoping it would not be repeated. With a shudder we heard the dread voice roar again, yet nearer to us, and an answer peal from the distance. "'We must find out who are the performers in this concert,' exclaimed Fritz, springing to his feet and snatching up his rifle. "'Make the fire blaze. Get on board the yacht and have all the guns in readiness. I am off to reconnoiter in the canoe.' We mechanically obeyed his rapid orders, while the bold youth disappeared in the darkness, and after heaping fuel on the fire we went on board, and armed ourselves with cutlasses, besides loading all the guns, waiting in readiness either to land again, or to quit the coast. We presently saw the whole pack of our dogs, as well as Coco the Jackal, and the little ape Mercury, who had been tempted by the truffles to stay with them in the woods, come galloping at full speed up to the fire. Mercury was evidently excessively discomposed at finding us gone. He gnashed his teeth and chattered, as though in fear, looking hopelessly at the water, through which he could not venture. The dogs planted themselves by the fire, gazing fixedly landward, with ears erect, and occasionally uttering a barking challenge or a suppressed howl. Meantime the horrid roarings approached nearer, and I concluded that a couple of leopards or panthers had been attracted by the scent of the boar's carcass. But not long after I had expressed this opinion, we beheld a large, powerful animal spring from the underwood, and with a bound and muttered roar, approach the fire. In a moment I recognized the unmistakable outlines of the form of a lion, though in size he far surpassed any I had ever seen exhibited in Europe. The dogs slunk behind the fire, and the lion seated himself almost like a cat on his hind legs, glaring alternately at them and at the great boar-hams which hung near, with doubtless a mixed feeling of irritation and appetite, which was testified by the restless movement of his tail. He then arose, and commenced walking up and down with a slow and measured pace, occasionally uttering short angry roars, quite unlike the prolonged full tones we had heard at first. At times he went to drink at the brook, always returning with such haste, that I fully expected to see him spring. Gradually his manner became more and more threatening. He turned toward us, crouched, and with his body at full stretch waved his tail, and glared so furiously that I was in doubt whether to fire or retreat, when through the darkness rang the sharp crack of a rifle. "'That is Fritz!' exclaimed every one, while with a fearful roar the lion sprang to his feet, stood stock still, tottered, sank on his knees, rolled over, and lay motionless on the sand. "'We are saved!' I cried. "'That was a masterly shot. The lion is struck to the heart. He will never stir again. Stay on board, boys. I must join my brave Fritz.' In a few moments I landed. The dogs met me with evident tokens of pleasure, but kept whining uneasily, and looking toward the deep darkness of the woods whence the lion had come. This behavior made me cautious, and— Seeing nothing of Fritz, I lingered by the boat, when suddenly a lioness bounded from the shadow of the trees into the light diffused by the fire. At sight of the blazing faggots she paused, as though startled, passed with uncertain step round the outskirts of the illuminated circle, and uttered roarings which were evidently calls to her mate, whose dead body she presently discovered. Finding him motionless, her manner betokened the greatest concern, she touched him with her forepaws, smelt round him, and licked his bleeding wounds. Then, raising her head, she gnashed her teeth, and gave forth the most lamentable and dreadful sound I ever heard, a mingled roar and howl, which was like the expression of grief, rage, and a vow to be revenged, all in one. Crack! Another shot! The creature's right forepaw was lamed, and the dogs, seeing me raise my gun, suddenly gathered courage, and ran forward just as I fired. My shot also wounded the lioness, but not mortally, and the most terrific combat ensued. It was impossible to fire again for fear of wounding the dogs. The scene was fearful beyond description. Black night surrounded us. The fitful blaze of the fire shed a strange, unnatural light on the prostrate body of the huge dead lion, and on the wounded lioness, 
who fought desperately against the attack of the four gallant dogs, while the cries, roars, and groans of anguish and fury uttered by all the animals were enough to try the stoutest nerves. Old Juno, staunch to the last, was foremost in the fray. After a time I saw her change her plan of attack, and spring at the throat of the lioness, who in an instant raised her left paw, and at one blow the cruel claws had laid open the body of the dog, and destroyed the life of the true and faithful companion of so many years. Just then Fritz appeared. The lioness was much weakened, and we ventured to go near enough to fire with safety to ourselves, and finally I dispatched her by plunging a hunting knife deep in her breast. Ernest and Jack were summoned from the yacht to witness the completed victory, and I regretted having left them on board when I saw how greatly the noise and tumult had alarmed them, unable as they were to ascertain what was going on. They hastened toward us in great agitation, and their joy on seeing us safe was only equalled by the grief they felt on learning the death of Juno. The night was now far advanced. The fire burnt low, but we piled on more wood, and, by the renewed light, drew poor Juno from between the paws of the lioness, and by the brookside washed and bound up the torn body, wrapped it carefully in canvas, and carrying it with us on board the yacht, that it might be buried at Rockburg, whither on the following day it was our purpose to return. Wearied and sorrowful, but full of thankfulness for our personal safety, we at length lay down to sleep, having brought all the dogs on board. Next morning, before quitting Pearl Bay, we once more landed, that we might possess ourselves of the magnificent skins of the lion and lioness, whose visit, fatal to themselves, had caused such a commotion during the night. In about a couple of hours we returned to the yacht, leaving the flayed carcasses to the tender mercies of the birds of prey, sure to be attracted to them. "'Homeward bound!' sang out the boys, as they cheerily weighed anchor, and prepared to stand out to sea. I could see, though he did not complain, that poor Jack had not recovered from the boar's rough treatment, and moved very stiffly. "'You must pilot us through the channel in the reef this time, Fritz,' said I, adding in a lower tone. "'And then is it to be farewell, my son?' "'Yes, dear father, au revoir,' returned he, brightly, with a glance full of meaning, while he threw into his canoe a cushion and a fur cloak." "'Thanks, Fritz, but I'm going to honor them with the care of my battered bones in the yacht here. "'You are awfully considerate, though, old fellow,' remarked Jack, "'not for a moment doubting that his brother expected him to return as he came, beside him in the kayak. "'Fritz laughed and commended his decision. "'Then, springing into his skiff, he led the way toward the open sea. "'We followed, carefully, and soon passed the reef, "'after which the boys were very busy with the sails, putting the vessel on the homeward course, when, waving his hand to me, Fritz turned in the opposite direction, and quickly vanished beyond the point, which I afterward named Cape Farewell. When missed by his brothers, I said he had a fancy to explore more of the coast, and if he found it interesting, he might, instead of only a few hours, remain absent for two or three days. Toward evening, we sailed into Safety Bay. The mother and Franz, though somewhat startled by the unexpected absence of Fritz, were delighted to see us return safely, and listened with eager interest to our adventures. My wife shuddered, and scarcely suppressed an involuntary scream, as she heard of our desperate encounter with the lion and his mate. Jack's danger and providential escape, too, made her tremble, and so pale did he still look, that she could scarcely believe he was uninjured. Tears came into Franz's eyes when he heard of the sad death of poor old Juno, and he inquired most tenderly whether her remains had been brought back, that they might be interred near the house which had been her home for so many years. Next day he saw her buried carefully, and Ernest, at his request, produced an epitaph, which was inscribed upon a slab of stone above her grave. Juno, a servant true lies here, a faithful friend, a dog, to all most dear, who met her end fighting right bravely in her master's cause. The flesh of the wild boar and the truffles were handed over to the mother, who received them with delight, 
promising us there from many a savoury dish. She would fain have had the boar's head, too, but my word was pledged to Ernest that it should adorn his museum, and, though my lips watered to taste it baked in hottentot fashion, I would not break my promise. This splendid head, therefore, together with the lion's skins, we carried to the tannery on Whale Island, where they were cleaned and dressed. Five days passed, but Fritz still remained absent. I could not conceal my anxiety, and at length determined to follow him. All were delighted at the proposal, and even the mother, when she heard that we were to sail in the pinnace, agreed to accompany us. The boat was stored, and on a bright morning with a favourable breeze, we five, with the dogs, stepped aboard, and ran for Cape Minster. Our beautiful little yacht bounded over the water gaily, and the bright sunshine and delicious sea-breeze put us all in the highest spirits. The entrance of the archway was in sight, and thither I was directing the boat's course. Suddenly, right ahead, I saw a dark and shadowy mass just below the surface of the water. A sunken rock, I thought to myself, and yet it is strange that I never before noticed it. I put down the helm in a moment, but a catastrophe seemed inevitable. We surged ahead, a slight shock, and all was over. The danger was past. I glanced astern to look again at the dangerous spot, but the rock was gone, and, where but a moment before I had distinctly seen its great green shadow, I could now see nothing. Before we had recovered from our amazement, a shout from Jack surprised me. "'There is another!' he exclaimed. "'To starboard, father!' Sure enough, there lay, apparently, another sunken rock. "'The rock is moving!' shouted Franz, and a great black body emerged from the sea, while from the upper extremity rushed a column of water, which, with a mighty noise, rose upward, and then fell like rain all around. The mystery was explained, for as the great beast emerged yet further from the water, I recognized, from its enormous size and great length of head, the cachalot whale. The monster was apparently enraged at the way we had scratched his back, for, retreating to a short distance, he evidently meditated a rush upon us. Fearful stories occurred to me of the savage temper of this whale, how he has been known to destroy boat after boat, and even ships, and with a feeling of desperation I sprang to one of the guns. Jack leaped to the other, and almost simultaneously we fired. Both shots apparently took effect, for the whale, after lashing the water violently for a few seconds, plunged beneath its surface and disappeared. We kept a sharp lookout for him, for I was unwilling to lose such a valuable prize, and, reloading, stood toward the shore, in which direction he was apparently making. Presently we again sighted him in shallow water, lashing fearfully with his tail, and dyeing the waves around him with blood. Approaching the infuriate animal as nearly as I dared, we again fired. The struggles of the whale seemed for a few moments to become even yet more frantic, and then, with a quiver from head to tail, he lay motionless, dead. The boys were about to raise the cry of victory, but checked the shout upon their very lips, for, darting behind a rock, they espied a canoe paddled by a tall and muscular savage, who now stood up in his skiff and appeared to be examining us attentively. Seeing that we were standing toward him, the swarthy native seized his paddle and again darted behind a rock. An awful thought now took possession of me. There must be a tribe of blacks lurking on these shores, and Fritz must have fallen into their hands. We, however, I determined, should not be easily taken, and our guns were loaded and run out. Presently a dusky face appeared, peeping at us from a lofty rock. It vanished, and we saw another peeping at us from lower down. Then again the skiff put out as though to make a further reconnoitre. All! Even Jack looked anxious, and glanced at me for orders. "'Hoist a white flag,' said I, "'and hand me the speaking-trumpet.' I seized the instrument, and uttered such peaceable words in the Malay language as I could recall. Neither the flag nor my words seemed to produce any effect, and the savage was about to return to the shore. Jack hereupon lost patience, and in his turn took up the trumpet." "'Come here, you black son of a gun!' he exclaimed. "'Come on board and make friends, or we'll blow you and your—' 
"'Stop, stop, you foolish boy,' I said. "'You will but alarm the man with your wild words and gestures.' "'No, but see,' he cried, "'he is paddling toward us.' And sure enough, the canoe was rapidly approaching. Presently a cry from Franz alarmed me. "'Look, look!' he shrieked. "'The villain is in Fritz's kayak. "'I can see the walrus's head.' Ernest alone remained unmoved. He took the speaking trumpet. "'Fritz, ahoy!' he shouted. "'Welcome, old fellow!' The words were scarcely out of his mouth when I, too, recognized the well-known face beneath its dusky disguise. In another minute the brave boy was on board, and in spite of his blackened face was kissed and welcomed heartily. He was now assailed with a storm of questions from all sides. Where had he been? What had kept him so long? And why had he turned Blackamoor? The last question, replied he with a smile, is the only one I will now answer. The other shall be explained when I give a full account of my adventures. Hearing guns fired, my mind was instantly filled with ideas of melee pirates, for I never dreamed that you could be here in the yacht, so I disguised myself as you now see me, and came forth to reconnoitre. When you addressed me in melee, you only added to my terror, for it left not a doubt in my mind that you were pirates. Having in our turn described to him our adventure with the cachalot whale, I asked him if he knew of a suitable spot for the anchorage of the yacht. "'Certainly,' he replied, casting toward me a glance full of meaning. "'I can lead you to an island where there is a splendid anchorage, and which is itself well worth seeing, for it contains all sorts of strange things.' And after removing the stains from his skin, and turning himself once more into a civilized being, he again sprang into his canoe, and piloted us to a picturesque little island in the bay. Now that there could be no doubt as to the success of Fritz's expedition, I no longer hesitated to give my wife an account of his project, and to prepare her mind for the surprise which awaited her. She was greatly startled, as I expected, and seemed almost overcome with emotion at the idea of seeing a human being, and that being one of her own sex. "'But why?' she asked. "'Did you not tell me of this at first? "'Why wait until the last moment with such joyful news?' I was unwilling, I replied, to raise hopes which might never be realized, but now, thank heaven, he has succeeded, and there is no need for concealment. The boys could not at all understand the evident air of mystery and suppressed excitement which neither their mother, Fritz, nor I could entirely conceal. They cast glances of the greatest curiosity toward the island, and as soon as the sails were furled and the anchor dropped, they sprang eagerly ashore. In a body we followed Fritz, maintaining perfect silence. Presently we emerged from the thicket through which we were passing, and saw before us a hut of sheltering boughs, at the entrance of which burned a cheerful fire. Into this leafy bower Fritz dived, leaving his brothers without, mute with astonishment. In another moment he emerged, leading by the hand a slight, handsome youth, by his dress apparently a young English naval officer. The pair advanced to meet us, and Fritz, with a countenance radiant with joy, briefly introduced his companion as Edward Montrose. And, he continued, looking at his mother and me, will you not welcome him as a friend and a brother to our family circle? That we will indeed, I exclaimed, advancing and holding out my hands to the fair young stranger. Our wild life may have roughened our looks and manners, but it has not hardened our hearts, I trust. The mother, too, embraced the seeming youth most heartily. The lads, and even the dogs, were not behindhand in testifying their gratification at the appearance of their new friend, the former delighted at the idea of a fresh companion, and the latter won by her sweet voice and appearance. From the expression made use of by Fritz, I perceived that the girl wished her sex to remain unrevealed to the rest of the party, until the mother could obtain for her a costume more suited to her real character. The young men then ran down to the yacht to bring up what was necessary for supper, as well as to make preparations for a camp in which we might spend the night. This done, the mother hastened to set before us a substantial meal, while the boys, anxious to make their new acquaintance feel at home among them, were doing their best to amuse her. She herself, after the first feeling of strangeness had worn off, 
entered fully into all their fun, and by the time they sat down to supper was laughing and chattering as gaily as any one of the rest. She admired the various dishes, tasted our mead, and, without alluding once to her previous life, kept up a lively conversation. The mere fact of meeting with any human being after so many years of isolation was in itself sufficient to raise the boys to the greatest state of excitement, but that this being should be one so handsome, so gay, so perfectly charming, seemed completely to have turned their heads, and when I gave the sign for breaking up of the feast, and their new friend was about to be led to the night quarters which had been prepared for her on board the yacht, the health of Edward Montrose was proposed, and drank in fragrant mead, amid the cheers and exclamations of all hands. When she was gone, and silence had been restored, Jack exclaimed, "'Now then, Fritz, if you please, just tell me where you came across this jolly fellow. Did you take your mysterious voyage in search of him, or did you meet him by chance? Out with your adventures while we sit comfortably round the fire.' So saying, Jack cast more wood upon the blazing pile, and throwing himself down in his usual careless fashion, prepared to listen attentively. Fritz, after a few moments' hesitation, began. "'Perhaps you remember,' said he, "'how, when I returned from my expedition in the kayak the other day, I struck down an albatross. None but my father at the time knew, however, what became of the wounded bird, or even thought more about it. Yet it was that albatross who brought me notice of the shipwrecked stranger, and he, too, I determined, should carry back a message, to cheer and encourage the sender. I first, as you know, prepared my kayak to carry two persons, and then, with a heart full of hope and trust, left you and the yacht, and, with pounce seated before me, made for the open sea. For several hours I paddled steadily on, till, the wind freshening, I thought it advisable to keep in nearer shore, that should a regular storm arise I might find some sheltered bay in which to weather it. It was well I did so, for scarcely had I reached a quiet cove which promised to afford me the protection I desired, than the sea appeared one mass of foam, great surging waves arose, and even in the comparative calm of the bay I felt that I was in some danger. I passed the night in my kayak, and next morning, after a frugal meal of pemmican, and a draught of water from my flask, once more ventured forth. The wind had subsided, and the sea was tolerably smooth, and, keeping my eyes busily employed in seeking in every direction to detect, if possible, the slightest trace of smoke or other sign of human life, I paddled on till noon. The aspect of the coast now began to change. The shores were sandy, while further inland lay dense forests, from whose gloomy depths I could ever and anon hear the fierce roar of beasts of prey, the yell of apes, the fiendish laugh of the hyena, or the despairing death-cry of a hapless deer. Seldom have I experienced a greater feeling of solitude than while listening to these strange sounds, and knowing that I, in this frail canoe, was the only human being near. Giving myself up to contemplation, I rested on my paddle, and allowed my kayak to drift slowly on. As I neared the shore, I noticed a large number of stranger-looking birds, who would sometimes flutter round me, and then dart back again to the border of the forest, where they were feeding on what appeared to be the pepper plant. They seized the berries in their great ponderous beaks, threw them up in the air, and then dexterously caught them in their fall. Their beaks were really something extraordinary. They looked as though they must give their owners a perpetual headache from their immense weight. The only thing that relieved the extreme ugliness of these great appendages was their gorgeous color, which was only rivaled by the gay hue of the plumage. I wished now that I had brought home a specimen, but at the time I was so much amused by watching the grotesque antics of the birds that I did not think of obtaining one. When I left the spot, I settled in my own mind that they were toucans. Was I right, Ernest? The professor, unwilling to interrupt the narrative, merely gave an oracular nod, and Fritz continued. For some hours after this I paddled quickly on, sometimes passing the mouth of a stream, sometimes that of a broad river. Had I been merely on an exploring expedition, I should have been tempted, doubtless, 
to cruise a little way up one of these pathways into the forest, but now such an idea did not enter my head. On, 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 I felt I must go, until I should reach the goal of my voyage. The shades of night at length drew on, and, finding a sheltered cove, I moored my kayak and stepped on shore. You may imagine how pleasant it was to stretch my legs, after sitting for so long in the cramped position which my kayak enforces. It would not do, however, to sleep on shore, so after preparing and enjoying my supper I returned on board, and there spent the night. Next morning Pounce and I again landed for breakfast. I lit my fire, and hung before it a plump young parrot to roast. As I was so doing I heard a slight rustle among the long grass behind me. I glanced round, and there, with glaring eyes, and his great tail swaying to and fro, I saw an immense tiger. In another moment his spring would have been made, I should have been no more, and our young guest would have been doomed to, God only knows how many years of frightful solitude. My gun was lying by my side. Before I could have stooped to pick it up, the monster would have seized me. Pounce saw and comprehended my danger. The heroic bird darted upon my enemy, and so blinded him with his flapping wings and the fierce blows of his beak, that his spring was checked, and I had time to recover my self-possession. I seized my gun and fired, and the brute, pierced to the heart, gave one spring, and then rolled over at my feet. My enemy was dead, but beside him, alas, lay poor Pounce, crushed and lifeless. One blow of the great beast's paw had struck him down, never to rise again. Fritz's voice shook as he came to this point, and after remaining silent for a moment or two, he continued hurriedly. With a sad and desolate feeling at my heart, I buried the faithful bird where he had met his death, and then, unable longer to continue near the spot, I returned to my kayak, and, leaving the great tiger lying where he fell, paddled hastily away. My thoughts were gloomy. I felt as though, now that my companion was gone, I could no longer continue the voyage. The albatross, I thought, may have flown for hundreds of miles before it reached me. This stranger may be on different shores from these entirely. Every stroke of my paddle may be carrying me further from the blazing signal. Who knows? This feeling of discouragement was not, however, to be of long duration, for in a moment more a sight presented itself which banished all my doubts and fears, and raised me to the highest pitch of excitement. A high point of land lay before me. I rounded it, and beyond found a calm and pleasant bay, from whose curved and thickly wooded shores ran out a reef of rocks. From the point of this reef rose a column of smoke, steadily and clearly curling upward in the calm air. I could scarcely believe my senses, but stopped gazing at it, as though I were in a dream. Then, with throbbing pulse and giddy brain, I seized my paddle, and strained every nerve to reach it. A few strokes seemed to carry me across the bay, and, securing my canoe, I leaped upon the rock, on which the beacon was blazing, but not a sign of a human being could I see. I was about to shout, for as the fire had evidently been recently piled up, I knew the stranger could not be far off. But before I could do so, I saw a slight figure passing along the chain of rocks toward the spot on which I stood. You may all imagine my sensations. I advanced a few paces, and then, mastering my emotion as best I could, I said in English, Welcome, fair stranger. God in his mercy has heard your call, and has sent me to your aid. Miss Montrose came quickly forward. Who? What? shouted the boys, interrupting the narrative. Who came forward? And, amid a general hubbub, Ernest, rising and advancing to his brother, said in his quiet way, I did not like to make any remark till you actually let out the secret, Fritz, but we need no longer pretend not to see through the disguise of Edward Montrose. Fritz, though much disconcerted by the discovery of the secret, recovered his self-possession, and, after bearing with perfect equanimity the jokes with which his brothers assailed him, joined in three cheers for their new sister, and when the confusion and laughter which ensued had subsided, continued his story. 
Miss Montrose grasped my hands warmly, and, guessing from my pronunciation, I am afraid, that I was not in the habit of speaking English every day of my life, said in French, Long, long have I waited since the bird returned with your message. Thank God you have come at last. Then, with tears of joy and gratitude, she led me to the shore, where she had built a hut and a safe sleeping place, like Falconhurst on a small scale, among the branches of a tree. I was delighted with all she showed me, for indeed her hut and its fittings evinced no ordinary skill and ingenuity. Round the walls hung bows, arrows, lances, and bird snares, while on her work table, in boxes and cases, carved skillfully with a knife, were fish hooks of mother of pearl, needles made from fish bones, and bodkins from the beaks of birds, fishing lines of all sorts, and knives and other tools. These latter, she told me, were, with a chest of wearing apparel, almost the only things washed ashore after the wreck, when three years ago she was cast alone upon this desolate coast. I marveled more and more at the wonderful way in which this girl had surmounted obstacles, the quarter of which would completely have appalled the generality of her sex. The hut itself was a marvel of skill. Stout posts had been driven into the ground with cross pieces of bamboo to form a framework. The walls had been woven with reeds, the roof thatched with palm leaves, and the whole plastered smoothly with clay, an open space being left in the center of the roof for a chimney to carry off the smoke of the fire. As we entered, a cormorant, with a cry of anger, flew from under the table toward me and was about to attack me fiercely. Miss Montrose called it off, and she then told me she had captured and tamed the bird soon after first landing, and since that time had contrived to train it to assist her in every conceivable way. It now not only was a pleasant companion, but brought her food of every description fish, flesh, and fowl for whether it dived into the waters, according to its natural habit, struck down birds upon the wing, or seized rabbits and other small animals upon the land, it laid all its booty at her feet. Before darkness closed in, all the curiosities and ingenious contrivances of the place had been displayed. The kitchen stove, cooking utensils, skin bottles, shell plates and spoons, the fishing raft, and numberless other things, and then, sitting down with my fair hostess to a most appetizing meal, she gave me a short account of her life. Jenny Montrose was the daughter of a British officer, who had served for many years in India, where she herself was born. At the early age of three years she lost her mother. After the death of his wife, all the colonel's love and care was centered upon his only child. Under his eye she was instructed in all the accomplishments suited to her sex, and from him she imbibed an ardent love of field sports. By the time she was seventeen, she was as much at home upon her horse in the field as in her father's drawing room. Colonel Montrose now received orders to return home with his regiment, and as for certain reasons he did not wish her to accompany him in the ship with the troops, he obtained a passage for her on board a vessel which was about to sail at the same time. The separation was extremely painful to both the old soldier and his daughter, but there was no alternative. They parted, and Miss Montrose sailed in the Dorcas for England. A week after she had left Calcutta, a storm arose and drove the vessel far out of her course. More bad weather ensued, and at length, leaks having been sprung in all directions, the crew were obliged to take to the boats. Jenny obtained a place in one of the largest of these. After enduring the perils of the sea for many days, land was sighted, and, the other boats having disappeared, an attempt was made to land. The boat was capsized, and Miss Montrose alone reached the shore. For a long time she lay upon the sand almost inanimate, but, reviving sufficiently to move, she at length obtained some shellfish, and by degrees recovered her strength. From that time forth until I appeared, she never set eyes upon a human being. To attract any passing vessel, and obtain assistance, however, she kept a beacon continually blazing at the end of the reef, and, with the same purpose in view, 
attached missives to the feet of any birds she could take alive in her snares. The albatross, she told me, she had kept for some time, and partially tamed. But, as it was in the habit of making long excursions on its own account, she conceived the idea of sending it also with a message, that should it by chance be seen and taken alive, it might return with an answer. Our supper was over, and at length, both wearied out with the anxieties and excitement of the day, we retired to rest, she to her leafy bower, and I to sleep in the hut below. Next morning, having packed her belongings in the kayak, we both went on board, and, bidding adieu to her well-known bay, she took her seat before me, and I made for home. We should have reached Rockburg this evening had not an accident occurred to our skiff, and compelled us to put in at this island. The boat was scarcely repaired when I heard your first shots. I instantly disguised myself, and, never doubting that Malay pirates were near, came forth to reconnoitre. Glad indeed I was to find my fears ungrounded. All had listened attentively to Fritz's story, but now a dreadful yawn from Franz, followed by others from Jack, Ernest, and Fritz, and a great desire on my own part to follow their example, warned me that it was time to dismiss the party for the night. Fritz retired to his kayak, the boys and I to the deck of the yacht, and the remainder of the night passed quietly away. Next morning, as we assembled for breakfast, I took the opportunity of begging Miss Montrose no longer to attempt to continue her disguise, but to allow us to address her in her real character. Jenny smiled, for she had noticed, as the young men met her when she came from the cabin, a great alteration in their manner, and had at once seen that her secret was guessed. After all, she said, I need not be ashamed of this attire. It has been my only costume for the last three years, and in any other I should have been unable to manage all the work which during that time has been necessary. Our pleasant meal over, I prepared to start for home, but Fritz reminded me of the cachalot, and although he confessed he should not care to repeat the operation of cutting up a whale, he thought it would be a pity to lose such a chance of obtaining a supply of spermaceti. I fully agreed with him, and, embarking, we quickly reached the sandbank on which the monster lay. No sooner did we come near than the dogs leaped ashore, and before we could follow rushed round to the other side of the great beast, snarling, growling, and howling ensued, and when we reached the spot we found a terrific combat going on. A troop of wolves were disputing fiercely with the dogs their right to the prey. Our appearance, however, quickly settled the matter. Two of the brutes already lay dead, and those that now escaped our guns galloped off. Among the pack were a few jackals, and no sooner did Coco catch sight of these, his relations, than, suddenly attracted by his instinct, he left his master's side, and in spite of our shouts and cries, joined them, and disappeared into the forest. As it would have been useless and dangerous to attempt to follow the deserter into the woods, we left him alone, trusting that he would return before we again embarked. Fritz then climbed up the mountain of flesh, and, with his hatchet, quickly laid open the huge skull. Jack and Franz joined him, Ernest having remained on the island where we had left the mother and Jenny, and with buckets assisted him to bail out the spermaceti. The few vessels we possessed were soon full, and having stored them in the yacht, we once more embarked, and arrived at the little island shortly before the dinner hour. A capital meal had been prepared for us, and, when we had made ourselves presentable, we sat down to it, and related our adventures. The account of Coco's desertion was received with exclamations of surprise and sorrow. Yet, said Jenny, after a time, I do not think you should despair of his recovery, for animals in their native state seldom care to allow those that have been once domesticated to consort with them. My poor albatross even, though he was never thoroughly tamed, and certainly did finally desert me, yet used to return at intervals, and I am pretty sure that were you, Jack, to search the wood early tomorrow morning, you would find your pet only too willing to come back to civilized life. Or, if you like, I will go myself and find him, for I should immensely like to have a paddle in the kayak all by myself. 
Jack was delighted at the former suggestion, and though he would not listen for a moment to Jenny's request to be allowed to go alone, he agreed, if she cared for the fun of an early cruise, to accompany her in the canoe next morning, and to return to the yacht in time to start for Rockburg. At sunrise they were off, armed with bait in the shape of meat and biscuit, and a muzzle and chain which Jack had manufactured in the evening to punish the runagate for his offences should they catch him. Arrived at the sandbank, they landed, and, after entering the forest and shouting, Coco! Coco! till the woods rang again, they presently espied the truant, slouching disconsolately toward them, looking very miserable and heartily ashamed of himself. With torn ears and coat ruffled and dirty, he sneaked up. There was no need to use the bait to entice him, and when the poor beast thus came, unhappy and begging forgiveness, Jack had not the heart to degrade him further with the muzzle and chain. He had evidently attempted to join his wild brethren, and by them had been scouted, worried, and hustled, as no true jackal, and, as Jenny had foretold, was now only too glad to return to bondage and to comfort. Poor Coco had recovered his spirits slightly by the time the yacht was reached, and after a hearty meal, again took his place among the dogs, whom I had little doubt he would never again desert. All was now bustle and activity, and breakfast over we went aboard the yacht. Fritz and Jack stepped into the canoe, and we soon left Fair Isle and Pearl Bay far behind. The morning was delightful. The sea, excepting for the slight ripple raised by the gentle breeze wafting us homeward, was perfectly calm. Slowly and contentedly we glided on through the wonders of the splendid archway, threaded our passage among the rocks and shoals, and passed out to the open sea. So slowly did we make our way, that the occupants of the kayak announced that they could not wait for us when they had once piloted us out from among the shoals and reefs, and plied their paddles to such good purpose that they were soon out of sight. Nautilus Bay and Cape Pugnose were in due time past, however, and Shark Island hove in sight. With great astonishment, Jenny gazed at our watchtower, with its guard house, the fierce looking guns, and the waving flag upon the heights. We landed that she might visit the fortification, when we displayed all our arrangements with great pride. When they and the herd of lovely gazelles had been sufficiently admired, we again embarked and steered toward Deliverance Bay. On reaching the entrance, a grand salute of twelve shots welcomed us and our fair guest to Rockburg. Not pleased with the even number, however, Ernest insisted upon replying with thirteen guns, an odd number being, he declared, absolutely necessary for form's sake. As we neared the quay, Fritz and Jack stood ready to receive us, and with true politeness handed their mother and Jenny ashore. They turned and led the way to the house through the gardens, orchards, and shrubberies which lay on the rising ground that sloped gently upward to our dwelling. Jenny's surprise was changed to wonder as she neared the villa itself, its broad shady balcony, its fountains sparkling in the sun, the dovecots, the pigeons wheeling above, and the bright fresh creepers twined round the columns delighted her. She could scarcely believe that she was still far from any civilized nation, and that she was among a family wrecked like herself upon a lonely coast. My amazement, however, fully equaled that of my little daughter when, beneath the shade of the veranda, I saw a table laid out with a delicious luncheon. All our china, silver, and glass had been called into requisition, and was arranged upon the spotless damask cloth. Wine sparkled in the decanters. Splendid pineapples, oranges, guavas, apples, and pears, resting on cool green leaves, lay heaped in pyramids upon the porcelain dishes. A haunch of venison, cold fowl, hams, and tongues occupied the ends and sides of the table, while in the center rose a vase of gay flowers, surrounded by bowls of milk and great jugs of mead. It was indeed a perfect feast, and the heartiness of the welcome brought tears of joy into the lovely eyes of the fair girl in whose honor it had been devised. 
All were soon ready to sit down, and Jenny, looking prettier than ever in the dress for which she had exchanged her sailor suit, took the place of honor between the mother and me. Ernest and Franz also seated themselves, but nothing would induce Fritz and Jack to follow their example. They considered themselves our entertainers, and waited upon us most attentively, carving the joints, filling our glasses, and changing the plates, for, as Jack declared to Miss Montrose, the servants had all run away in our absence, and for the next day or two, perhaps, we should be obliged to wait upon ourselves. When the banquet was over, and the waiters had satisfied their appetites, they joined their brothers, and with them displayed all the wonders of Rockburg to their new sister. To the house, cave, stables, gardens, fields, and boathouses, to one after the other did they lead her. Not a corner would they have left unnoticed, had not the mother, fearing they would tire the poor girl out, come to the rescue, and led her back to the house. On the following day, after an early breakfast, we started, while it was yet cool, for Falconhurst, and as I knew that repairs and arrangements for the coming winter would be necessary, and would detain us for several days, we took with us a supply of tools, as well as baskets of provisions, and other things essential to our comfort. The whole of our stud, excepting the ostrich, were in their paddocks near the tree, but Jack, saying that his mother and Jenny really must not walk the whole way, to the great amusement of the latter, leaped on hurry, and fled away in front of us. Before we had accomplished one quarter of the distance, we heard the thundering tread of many feet galloping down the avenue, and presently espied our motley troop of steeds being driven furiously toward us. Storm, Lightfoot, Swift, Grumble, Stentor, Arrow, and Dart were there, with Jack on his fleet two-legged courser at their heels. At his saddle-bow hung a cluster of saddles and bridles, the bits all jangling and clanking, adding to the din and confusion, and urging on the excited animals who thoroughly entered into the fun, and with tails in the air, ears back, and heels ever and anon thrown playfully out, seemed about to overwhelm us. We stepped aside to shelter ourselves behind trees from the furious onset, but a shout from Fritz brought the whole herd to a sudden halt, and Jack spurred toward us. "'Which of the cattle shall we saddle for you, Jenny?' he shouted. "'They're all as gentle as lambs and as active as cats. Every one has been ridden by mother and knows what a side-saddle means, so you can't go wrong.' To his great delight, Jenny quickly showed her appreciation of the merits of the steeds by picking out Dart, the fleetest and most spirited in the whole stud. The ostrich was then relieved of his unusual burden, the animals were speedily equipped, and Lightfoot bearing the baskets and hampers, the whole party mounted and trotted forward. Jenny was delighted with her palfrey, and henceforward he was reserved for her special use. The work at Falconhurst, as I had expected, occupied us for some time, and it was a week before we could again return to Rockburg. Yet the time passed pleasantly, for though the young men were busy from morning to night, the presence of their new companion, her lively spirits and gay conversation, kept them in constant good humor. When the repairs were all finished, we remained yet a day or two longer, that we might make excursions in various directions to bring in poultry from woodlands, stores of acorns for the pigs, and grass, willows, and canes, to be manufactured during the winter into mats, baskets, hurdles, and hen-coops. Many a shower wetted us through during these days, and we had scarcely time to hurry back to Rockburg and house our cattle and possessions before the annual deluge began. Never before had this dreary season seemed so short and pleasant. With Jenny among us, the usual feeling of weariness and discontent never appeared. The English language was quickly acquired by all hands, Fritz, in particular, speaking it so well that Jenny declared she could scarcely believe he was not an Englishman. She herself already spoke French, and therefore easily learned our native language, and spoke it fluently before we were released from our captivity. Many wondrous tales were told or read in turn by the boys and Jenny during the long evenings as we sat drawing, 
weaving and plaiting in our cozy study. In fact, this winter was a truly happy time, and when at length the rain ceased and the bright sun again smiled upon the face of nature, we could scarcely believe, as we stepped forth and once more felt the balmy breath of spring, that, for so many weeks, we had been prisoners within our rocky walls. All was once more activity and life. The duties in field, garden, and orchard called forth the energy of the lads, while their mother and sister found abundant occupation in the poultry yard and house. Our various settlements and stations required attention. Falconhurst, Woodlands, Prospect Hill, Shark, and Whale Islands were in turn visited and set in order. The duty of attending to the island battery fell to Jack and Franz. They had been busy all day repairing the flagstaff, rehoisting the flag, and cleaning and putting into working order the two guns. Evening was drawing on, and our day's work over. The rest of us were strolling up and down the beach, enjoying the cool sea breeze. They loaded and ran out their guns, and paddling off with an empty tub in the kayak, placed it out at sea as a mark for practice. They returned and fired, and the barrel flew in pieces, and then, with a shout of triumph, they cleaned the guns and ran them in. Scarcely had they done so when, as though in answer to their shots, came the sound of three guns booming across the water from the westward. We stopped, speechless. Was it fancy? Had we really heard guns from a strange ship? Or had the boys again fired? No, there were the lads leaping into their canoe and paddling in hot haste toward us. They too had heard the sound. A tumult of feelings rushed over us, Anxiety, joy, hope, doubt, each in turn took possession of our minds. Was it a European vessel close upon our shores, and were we about to be linked once more to civilized life? Or did those sounds proceed from a Malay pirate who would rob and murder us? What was to be the result of meeting with our fellow beings? Were they to be friends who would help us, enemies who would attack us, or would they prove unfortunate creatures in need of our assistance? Who could tell? Before we could express these thoughts in words, the kayak had touched the shore, and Jack and Franz were among us. "'Did you hear them? Did you hear them?' they gasped. "'What shall we do? Where shall we go?' "'Oh, Fritz,' continued my youngest son, "'it must be a European ship. We shall find her. We shall see our fatherland once more.' and in an emotion of joy he grasped his brother's hands. Till then I knew not what a craving for civilized life had been aroused in the two young men by the appearance of their European sister. All eyes were turned toward me. What would I advise? At present, I said, we can do nothing, for night is drawing on. We must make what preparations we can, and pray for guidance." In the greatest excitement we returned to the house, all talking eagerly, and till late no one could be persuaded to retire to rest. Few slept that night. The boys and I took it in turn to keep watch from the veranda, lest more signals might be fired, or a hostile visit might be paid us. But about midnight the wind began to rise, and before we reassembled to discuss our plans, a fearful storm was raging— so terrific was the sea that I knew no boat could live, and had a broadside been fired at the entrance of the bay, we should not have heard it through the howling of the blast. For two days and two nights the hurricane continued, but on the third day the sun again appeared, and, the wind lulling, the sea went rapidly down. Full of anxiety I readily complied with the boy's desire to put off to Shark Island and to discharge the guns, for who could tell what had been the result of the gale? Perhaps the vessel had been driven upon the rocky shore, or, fearing such a fate, she had left the coast and weathered the storm out at sea. If so, she might never return. With these thoughts I accompanied Jack and Franz to the fort. One, two. We fired the guns and waited. For some minutes there was no reply, and then an answering report rolled in the distance. There was no longer room for doubt. The strangers were still in the vicinity and were aware of our presence. We waved the flag as a signal to those on shore that all was well, 
and quickly returned. We found the whole family in a state of the greatest excitement, and I felt it necessary to calm them down as much as possible, for neither could I answer the questions with which I was besieged, nor could I conceal the fact that the visit of the vessel might not prove so advantageous as they expected. Fritz and I at once prepared to make a reconnaissance. We armed ourselves with our guns, pistols, and cutlasses, took a spyglass, seated ourselves in the kayak, and with a parting entreaty from the mother to be cautious, paddled out of the bay and round the high cliffs on our left. For nearly an hour we advanced in the direction from which the reports of the guns seemed to proceed. Nothing could we see, however, but the frowning rocks and cliffs, and the waves beating restlessly at their base. Cape Pugnose was reached, and we began to round the bluff old point. In a moment all our doubts were dispelled, and joy and gratitude to the great giver of all good filled our hearts. There, in the little sheltered cove beyond the cape, her sails furled and anchor dropped, lay a brig of war with the English colors at her masthead. With the glass I could discern figures upon the deck, and upon the shore beyond several tents pitched under the shelter of the trees, and the smoke of fires rising among them. As I handed the glass to Fritz, I felt a sudden misgiving. What, said I to myself, can this English vessel be doing thus far from the usual track of ships? And I called to mind tales of mutinous crews, who had risen against their officers, have chosen some such sheltered retreat as this, have disguised the vessel, and then sailed forth to rob and plunder upon the high seas. Fritz then exclaimed, I can see the captain, father. He is speaking to one of the officers, and I can see his face quite well. He is English. I am certain he is English, and the flag speaks the truth. And he put the glass again in my hand, that I might see for myself. Still keeping under the shelter of the cliff, I carefully surveyed the vessel. There was no doubt that Fritz was right, and my fears were once more dispelled. All was neatness and regularity on board, the spotless decks, the burnished steel and brass, and the air of perfect order which pervaded both ship and camp, betokened that authority and discipline there reigned. For some minutes longer we continued our examination of the scene, and then, satisfied by the appearance of the camp on shore that there was no chance of the brig quitting the coast for several days, we resolved to return without betraying our presence, for I was unwilling to appear before these strangers until we could do so in better form, and in a manner more in accordance with our actual resources. We again landed at Rockburg, where our family awaited our arrival in eager expectation, and as fully as possible we told them of all we had seen. They thoroughly approved of our caution, and even Jenny, whose hopes had been excited to the highest pitch by our description of the English vessel, and who longed to meet her countrymen once more, agreed to postpone the visit until the following day, when, having put our yacht into good order, we might pay our respects to the captain, not as poor shipwrecked creatures begging assistance, but as lords and masters of the land, seeking to know for what purpose strangers were visiting the coast. The rest of the day was occupied in making our preparations. Our dainty little craft was made to look her very best. Her decks were scrubbed, her brass guns burnished, all lumber removed and put ashore, and the flag of England hoisted to her peak. The mother overhauled our wardrobes, and the neatest uniforms were put ready for the boys and me, for though neither my wife nor Jenny had ever dreamed of appearing otherwise than they would have done had they been at home among civilized people in Europe, yet we, accustomed daily to rough and often very dirty work, had adopted just that custom which best suited our comfort and inclination. We should indeed have surprised the smart man o war's men had we appeared in our great, shapeless, wide-brimmed hats, our linen coats and trousers, our broad leathern belts and hairy buskins, so we next day readily donned the more becoming costumes. At the break of that eventful morn, when we were destined once more to set our eyes upon our fellow men, and to hear news of the outer world, from which for so many years we had been exiled, we assembled in our little breakfast-room. The meal was eaten hurriedly, and almost in silence, 
for our hearts were too full and our minds too busily occupied to allow of any outward display of excitement. Fritz and Jack then slipped quietly out and presently returned from the garden with baskets of the choicest fruits in fresh and fragrant profusion, and with these, as presents for the strangers, we went on board our yacht. The anchor was weighed, the sail set, and with the canoe in tow, the little vessel, as though partaking of our hopes and joyous expectation, bounded merrily over the waters of Safety Bay, gave a wide berth to the reef, against whose frowning rocks the sea still lashed itself to foam, and kept away from the cove where the English ship unconsciously awaited us. The pug-nosed cape was reached, and, to the surprise and utter amazement of the strangers, we rounded the point and brought up within hail. Every eye on board and on shore was turned toward us, every glass was produced and fixed upon our motions, for of all the strange sights which the gallant crew may have looked for, such an anomaly as a pleasure yacht, manned by such a party as ours, and cruising upon this strange and inhospitable shore, was the furthest from their thoughts. Fritz and I stepped into our boat and pulled for the brig. In another minute we were upon her deck. The captain, with the simple frankness of a British seaman, welcomed us cordially, and, having led us into his cabin, begged us to explain to what good fortune he owed a visit from residence upon a coast generally deemed uninhabited, or the abode of the fiercest savages. I gave him an outline of the history of the wreck, and of our sojourn upon these shores, and spoke to him, too, of Miss Montrose, and of the providential way in which we had been the means of rescuing her from her lonely position. Then, said the gallant officer, rising and grasping Fritz by the hand, let me heartily thank you in my own name, and in that of Colonel Montrose, for it was the hope of finding some trace of that brave girl that led me to these shores. The disappearance of the Dorcas has been a terrible blow to the Colonel, and yet, though for three years no word of her, or any of those who sailed in her, has reached England, he has never entirely abandoned all hope of again hearing of his daughter. I knew this, and a few weeks ago, when I was about to leave Sydney for the Cape, I found three men who declared themselves survivors of the Dorcas, and said that their boat, of four which left the wreck, was the only one which, to their knowledge, reached land in safety. From them I learned all particulars, and applying for permission to cruise in these latitudes, I sailed in hopes of finding further traces of the unfortunate crew. My efforts have been rewarded by unlooked-for success. Fritz replied most modestly to the praises which he received, and then the captain begged to be introduced to my wife and Miss Montrose. And, he continued, if it be not contrary to your rules of discipline for the whole ship's company to be absent at once, I will now send a boat for the remainder of your party. One of the officers was accordingly dispatched to the yacht with a polite message, and the mother, Jenny, and our boys were presently on board. Our kind host greeted them most warmly, and he and his officers vied with one another in doing us honour. They proved indeed most pleasant entertainers, and the time passed rapidly away. At luncheon the captain told us that there had sailed with him from Sydney an invalid gentleman, Mr. Wollstone, his wife, and two daughters, but that, though the sea voyage had been recommended on account of his health, yet it had not done Mr. Wollstone so much good as had been anticipated, and he had suffered so greatly from the effects of the storm, which had driven the unicorn into the bay for repairs, that he had been eager to rest for a short time on land. We were anxious to meet the family, and in the afternoon it was decided that we should pay them a visit. Tents had been pitched for their accommodation under the shady trees, and when we landed we found Mr. Walston seated by one of them, enjoying the cool breeze. He and his family were delighted to see us, and so much did we enjoy their society, that evening found us still upon the shore. It was too late then to return to Rockburg, and the captain kindly offered tents for the accommodation of those who could not find room in the yacht. The boys spent the night on land. That night I had a long and serious consultation with my wife as to whether or not we really had any well-grounded reason for wishing to return to Europe. 
It would be childish to undertake a voyage thither simply because an opportunity offered for doing so. Neither knew to what decision the feelings of the other inclined. Each was afraid of expressing what might run counter to those feelings, but gradually it began to appear that neither entertained any strong wish to leave the peaceful island, and finally we discovered that the real wish, which lay at the bottom of both our hearts, was to adopt New Switzerland as thenceforward our home. What can be more delightful than to find harmony of opinion in those we love when a great and momentous decision has to be taken? My dear wife assured me that she desired nothing more earnestly than to spend the rest of her days in a place to which she had become so much attached, provided I, and at least two of her sons, also wished to remain. From the other two she would willingly part, if they chose to return to Europe, with the understanding that they must endeavor to send out immigrants of a good class to join us, and form a prosperous colony, adding that she thought the island ought to continue to bear the name of our native country, even if inhabited in future time by colonists from England as well as from Switzerland. I heartily approved of this excellent idea, and we agreed to mention it, while consulting with Captain Littlestone on the subject of placing the island under the protection of Great Britain. Then came the question as to which of our sons were best suited to remain with us, and which to go away. This point we left undecided, thinking that in the course of a few days they would probably make a choice of their own accord, which they did, even sooner than we anticipated. After breakfast it was proposed that Captain Littlestone might bring his ship round to Safety Bay, that we might receive a visit from him and his party at Rockburg, where we invited the invalid, Mr. Walston, and his family, in hopes that his health might benefit by a comfortable residence on shore. No sooner was this plan adopted than Fritz and Jack hurried off in the canoe to prepare for their reception, being followed in more leisurely style by the brig and our yacht. But what words can express the amazement of our guests when, rounding the rocky cape at the entrance, Safety Bay, the beautiful domain of Rockburg, lay before them? Still greater was their astonishment as a salute of eleven guns boomed from the battery on Shark Island, where the royal standard of England was displayed and floated majestically on the morning breeze. A glow of surprise and pleasure beamed on every countenance, and poor Wollstone's spirits appeared to revive with the very idea of peace and happiness to be enjoyed in such a home. He was carried on shore with the utmost care and tenderness, and comfortably established in my room, a camp bed for Mrs. Wollstone being added to the furniture there, that she might be able conveniently to attend on her husband. Meantime the scene at the harbour and all round Rockburg was of the liveliest description. Merriment and excitement prevailed in all directions, as the beauties and wonders of our residence were explored, so that a summons to dinner scarcely attracted notice. However, as a visit to Falconhurst was projected, the company was at length induced to be seated, and to partake of our good cheer. But the spirit of restlessness soon returned, and the young people kept roaming about through our hitherto quiet lawns, avenues, and shrubberies, until I was ready to believe their number three times what it actually was. Toward evening the universal excitement began to abate, and the party assembled for supper with tolerable composure. Mr. Walston was able to join us, as the rest he had enjoyed and the pleasure inspired by the hope of a residence among us seemed to have given him new life. This wish he now distinctly expressed in his own name, and in that of his wife, inquiring what our intentions were, and proposing, if agreeable to us, that they, with their eldest daughter, whose health, like his own, was delicate, should make a long stay on the island, while the younger daughter went for the present to her brother at the Cape of Good Hope. In the event of his ultimately deciding to settle altogether among us, Mr. Walston would propose that his son should leave the Cape, and join our colony. With sincere satisfaction I welcomed this proposal, saying that it was my wish and that of my wife to remain for the rest of our days in New Switzerland. Hurrah for New Switzerland! New Switzerland forever! shouted the whole company enthusiastically as they raised their glasses 
and made them touch with a musical ring, which so expressively denotes a joyful unanimity of sentiment. Prosperity to New Switzerland, long may she flourish, echoed on all sides. Long life and happiness to those who make New Switzerland their home, added Ernest, to my great surprise, leaning forward as he spoke, to ring his glass with mine, his mother's, and Mr. Walston's. "'Won't somebody wish long life and prosperity to those who go away?' inquired Jenny, with a pretty arch look. "'Much as I long to return to England and my father, my inclination will waver, if all the cheers are for New Switzerland.' Three cheers for England and Colonel Montrose!' cried Fritz. "'Success and happiness to us who return to Europe!' And while the vaulted roofs rang with the cheering elicited by this toast, a glance from Jenny showed him how much she thanked him for appreciating her wish to return to her father, notwithstanding her attachment to our family. "'Well,' said I, when silence was restored, "'since Fritz resolves to go to England, he must undertake for me the duty of bringing happiness to a mourning father by restoring to him this dear daughter, whom I have been ready to regard as my own, by right of her cast on the shores of my island. Ernest chooses to remain with me. His mother and I rejoice heartily in this decision, and promise him all the highest scientific appointments in our power to bestow. And now what is Jack's choice? The only talent I can say he possesses is that of a comic actor, and to shine on the stage he must needs go to Europe. Jack is not going to Europe, however, was his reply. He means to stay here, and when Fritz is gone, he will be the best rider and the best shot in New Switzerland, which is the summit of his ambition. The fact is, he continued laughing, I rather stand in awe of their European schools, and should expect to find myself caught and clapped into one if I ventured too near them. A good school is exactly what I want, said Franz. Among a number of students, there is some emulation and enthusiasm, and I shall have a chance of rising in the world. Fritz will probably return here some day, but it might be well for one member of the family to go home with the intention of remaining there altogether, and as I am the youngest, I could more easily than the rest adapt myself to a different life. My father, however, will decide for me. "'You may go, my dear son,' I replied, "'and God bless all our plans and resolutions. "'The whole earth is the Lord's, "'and where, as in his sight, "'you lead good and useful lives, "'there is your home. "'And now that I know your wishes, "'the only question is whether Captain Littlestone "'will kindly enable you to carry them out.' "'All eyes were fixed eagerly upon him, "'and after a moment's pause "'the gallant officer spoke as follows. I think my way in this matter is perfectly clear, and I consider that I have been providentially guided to be the means of once more placing this family in communication with their friends and with the civilized world. My orders were to search for a shipwrecked crew. Survivors from two wrecks have been discovered. Three passengers express a wish to leave my ship here instead of at the Cape, while at the same time I am requested to give to three persons a passage to England. Could anything suit better? I am most willing to undertake the charge of those who may be committed to my care. Every circumstance has been wonderfully ordered and linked together by divine providence, and if England gains a prosperous and happy colony, it will prove a fitting clasp to this fortunate chain of events. Three cheers for New Switzerland! Deep emotion stirred every heart as the party separated for the night. Many felt that they were suddenly standing on the threshold of a new life, while, for myself, a weight was rolled from my heart, and I thanked God that a difficulty was solved which, for years, had oppressed me with anxiety. After this nothing was thought of but making preparations for the departure of the dear ones bound for England. Captain Littlestone allowed as much time as he could spare, but it was necessarily short, so that incessant movement and industry pervaded the settlement for several days. Everything was provided and packed up that could in any way add to our children's comfort on the voyage, or benefit them after their arrival in England, and a large share of my possessions in pearls, corals, furs, spices, and other valuables 
would enable them to take a good position in the world of commerce. I committed to their care private papers, money, and jewels, which I knew to have been the personal property of the captain of our ill-fated ship, desiring them to hand them over, if possible, to his heirs. A short account of the wreck with the names of the crew, a list of which I had found, was given to Captain Littlestone. Fritz, having previously made known to me what indeed was very evident, the attachment between himself and Jenny, I advised him to mention it to Colonel Montrose as soon as possible after being introduced to him, and ask for his sanction to their engagement. I, on my part, gladly bestowing mine, as did his mother, who loved the sweet girl dearly, and heartily grieved to part with her. On the evening before our separation I gave to Fritz the journal in which, ever since the shipwreck, I had chronicled the events of our life, desiring that the story might be printed and published. It was written, as you well know, said I, for the instruction and amusement of my children, but it is very possible that it may be useful to other young people, more especially to boys. Children are, on the whole, very much alike everywhere, and you four lads fairly represent multitudes who are growing up in all directions. It will make me happy to think that my simple narrative may lead some of these to observe how blessed are the results of patient continuance in well-doing, what benefits arise from the thoughtful application of knowledge and science, and how good and pleasant a thing it is when brethren dwell together in unity under the eye of parental love. Night has closed around me. For the last time my united family slumbers beneath my care. Tomorrow this closing chapter of my journey will pass into the hands of my eldest son. From afar I greet thee, Europe. I greet thee, dear old Switzerland. Like thee may new Switzerland flourish and prosper, good, happy, and free. The End End of the Swiss Family Robinson. Read by Kara Schallenberg, www.kray.org. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.